Section 1 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman. Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Fargin. Introduction. In Odvesen in Sussex, they still sing the song of the Spring Green Lady. Any fine evening, in the streets or in the meadows, you may come upon a band of children, playing the old game that is their heritage, though few of them know its origin, or even that it had one. It is to them as the daisies in the grass and the stars in the sky. Of these things, and such as these, they ask no questions. But there you will still find one child who takes the part of the emperor's daughter, and another who is the wandering singer, and the remaining group, there should be no more than six in it, becomes the Spring Green Lady, the Rose White Lady, the Apple Gold Lady of the three parts of the game. Often there are more than six in the group, for the true number of the damsels who guarded their fellow in her prison is as forgotten as their names, Jocelyn, Jane, and Jennifer, Jessica, Joyce, and Joan. Forgotten, too, the name of Jillian, the lovely captive. And the wandering singer is to them but the wandering singer, not Martin Pippin the minstrel. Worse and worse, he is even presumed to be the captive's sweetheart, who wheedles the flower, the ring, and the prison key out of the strict virgins for his own purposes, and flies with her at last in a shallop across the sea, to live with her happily ever after. But this is a fallacy. Martin Pippin never wheedled anything out of anybody for his own purposes. In fact, he had none of his own. On this adventure, he was about the business of young Robin Rue. There are further discrepancies, for the emperor's daughter was not an emperor's daughter, but a farmer's. Nor was the sea the sea, but a duck pond, nor... But let us begin with the children's version, as they sing and dance it on summer days and evenings in Odvesen. The Singing Game of the Spring Green Lady the emperor's daughter sits weeping in her tower. Around her, with their backs to her, stand six maids in a ring, with joined hands. They are in green dresses. The wandering singer approaches them with his lute. The wandering singer. Lady, lady, my spring-green lady, may I come in to your orchard, lady? For the leaf is now on the apple bough, and the sun is high and the lawn is shady. Lady, lady, my fair lady, Oh, my spring-green lady! The ladies. You may not come in to our orchard, singer, because we must guard the emperor's daughter, who hides in her hair at the window there with her thoughts a thousand leagues over the water. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer! The wandering singer. Lady, lady, my spring-green lady, but will you not hear an all-bell lady? I'll play for you now neath the apple bough, and you shall dance on the lawn so shady. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my spring-green lady. The Ladies Oh, if you play us an Alba singer, how can that harm the Emperor's daughter? No word would she say that we danced all day, with her thoughts a thousand leagues over the water. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. The Wandering Singer But if I play you an Alba lady, get me a boon from the Emperor's daughter, the flower from her hair for my heart to wear, though hers be a thousand leagues over the water. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my spring-green lady. The Ladies They give him the flower from the hair of the Emperor's daughter, and sing. Now you may play us an Alba singer, a dance of dawn for a spring-green lady, for the leaf is now on the apple-bough, and the sun is high, and the lawn is shady. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. The wandering singer plays on his lute, and the ladies break the ranks and dance. The singer steals up behind the emperor's daughter, who uncovers her face and sings. The emperor's daughter Mother, mother, my fair dead mother, they have stolen the flower from your weeping daughter. The wandering singer. 
Oh, dry your eyes, you shall have this other, when yours is a thousand leagues over the water. Daughter, daughter, my sweet daughter, love is not far, my daughter. The singer then drops a second flower into the lap of the child in the middle, and goes away, and this ends the first part of the game. The emperor's daughter is not yet released, for the key of her tower is understood to be still in the keeping of the dancing children. Very likely it is bedtime by this, and mothers are calling from windows and gates, and the children must run home to their warm bread and milk and their cool sheets. But if time is still to spare, the second part of the game is played like this. The dancers once more encircle their weeping comrade, and now they are gowned in white and pink. They will indicate these changes, perhaps by colored ribbons, or by any flower in its season, or by imagining themselves first in green and then in rose, which is really the best way of all. Well, then. The ladies, in gowns of white and rose color, stand around the emperor's daughter, weeping in her tower. To them once more comes the wandering singer with his lute. The Wandering Singer Lady, lady, my rose-white lady, may I come in to your orchard, lady? For the blossoms now on the apple bough, and the stars are near and the lawn is shady. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my rose-white lady. The Ladies You may not come in to our orchard, singer, lest you bear a word to the emperor's daughter, from one who was sent to banishment, away a thousand leagues over the water. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. The Wandering Singer Lady, lady, my rose-white lady, but will you not hear a round, old lady? I'll play for you now, neath the apple bough, and you shall trip on the lawn so shady. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my rose-white lady. The Ladies Oh, if you play us a roundel singer, how can that harm the emperor's daughter? She would not speak, though we danced a week, with her thoughts a thousand leagues over the water. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. The Wandering Singer But if I play you a roundel, lady, get me a gift from the emperor's daughter. Her finger ring for my finger bring, though she's pledged a thousand leagues over the water. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my rose-white lady. The Ladies They give him the ring from the finger of the emperor's daughter, and sing. Now you may play us a roundel singer, a sunset dance for a rose-white lady, for the blossoms now on the apple bough, and the stars are near, and the lawn is shady. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. As before, the singer plays, and the ladies dance, and through the broken circle the singer comes behind the emperor's daughter, who uncovers her face to sing. THE EMPEROR'S DAUGHTER Mother, mother, my fair dead mother, they've stolen the ring from your heart-sick daughter. THE WANDERING SINGER O oh, mend your heart, you shall wear this other, when yours is a thousand leagues over the water. Daughter, daughter, my sweet daughter, love is at hand, my daughter. The third part of the game is seldom played. If it is not bedtime, or tea-time, or dinner-time, or school-time, by this time, at all events, the players have grown weary of the game, which is tiresomely long. And most likely, they will decide to play something else, such as Bertha Gentle Lady, or The Busy Lass, or Gypsy Gypsy Raggedy Loon, or The Crock of Gold, or Wayland, Shoe Me My Mare, which are all good games in their way, though not, like the Spring Green Lady, native to Odvison. But I did once have the luck to hear and see the lady played in entirety. The children had been granted leave to play just one more game before bedtime, and of course they chose the longest and played it without missing a syllable. The ladies, in yellow dresses, stand again in a ring about the emperor's daughter, and are for the last time accosted by the singer with his lute. The Wandering Singer Lady, lady, my apple-gold lady, 
may I come into your orchard, lady? For the fruit is now on the apple bough, and the moon is up, and the lawn is shady. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my apple-gold lady. The ladies. You may not come in to our orchard, singer, in case you set free the emperor's daughter, who pines apart to follow her heart that's flown a thousand leagues over the water. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. The Wandering Singer Lady, lady, my apple-gold lady, but will you not hear a serena, lady? I'll play for you now, neath the apple-bough, and you shall dream on the lawn so shady. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my apple-gold lady. The Ladies Oh, if you play a serena, singer, how can that harm the emperor's daughter? She would not hear, though we danced a year, with her heart a thousand leagues over the water. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. The Wandering Singer But if I play a serena lady, let me guard the key of the emperor's daughter, lest her body should follow her heart like a swallow, and fly a thousand leagues over the water. Lady, lady, my fair lady, oh, my apple-gold lady. The ladies. They give the key of the tower into his hands. Now you may play a serena singer, a dream of night for an apple-gold lady, for the fruit is now on the apple bough, and the moon is up and the lawn is shady. Singer, singer, wandering singer, oh, my honey-sweet singer. Once more the singer plays and the ladies dance, but one by one they fall asleep to the drowsy music, and then the singer steps into the ring and unlocks the tower and kisses the emperor's daughter. They have the end of the game to themselves. Lover, lover, thy, my own true lover, has opened a way for the emperor's daughter. The dawn is the goal and the dark the cover, as we sail a thousand leagues over the water. Lover, lover, my dear lover, oh, my own true lover. The wandering singer and the emperor's daughter float a thousand leagues in a shallop and live happily ever after. I don't know what becomes of the ladies. Bedtime, children! In they go. You see, the treatment is a trifle fanciful. But romance gathers round an old story, like lichen on an old branch. And the story of Marden Pippin in the apple orchard is so old now, some say a year old, some say even two. How can the children be expected to remember? But here's the truth of it. End of Introduction Section 2 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman Prologue, Part 1 One morning in April, Martin Pippin walked in the meadows near Odvison, and there he saw a young fellow sowing a field with oats broadcast. So pleasant a sight was enough to arrest Martin for an hour, though less important things, such as making his living, could not occupy him for a minute. So he leaned upon the gate, and presently noticed that for every handful he scattered, the young man shed as many tears as seeds, and now and then he stopped his sowing altogether, and putting his face between his hands, sobbed bitterly. When this had happened three or four times, Martin hailed the youth, who was then fairly close to the gate. "'Young master,' said he, "'the baker of this crop will want no salt to his baking, and that's flat.' The young man dropped his hands, and turned his brown and tear-stained countenance upon the minstrel. He was so young a man that he wanted his beard. "'They who taste of my sorrow,' he replied, "'will have no stomach for bread.' And with that he fell anew to his sowing and sighing, and passed up the field. When he came down again, Martin observed, "'It must be a very bitter sorrow that will put a man off his dinner.' "'It is the bitterest,' said the youth, and went his way. 
At his next coming, Martin inquired, What is the name of your sorrow? Love, said the youth. By now he was somewhat distant from the gate when he came abreast of it, and Martin Pippin did not catch the word. So he called loudly, What? Love! shouted the youth. His voice cracked on it. He appeared slightly annoyed. Martin chewed a grass and watched him up and down the meadow. At the right moment he bellowed, I was never yet put off my feed by love. Then, roared the youth, you have never loved. At this Martin jumped over the gate and ran along the furrow behind the boy. I have loved, he vowed, as many times as I have tuned lute strings. Then, said the youth, not turning his head, you have never loved in vain. Always, thank God, said Martin fervently. The youth, whose name was Robin Roo, suddenly dropped all his seed in one heap, flung up his arms, and, Alas, he cried, Oh, Jillian, Jillian, and began to sob more heavily than ever. Tell me your trouble, said the minstrel kindly. Sir, said the youth, I do not know your name, and your clothes are very tattered. But you are the first who has cared whether or no my heart should break since my lovely Jillian was locked with six keys into her father's well-house, and six young milkmaids, sworn virgins, and man-haters all to keep the keys. The thirsty, said Martin, make little of padlocks when within a rope's length of water. But, sir, continued the youth earnestly, this well-house is set in the midst of an apple orchard, enclosed in a hawthorn hedge full six foot high, and no entrance thereto but one small green wicket bolted on the inner side. Indeed, said Martin. And worse to come, the length of the hedge there is a great duck-pond, nine yards broad, and three wild ducks swimming in it. Alas, he cried, I shall never see my lovely girl again. Love is a mighty power, said Martin Pippin, but there are doubtless things it cannot do. I ask so little, sighed Robin Roo, only to send her a primrose for her hairband, and half again whatever flower she wears there now. Would this really content you? said Martin Pippin. I would then consent to live, swore Robin Roo, long enough at all events to make an end of my sewing. Well, that would be something, said Martin cheerfully, for fields must not go fallow that are appointed to bear. Direct me to your Jillian's apple orchard. It is useless, Robin said, for even if you could cross the duck pond and evade the ducks and compass the green gate, my sweetheart's father's milkmaids are not to be come over by any man, and they watch the well house day and night. Yet direct me to the orchard, repeated Martin Pippin, and thrummed his lute a little. Oh, sir, said Robin anxiously, I must warn you that it is a long and weary way. It may be as much as two mile by the road. And he looked disconsolately at the minstrel, as though in fear that he would be discouraged from the adventure. It can but be attempted, answered Martin, and now tell me only whether I go north or south as the road runs. Gilman the farmer, her father, said Robin Roo, has moreover a very big stick. Heaven help us! cried Martin, and took to his heels. That ends it, sighed the sorry lover. At least let us make a beginning, quoth Martin Pippin. He leaped the gate, mocked at a cuckoo, plucked a primrose, and went singing up the road. Robin Roo resumed his sewing and his tears. Maids, said Jocelyn, what is this coming across the duck pond? It is a man, said little Joan. The six girls came running and crowding to the wicket, standing a tiptoe and peeping between each other's sunbonnets. Their sunbonnets and their gowns were as green as lettuce leaves. Is he coming on a raft? asked Jessica, who stood behind. No, said Jane, he is coming on his two feet. He has taken off his shoes, but I fear his breeches will suffer. He is giving bread to the ducks, said Jennifer. He has a lute on his back, said Joyce. Man, 
cried Jocelyn, who was the tallest and the sternest of the milkmaids. Go away at once! Martin Pippin was by now within arm's length of the green gate. He looked with pleasure at the six virgins fluttering in their green gowns and peeping bright-eyed and rosy-cheeked under their green bonnets. Beyond them he saw the forbidden orchard, with cuckoo flower and primrose, daffodil and celandine, silver windflower and sweet violets blue and white spangling the gay grass. The twisted apple trees were in young leaf. "'Go away!' cried all the milkmaids in a breath. "'Go away!' "'My green maidens,' said Martin, "'may I not come into your orchard? The sun is up, and the shadow lies fresh on the grass. Let me in to rest a little, dear maidens, if maidens indeed you be, and not six leaflets blown from the apple trees. You cannot come in, said Jocelyn, because we are guarding our master's daughter, who sits yonder weeping in the well-house. That is a noble and a tender duty, said Martin. From what do you guard her? The milkmaids looked primly at one another, and little Joan said, It is a secret. Martin, I will ask no more. And what do you do all day long? Joyce, nothing, and it is very dull. Martin, it must be still duller for your master's daughter. Joan, oh no, she has her thoughts to play with. Martin, and what of your thoughts? Jocelyn, we have no thoughts. I should think not indeed. Martin, I beg your pardon. But since you find the hours so tedious, will you not let me sing and play to you upon my lute? I will sing you a song for a spring morning, and you shall dance in the grass like any leaf in the wind. Jane, I think there can be no harm in that. Jessica, it can't matter a straw to Gillian. Joyce, she would not look up from her thoughts, though we footed it all day. Jocelyn, so long as he is on one side of the gate, Jennifer, and we on the other. I love to dance, said little Joan. Man, cried the milkmaids in a breath, play and sing to us. Oh, maidens, answered Martin merrily, every tune deserves its fee. But don't look so troubled. My hire shall be of the lightest. Let me see. You shall fetch me the flower from the hair of your little mistress, who sits weeping on the coping with her face hidden in her shining locks. At this the milkmaids clapped their hands, and little Joan, running to the well-house, with a touch like thistle-down, drew from the weeper's yellow hair a yellow primrose. She brought it to the gate and laid it in Martin's hand. "'Now you will play for us, won't you?' said she. "'A dance for a spring morning, when the leaves dance on the apple-trees.' Then Martin tuned his lute, and played and sang as follows, while the girls took hands and danced in a green chain among the twisty trees. The green leaf dances now, the green leaf dances now, the green leaf with its tilted wings dances on the bough, and every rustling air says I've caught you, caught you, leaf with tilted wings, caught you in a snare. Who snare? Springs that bound you to the bough, where you dance now, dance but cannot fly, for all your tilted wings pointing to the sky, where, like Martin's, you would dart, but for spring's delicious art that caught you to the bough, caught, yet left you free, to dance if not to fly, oh, see, as you are dancing now, dancing on the bough, dancing on the bough, dancing with your tilted wings on the apple bough. Now as Martin sang, and the milkmaids danced, it seemed that Gillian in her prison heard and saw nothing except the music and the movement of her sorrows. But presently she raised her hand, and touched her hairband, and then she lifted up the fairest face Martin had ever seen, so that he needs must see it nearer. And he took the green gate in one stride, and the green dancers never observed him. Then Gillian's tender mouth parted, like an opening quince blossom, and, Oh, mother, mother, she said, if you had only lived, they would not have stolen the flower from my hair while I sat weeping. Above her head, a whispering voice made answer, 
O oh, daughter, daughter, dry your sweet eyes. You shall wear this other flower when yours is gone over the duck pond to Advesen. And lo, a second primrose dropped out of the skies into her lap. And that day the lovely Gillian wept no more. Part Two It happened that on an afternoon in May, Martin Pippin passed again through Avacyn, and as he passed he thought, Now certainly I have been here before. But he could not remember when or how, for a full month had run under the bridges of time since then, and man's memory is not infinite. But in walking by a certain garden he heard a sound of sobbing, and curiosity, of which he was largely made, caused him to climb the old brick wall that he might discover the cause. What he saw from his perch was a garden laid out in neat plots between grassy walks edged with double daisies, red, white, and pink, or bordered with sweet herbs, or with lavender and wallflower, and here and there were cordons of fruit trees, apple, plum, and cherry, and in a sunny corner a clump of flowering currant heavy with humming bees, and against the inner walls flat pear trees stretching their long straight lines, like music staves whereon a lovely melody was ridden in notes of snow. And in the midst of all this stood a very young man with a face as brown as a berry. He was spraying the cordons with quashia water, but whenever he filled his syringe he wept so many tears above the bucket that it was always full to the brim. When he had watched this happen several times, Martin hailed the young man. "'Young master,' said Martin, "'the eater of your plums will need sugar there too, and that's flat.' The young man turned his eyes upward. "'There is not sugar enough in all the world,' he answered, "'to sweeten the fruits that are watered by my sorrows.' "'Then here is a waste of good quashia," said Martin, "'and I think your name is Robin Rue. "'It is,' said Robin, "'and you are Martin Pippin, to whom I owe more than to any man living. "'But the primrose you brought me is dead this five-and-twenty days. "'And what of your Gillian? "'Alas, how can I tell what of her? "'She is where she was, and I am where I am. "'What will become of me?' There are riddles without answers, observed Martin. I can answer this one. I shall fall into a decline and die. And yet I ask no more than to send her a ring to wear on her finger, and have her ring to wear on mine. Would this satisfy you? asked Martin. I could then cling to life, said Robin Rue, long enough at least to finish my spraying. We may praise God as much for small mercies, said Martin pleasantly, as for great ones, and trees must not be blighted that were appointed to fruit. So saying, he unstraddled his legs and dropped into the road, tickled an armadillo with his toe, twirled the silver ring on his finger, and went away singing. Maidens, said Jocelyn, here is that man come again. Maids' memories are longer than men's. At all events, the milkmaids knew instantly to whom she referred, although nearly a month had passed since his coming. "'Has he his lute with him?' asked little Joan. "'He has, and he has given cake to the ducks. They take it from his hand. Ma'am, go away immediately!' Martin Pippin propped his elbows on the little gate, and looked smiling into the orchard, all pink and white blossom. The trees that had been longest in bloom were white cascades of flower, others there were flushed like the cheek of a sleeping child, and some were still studded with rose-red buds. The grass was high and full of spotted orchis, and tall wild parsley spread its nets of lace almost abreast of the lowest boughs of blossom, so that the milkmaid stood embraced in meeting flowers, waist-deep in the orchard growth, all gowned in pink lawn with loose white sleeves, and their faces flushed it may have been with the pink linings to their white bonnets, or with the evening rose in the west, or with I know not what. "'Go away!' they cried at the intruder. "'Go away!' "'My rose-white maidens,' said Marden, "'will you not let me into your orchard? For the stars are rising with the dew, 
and the hour is at peace. Let me into rest, dear maidens, if maidens indeed you be, and not six blossoms fallen from the apple boughs. You cannot come in, said Jocelyn, lest you are the bearer of a word to our master's daughter who sits weeping in the well-house. From whom should I bear a word? asked Martin Pippin in great amazement. The milkmaids cast down their eyes, and little Joan said, It is a secret. Martin, I will inquire no further, but shall I not play a little on my lute? It is as good an hour for song and dance as any other, and I will make a tune for a sunny May evening, and you shall sway among the grasses like any flower on the bough. Jane, in my opinion that can hurt nobody. Jessica, Jillian wouldn't care two pins. Joyce, she would utter no word though we tripped it for a week. Jocelyn, so long as he keeps to his side of the hedge. Jennifer, and we to ours. Oh, I do love to dance, cried little Joan. Man, they commanded him as one voice, play and sing to us instantly. My pretty ones, laughed Martin Pippin, songs are as light as air, but worth more than pearls and diamonds. What will you give me for my song? Wait now, I have it. You shall fetch me the ring from the finger of your little mistress, who sits hidden beneath the fountain of her own bright tresses. The milkmaids at these words nodded gaily, and little Joan tiptoed to the well-house, and slipped the ring from Jillian's finger, as lightly as a daisy may be slipped from its fellow on the chain. Then she ran with it to the gate, and Martin held up his little finger, and she put it on, saying, Now you will keep your promise, honey sweet singer, and play a dance for a May evening, when the blossom blows for happiness on the apple trees. So Martin Pippin tuned his lute, and sang what follows, while the girls floated in ones and twos among the orchard grass. A floating, a floating, what saw I a floating? Fairy ships rocking with pink sails and white, smoothly as swans on a river of light, saw I a floating? No, it was apple bloom, rosy and fair, softly obeying the nod of the air, I saw a floating. A floating, a floating, what saw I a floating? White clouds at eventide, blown to and fro, lightly as bubbles the cherubim blow, saw I a floating? No, it was pretty girls, gowned like a flower, blown in a ring round their own apple bower, I saw a floating. Or was it my dream, my dream only, who knows? As frail as a snowflake, as flushed as a rose, I saw a floating, a floating, a floating, what saw I a floating? Martin sang, and the milkmaids danced, and Jillian in her prison only heard the dropping of her tears, and only saw the rainbow prisms on her lashes. But presently she laid her cheek against her hand, and missed a touch she knew, and on that revealed her lovely face so full of woe that Martin needs must comfort her, or weep himself. And the dancers took no heed when he made one step across the gate, and went under the trees to the well-house. "'Oh, mother, mother,' sighed Jillian, "'if you had only lived, they would never have stolen the ring from my finger while I sat heartsick.' Above her head a whispering voice replied, "'O oh, daughter, daughter, mend your dear heart. You shall wear this other ring when yours is gone over the duck-pond to Odvison.' "'A oh, wonder!' Out of the very heavens fell a silver ring into her bosom. And if that night Jillian slept not, neither wept she. End of Prologue, Part 2section 3 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Prologue, Part 3. In the beginning of the first week in September, Martin Pippin came once more to Odvison, and he said to himself when he saw it, 
Now this is the prettiest hamlet I ever had the luck to light on in my wanderings. And if chance or fortune will, I shall some day come this way again. While he was thinking these thoughts, his ears were assailed by groans and sighs, so that he wet his finger and held it up to find which way the wind blew on this burning day of blue and gold. But no wind coming, he sought some other agency for these gusts, and discovered it in a wheat field where was a young fellow stooking sheaves. A very young fellow he was, turned copper by the sun. And as he stooked, he heaved such sighs that for every shock he stooked, two tumbled at his feet. When Martin had seen this happen more than once, he called aloud to the harvester. "'Young master,' said Martin, "'the mill that grinds your grain will need no wind to its sails, and that's flat.' The young man looked up from his labors to reply. "'There are no millstones in all the world,' said he, "'strong enough to grind the grain of my grief.' "'Then I would save these gales till they may be put to more use,' remarked Martin. "'And if I remember rightly, you wear a lady's ring on your little finger, "'though I cannot remember her name or yours.' "'Her heavenly name is Gillian,' said the youth, "'and mine is Robin Rue.' "'And are you wedded yet?' asked Martin. "'Wedded?' he cried. "'Have you forgotten that she is locked with six keys inside her father's well-house?' "'But this was long ago,' said Martin. "'Is she there yet?' "'She is,' said Robin Roo, "'and here am I.' "'Well, all states must end some time,' said Martin Pippin. "'Heave in life,' sighed Robin, "'and therefore, before the month is out, "'I shall wilt and be laid in the earth.' "'That would be a pity,' said Martin. "'Can nothing save you?' nothing but the keys to her prison, and they are in the keeping of them that will not give them up. I remember, said Martin, six milkmaids. With hearts of flint, cried Robin. Sparks may be struck from flint, said Martin, in his inconsequential way. But tell me, if Jillian's prison were indeed unlocked, would all be well with you forever? Oh, said Robin Rue, if her prison were unlocked and the prisoner in these arms, this wheat should be flour for a wedding cake. It is the best of all cakes, said Martin Pippin, and the grain that is destined thereto must not rot in the husk. With these words, he strolled out of the cornfield, gathered a harebell, rang it so loudly in the ear of a passing rabbit that it is said never to have stopped running till it found itself in France, and went up the road humming and thrumming his lute. On the road he met a gypsy. Maids, said Jocelyn, somebody is at the gate. The milkmaids, who were eating apples, came clustering about her instantly. Is it a man? asked little Joan, pausing between her bites. No, thank all our stars, said Jocelyn, it is a gypsy. The milkmaids withdrew, their fears allayed. Joan bit her apple and said, It puckers my mouth. Joyce, Mine's sour. Jessica, Mine's hard. Jane, Mine's bruised. Jennifer, There's a maggot in mine. They threw their apples away. Who'll buy trinkets? said the gypsy at the gate. What have you to sell? asked Jocelyn. Knick-knacks and gewgaws of all sorts, rings and ribbons, mirrors and beads, silken shoestrings and colored lacings, sweetmeats and scents and gilded pins, silver buckles, belts and bracelets, gay kerchiefs, spotted ones, striped ones, ivory bobbins, sprigs of coral, and seashells from far places. They'll murmur you secrets and nights if you put them under your pillow. Here are patterns for patchwork, and here's a sheet of ballads. And here's a pack of cards for telling fortunes. What will ye buy? A dream book? A crystal? A charmed powder that shall make you see your sweetheart in the dark? Oh! Six voices cried in one. Or this other powder shall charm him to love you if he love you not. Fie! exclaimed Jocelyn severely. We want no love charms. I warrant you, laughed the gypsy. 
What will you buy? Jennifer. I'll have this flasket of scent. Joyce. I'll have this looking glass. Jessica. And I this necklet of beads. Jane. A pair of shoe buckles, if you please. Joan. This bunch of ribbons for me. Jocelyn. Have you a corset lace of yellow silk? The Gypsy. Here's for you and you. No love charms, no. Here's for you and you and you. I warrant no love charms. I have a yellow lace who'll keep you in as tight as jealousy, my pretty. Out upon all love charms. And what will she have that sits crouched in the well-house? Oh, Gypsy, cried Jocelyn, have you among your charms one that will make a maid fall out of love? Nay, nay, said the Gypsy, growing suddenly grave. That is a charm takes more black art than I am mistress of. I know indeed but one remedy. Is the case so bad? She has been shut into the well-house to cure her of loving, said Jocelyn, and in six months she has scarcely ceased to weep and has never uttered a word. If you know the physic that shall heal her of her foolishness, I pray you tell us of it, for it is extremely dull in this orchard, with nothing to do except watch the changes of the apple trees, and meanwhile the farmstead lacks water and milk, there being no entry to the well, nor maids to milk the cows. Daily comes old Gilman to tell us how, from morning till night, he is forced to drink cider and ale, and so the farm goes to rack and ruin, and all because he has a lovesick daughter. What is your remedy? He would give you gold and silver for it. I do not know if it can be bought, said the gypsy. I do not even know if it exists. But when a maid broods too much on her own love tale, the like weapons only will vanquish her thoughts. Nothing but a new love tale will overcome her broodings, and where the case is obstinate, one only will not suffice. You say she has pined upon her love six months. Let her be told six brand new love tales, tales which no woman ever heard before, and I think she will be cured. These counterpoisons will so work in her that little by little her own case will be obliterated from her blood. But for my part, I doubt whether there be six untold love tales left on earth, and if there be, I know not who keeps them buttoned under his jacket. Alas! cried Jocelyn. Then we must stay here for ever until we die. It looks very like it, said the gypsy, and my wares are a penny apiece. So saying, she collected her money and withdrew, and for all I know was never seen again by man, woman, or child. My apple gold maidens, said Martin Pippin, leaning on the gate in the bright night, may I come into your orchard? As he addressed them, he gazed with delight at the enclosure. By the light of the queen moon, now at her full in heaven, he saw that the orchard grass was clipped, and patterned with small clover, but against the hedges rose wild banks of meadow-sweet and yarrow, and the jolly ragwort, and bryony with its heart-shaped leaf, and berry as red as heart's blood made a bower above them all and all the apple-trees were decked with little golden moons hanging in clusters on the drooping boughs, and glimmering in the recesses of the leaves. Under each tree a ring of windfalls lay in the grass. But prettiest sight of all was the ring of girls in yellow gowns and caps that lay around the minmost apple-tree like fallen fruit. "'Dear maidens,' pleaded the minstrel, "'let me come in.' At the sound of his voice the six milkmaids rose up in the grass like golden fountains. And fountains indeed they were, for their eyes were running over with tears. "'We did not hear you coming,' said little Joan. "'Go away at once,' commanded Jocelyn. Then all the girls cried, "'Go away!' together. "'My apple-gold maidens,' said Martin Pippin, "'I entreat you to let me in, for the moon is up, and it is time to be sleeping or waking in sweet company. So I beseech you to admit me, dear maidens, if maidens in truth you be, and not six apples bobbed off their stems. You may not come in, said Jocelyn, in case you should release our master's daughter, who sits in the well-house pining to follow her heart. Why, whither would she follow it? 
asked Martin, much surprised. The milkmaids turned their faces away, and little Joan murmured, It is a secret. Martin, I will put chains on my thoughts, but shall I not sing you a tune you may dance to? I will make you a song for an August night, when the moon rocks her way up and down the cradle of the sky, and you shall rock on earth like any apple on the twig. Jane, for my part, I see nothing against it. Jessica, Jillian won't care little apples. Joyce, she would not hear that we danced the round of the year. Jocelyn, so long as he does not come in. Jennifer, or we go out. Oh, let us dance, do let us dance, cried little Joan. Man, they importuned him in a single breath, play for us and sing for us as quickly as you can. Sweet ones, said Martin Pippin, shaking his head, songs must be paid for. And yet I do not know what to ask you, some trifle in kind it should be. Why now, I have it. If I give you the keys to the dance, give me the keys to your little mistress, that I may keep her secure from following her heart like a bird of passage, whither it's no business of mine to ask. At this request, made so gaily and so carelessly, the girls all looked at one another in consternation. Then Jocelyn drew herself up to full height, and pointing with her arm straight across the duck pond, she cried, Minstrel, be gone! And the six girls, turning their backs upon him, moved away into the shadows of the moon. Well a day, sighed Martin Pippin, how a fool may trip and never know it till his nose hits the earth. I will sing to you for nothing. But the girls did not answer. Then Martin touched his lute and sang as follows, so softly and sweetly that they, not regarding, hardly knew the sound of his song from the heavy sweet scent of the ungathered apples over their heads. Toss me your golden ball, laughing maid, lovely maid, lovely maid, laughing maid, toss me your ball. I'll catch it and throw it and hide it and show it and spin it to heaven and not let it fall. Boy, run away with you. I will not play with you. This is no ball. We are too old to be playing at ball. Toss me the golden sun, laughing maid, lovely maid, lovely maid, laughing maid, toss me the sun. I'll wheel it, I'll whirl it, I'll twist it and twirl it, till cocks crow at midnight and day breaks at one. Boy, I'll not sport with you. Boy, to be short with you, this is no sun. We are too young to play tricks with the sun. Toss me your golden toy, laughing maid, lovely maid. Lovely maid, laughing maid, toss me your toy. It's all one to me, girl, whatever it be, girl. So long as it's round, that's enough for a boy. Boy, come and catch it then. There now, don't snatch it then. Here comes your toy. Apples were made for a girl and a boy. There was no sound or movement from the girls in the shadows. Farewell, then, said Martin. I must carry my tunes and tails elsewhere. Like pebbles from a catapult, the milkmaids shot to the gate. Tails? cried Jessica. Do you know tails? exclaimed Jennifer. What kind of tails? demanded Jane. Love tails? panted Joyce. Six of them? urged little Joan. A thousand, said Martin Pippin. Jocelyn's hand lay on the bolt. Man, she said, come in. She opened the wicket, and Martin Pippin walked into the apple orchard. Prelude to the First Tale And now, said Martin Pippin, what exactly do you require of me? If you please, said little Joan, you are to tell us a love story that has never been told before. But we have reason to fear, added Jane, that there is no such story left in all the world. There you are wrong, said Martin, for on the contrary, no love story has ever been told twice. I never heard any tale of lovers that did not seem to me as new as the world on its first morning. I am glad you have a taste for love stories. We have not, said Jocelyn very quickly. 
No, indeed, cried her five fellows. Then shall it be some other kind of tale? No other kind will do, said Jocelyn still more quickly. We must all bear our burdens, said Marden. So let us make ourselves as happy as we can in an apple tree, and when the tale becomes too little to your taste, you shall munch apples and forget it. Will you sit in the swing? asked Jennifer, pointing to the midmost apple tree, which was the largest in the orchard, and had a little swing hanging from a long upper limb. Close to the apple tree, a branch of which indeed brushed its mossed pent roof, stood the well-house. It had a round wall of old red bricks growing green with time, and a pillar of oak rose up at each point of the compass to support the pent. Between the south and west pillars was a green door, held by a rusty chain and a padlock with six keyholes. The little circular court within was flagged, and three rings of worn steps led to the wellhead and the green wooden bucket inverted on the coping. Between the cracks of the flags sprang grass and pink starred century, and even a trail of mallow sprawled over the steps where Jillian lay in tears, as though to wreath her head with its striped blooms. "'What luck you have!' said Marden, not only to live in an orchard, but to have a swing to swing in. It is our one diversion, said Joyce, except when you come to play to us. It is delightful to swing, said little Joan invitingly. So it is, agreed Marden, and I beg you to sit in the swing while I sit on this bough, and when I see your eyelids growing heavy with my tail, I will start the rope and rouse you. Thus! So saying, he lifted the littlest milkmaid lightly into her perch, and gave her so vigorous a push that she cried out with delight, as at one moment the point of her shoe cleared the door of the well-house, and at the next her heels were up among the apples. Then Martin ensconced himself upon the lower limb of the tree, which had a mossy cushion against the trunk, as though nature or time had designed it for a teller of tales. The milkmaid sprang quickly into other branches around him, shaking a hail of sweet apples about his head. What he could he caught, and dropped into the swinger's lap, whence from time to time he helped himself, and she did likewise. "'Begin,' said Jocelyn. "'A thought has occurred to me,' said Martin Pippin, "'and it is that my tale may disturb your master's daughter.' "'We desire it to,' said Jocelyn, looking down on the well-house and the yellow head of Jillian, the fear is rather that you may not arouse her attention, so I hope that when you speak you will speak clearly. For, to tell you the truth, we have heard that nothing but six love-tales will wash from her mind the image of—' "'Of whom?' inquired Marden as she paused. "'It does not matter whom,' said Jocelyn. "'But I think the time is ripe to confess to you that the silly damsel is in love.' "'The world is so full of wonders,' said Marden Pippin that one ceases to be surprised at almost anything. "'Is love, then,' said little Joan, "'so rare a thing in the world?' "'The rarest of all things,' answered Marden, looking gravely into her eyes. "'It is as rare as flowers in spring.' "'I am glad of that,' said Joan, while Jocelyn objected. "'But nothing is commoner.' "'Do you think so?' said Marden. "'Perhaps you are right.' Yet spring after spring the flowers quicken my heart as though I were perceiving them for the first time in my life. Yes, even the very commonest of them. What do you call the commonest? asked Jessica. Could any be commoner, said Marden, than Robin run by the wall? Yet I think he has touched many a heart in his day. And fixing his eyes on the weeper in the well-house, Marden Pippin tried his lute and sang this song. Run by the wall, Robin, run by the wall. You might hear a secret a lady once let fall. If you hear her secret, tell it in my ear, and I'll whisper you another for her to overhear. The weeper stirred very slightly. The song makes little sense, said Jocelyn, and would make none at all if you called this flower by its right name of Jack in the Hedge. Let us do so, said Martin readily and then the nonsense will run this way as easily as that. Hide in the hedge, Jack, hide in the hedge, 
you might catch a letter dropped over the edge. If you catch your letter, slip it in my hand, and I'll write another that she'll understand. As he concluded, Jillian lifted up her head, and putting her hair from her face, gazed over the duck pond beyond the green wicket. The lady, said Jocelyn with some impatience, who understand the letter must outdo me in wits, for I find no understanding whatever in your silly song. However, it seems to have brought our master's daughter out of her lethargy, and the moment is favorable to your tale. Therefore, without further ado, I beg you to begin. I will, said Marden, and on my part, entreat or forbearance, while I relate to you the story of the King's Barn. End of Prelude to the First Tale Section 4 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Fargen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. The King's Barn. There was once, dear maidens, a king in Sussex, of whose kingdom and possessions nothing remained but a single barn and a change of linen. It was no fault of his. He was a very young king when he came into his heritage, and it was already dwindled to these proportions. Once his fathers had owned a beautiful city on the banks of the Eder, and all the lands to the north and the west were theirs, for a matter of several miles indeed, including many strange things that were on them, such as the Wappingthorpe, the Huddlestone, the bush hovel where a wise woman lived, and the guest gate. Likewise, those two communities, known as the Doves and the Hawking Sopers, whose waves of life were as opposite as the Poles. The Doves were simple men and religious, but the Hawking Sopers were indeed a wild and rowdy crew, and it is said that the king's father had hunted and drunk with them until his estates were gambled away, and his affairs decayed of neglect, and nothing was left at last but the solitary barn, which marked the northern boundary of his possessions. And here, when his father was dead, our young king sat on a tussock of hay, with his golden crown on his head and his golden scepter in his hand, and ate bread and cheese thrice a day, throwing the rind to the rats and the crumbs to the swallows. His name was William, and beyond the rats and the swallows he had no other company than a nag called Pepper, whom he fed daily from the tussock he sat on. But at the end of a week he said, It is a dull life. What should a king do in a barn? So saying, he pulled the last handful of hay from under him, rising up quickly before he had time to fall down, and gave it to his nag. And next he tied up his scepter and crown with his change of linen in a blue handkerchief. And last he fetched a rope and a sack, and put them on Pepper for bridle and saddle, and rode out of the barn, leaving the door to swing. "'Let us go south, Pepper,' said he, "'for it is warmer to ride into the sun than away from it, and so we shall visit my father's lands that might have been mine.' South they went, with the great downs ahead of them, and who knew what beyond? And first they came to the hawking sopers, who when they saw William approaching, tumbled out of their dwelling with a great racket, crying to him to come and drink and play with them. Not I, said he, for so I should lose my barn to you, and such as it is, it is a shelter, and my only one. But tell me, if you can, what should a king do in a barn? He should dance in it, said they, and went laughing and singing back to their cups. What sort of advice is this, Pepper? said the king. Shall we try elsewhere? The nag whinnied with unusual vehemence, and the king, taking this for yea, and not observing that she limped as she went, rode on to the doves, the gentle, grey-gowned brothers who spent their days in pious works and their nights in meditation. Between the twelve hours of twilight and dawn they were pledged not to utter speech, but the king arriving there at noon they welcomed him with kind words and offered him a bowl of rice and milk. He thanked them, and when he had eaten and drunk put to them his riddle. What should a king do in a barn? They answered, He should pray in it. This may be good advice, said the king. 
Pepper, should we go farther? The little nag whinnied till her sides shook, which the king took as before to be an affirmative. However, because it was Sunday, he remained with the doves a day and a night, and during such time as their lips were not sealed, they urged him to become one of them, and found a new settlement of brothers in his barn. He spent his night in reflection, but by morning had come to no decision. "'To what better use could you dedicate it?' asked the chief brother, who was known as the Ring Dove because he was the leader. "'None that I can think of,' said the king, "'but I fear I am not good enough.' "'When you have passed our initiation,' said the Ring Dove, "'you will be.' "'Is it difficult?' asked William. "'No, it is very easy, and can be accomplished within a month. "'You have only to ride south till you come to the hills.' on the highest of which you will see a ring of beech trees. Under the hills lies the little village of Washington, and there you may dwell in comfort through the week. But on each of the four Saturdays of the lunar month, you must mount the hill at sunset and keep a vigil among the beeches till sunrise. And you must see that these Saturdays occur on the four quarters of the moon, once when she is in her crescent, once at the half, again at the full, and lastly, when she is waning. "'And is this all?' said William. "'It sounds very simple.' "'Not quite all, but the rest is nearly as simple. You have but to observe four rules. First, to tell no living soul of your resolve during the month of initiation. Second, to keep your vigil always between the two great beeches in the middle of the ring. Third, to issue forth at midnight and immerse your head in the dew-pond which lies on the hilltop to the west, and having done so to return to your watch between the trees, and fourth, to make no utterance on any account whatever from sunset to sunrise. Suppose I should sneeze, inquired the king anxiously. There's no supposing about it, said the ring-dove. Sneezing, seeing that your head will be extremely wet, is practically inevitable but the rule applies only to such utterance as lies within human control. When the fourth vigil has been successfully accomplished, return to us for a blessing and the grey robe of our order. "'But how?' asked the king. "'During my vigils shall I know when midnight is due?' "'In the third quarter after eleven a bird sings. "'At the beginning of its song go forth from the ring, "'and at the end plunge your head into the pond. "'For on these nights... The bird sings ceaselessly for fifteen minutes, but stops at the very moment of midnight. And is this really all? This is all. How easy it is to become good, said William cheerfully. I will begin at once. So impatient was he to become a brother dove. But here Martin Pippin broke off abruptly, and catching the rope of the swing in his left hand, he gave it a great lurch. Joan, oh, oh, oh! Martin, I perceive, Mistress Joan, that you lose interest in my story. Your mouth droops. Joan, oh, no, oh, no, it is only, it is a very nice story, but... Martin, what cannot be said aloud can frequently be whispered. He leaned his ear close to her mouth, and very shyly she whispered into it. Joan, whispering very shyly. Why must the young king join a brotherhood? I thought this was to be a love story. Martin smiled and chose an apple from her lap. Keep this for me, said he, until I ask for it, and if you are not then satisfied, neither will I be. So impatient, resumed Martin, was the king to enter the brotherhood, that he abandoned his idea of visiting the Huddlestone and the Wappingthorpe, which would have taken him out of his course, and without even waiting to break his fast, leapt onto Pepper's back, and turned her head southwest towards the hills. And in his eagerness he failed to remark how Pepper stumbled at every second step. Before he had gone a mile he came to the guest gate. Of the guest gate, as you may know, all men ask a question in passing through, and in the back swing of the gate it creaks an answer. So nothing more natural than that the king, 
having flung the gate open, should cry aloud once more, Gate! Gate! What should a king do in a barn? Now at last, thought he, I shall be told whether to dance or to pray in it. And he stood listening eagerly as the gate hung an instant on its outward journey, and then began to creak home. He should rule in it, he should rule in it, he should, squeaked the gas gate, and then the latch clicked, and it was silent. This disconcerted William. Now I am worse off than ever, he sighed. Pray, Pepper, can this advice be battered? As usual when he questioned her, the nag pricked up her ears and whinnied so violently that he nearly fell off her back. Nevertheless, he kept Pepper's head in a beeline for Chanctonbury, never noticing how very ill she was going, and presently crossed the great high road beyond which lay the bush hovel. The wise woman was at home. From afar the king saw her sitting outside the hovel mending her broom with a withy from the bush. Here, if anywhere, rejoiced William, I shall learn the truth. He dismounted, and approached the old woman, cap in hand. Wise woman, he said respectfully, you know most things, but do you know this? Whether a king should dance or pray or rule in his barn? He should do all three, young man, said the wise woman. But, exclaimed William, I'm busy, snapped the wise woman. You men will always be chattering, as though pots need never be stewed or cobwebs swept. So saying, she went into the hovel and slammed the door. Pepper, said the poor king, I am at my wit's end. Go where yours lead you. At this, Pepper whinnied in a perfect frenzy of delight, and the king had to clasp both arms round her neck to avoid tumbling off. Now the little nag preferred roads to bee-lines over copses and ditches, and she turned back and ambled along the highway so very lamely that it became impossible even for her preoccupied rider not to notice that she had cast all her four shoes. "'Poor beast!' he cried, dismayed. "'How has this happened, and where? Oh, Pepper, how could you be so careless? I have not a penny in my purse to buy you new shoes, my poor Pepper!' Do you not remember where you lost them? The little nag licked her master's hand, for he had dismounted to examine her trouble, and looked at him with great eyes full of affection, and then she flung up her head and whinnied louder than ever. The sound of it was like nothing so much as laughter. Then she went on, hobbling as best she could, and the king walked by her side with his hand on her neck. In this way, they came to a small village, and here the nag turned up a by-road, and halted outside the blacksmith's forge. The smith's lad stood within, clinking at the anvil, the smuttiest lad smith ever had. Lad! cried the king. The lad looked up from his work, and came at once to the door, wiping his hands upon his leather apron. Where am I? asked the king. In the village of Washington said the lad. "'What? Under the ring?' cried the king. "'Yes, sir,' said the lad. "'A blessing on you,' said the king joyfully, and clapped his hand on the lad's shoulder. "'Pepper, you have solved the problem and led me to my destiny.' "'Is Pepper your nag's name?' asked the blacksmith's lad. "'It is,' said the king, "'her only one.' "'Then she has one more name than she has shoes.' said the lad. How came she to lose them? I didn't notice, confessed the king. You must have been thinking very deeply, remarked the lad. Are you in love? I am not quite twenty-one, said the king. I see. Do you want your nag shod? I do, but I have spent my last penny. Earn another, then, said the lad. I did not even earn the last one said the king shamefacedly. I have never worked in my life. Why, where have you lived? exclaimed the lad. In a barn. But one works in a barn. Stop! cried the king, putting his fingers in his ears. One prays in a barn. Very likely, said the lad, looking at him curiously. Are you going to pray in one? Yes, 
said the king. When is the new moon? Next Saturday. Hurrah! cried the king. That settles it. But what's today? Monday, sir. Alas! sighed William, wondering how he should make shift to live for five days. I don't know what you mean, sir, said the lad. I would tell you my meaning, said the king, but am pledged not to. Then the lad said, Let it pass. I have a proposal to make. My father is dead, and for two years I have worked the forge single-handed. Now I am willing to teach you to shoe your nag with four good shoes and strong, if you will meanwhile blow the bellows for whatever other jobs come to the forge. And if the shoes are not done by dinner-time, you shall have a meal thrown in. The king looked at the lad kindly. I shall blow your bellows very badly, he said, and shoe my nag still worse. Said the lad, You'll learn in time. Not before dinner time, I hope, said the king, for I am very hungry. You look hungry, said the lad. It's a bargain, then. The king held out his hand, but the lad suddenly whipped his behind his back. It's so dirty, sir, he said. Give it me all the same said the king, and they clasped hands. The rest of that morning the king spent in blowing the bellows, and by dinner-time not so much as the first of Pepper's hoofs was shod, for a great deal of business came into the forge, and there was no time for a lesson. So the king and the lad took their meal together, and the king was by this time nearly as black as his master. He would have washed himself, but the lad said it was no matter, he himself having no time to wash from week's end to week's end. In the afternoon they changed places, and the king stood at the anvil, and the lad at the bellows. He was a good teacher, but the king made a poor job of it. By nightfall he had produced shoes resembling all the letters of the alphabet excepting U, and when at last he submitted to the lad a shoe like nothing so much as a drunken S, his master shrugged and said, Zeal is praiseworthy within its limits, but the best of smiths do not attempt to make two shoes at once. Let us sup. They supped, and afterwards the lad showed the king a small bedroom as neat as a new pin. I shall sully the sheets, said William, and you will excuse me if I fetch the kettle which is on the boil. As you please, said the lad, and took himself off. In the morning the king came clean to breakfast, but the lad was as black as he had been. Tuesday passed as Monday had passed. Now William took the bellows, marvelling at his youthful master's deftness, and now the lad blew, groaning at his pupil's clumsiness. By nightfall, however, he had achieved a shoe faintly recognizable as such. For a second time the king washed himself and slept again in the little trim chamber but the lad in the morning resembled midnight. In this way the week went by, the king's heart beating a little faster each morning as Saturday approached, and he wondered by what ruse he could explain his absence without creating suspicion or breaking his pledge. On Saturday morning the lad said to the king, This is a half day. You must make your shoe this morning or not at all. It is my custom at one o'clock to close the forge and go to visit my great-aunt, I will be at work again on Monday, till when you must shift for yourself." The king could hardly believe his luck in having matters so well settled, and he spent the morning so diligently that by noon he had produced a shoe which, if not that of a master craftsman, was at least adaptable to the purpose for which it had been fashioned. The lad examined it, and said reluctantly, "'It will do.' and proceeded to show the king how to fasten it to Pepper's hoof. Why, said the king, having the nags off forefoot in his hand, here's a stone in it. Small wonder she limped. It isn't a stone, said the lad, extracting it. It is a ruby. And he exhibited to the king a ruby of such a glowing red that it was as though the souls of all the grapes of Burgundy had been pressed to create it. You are a rich man now, said the lad quietly, and can live as you will. But William closed the lad's fingers over the stone. Keep it, he said, 
for you have filled me for a week, and I have paid you with nothing but my breath. As you please, said the lad carelessly, and tossing the stone upon a shelf, locked up the forge. Now I am going to my great-aunt. There's a cake in the larder. So saying, he strolled away, and the king was left to his own devices. These consisted in bathing himself from head to foot, till his body was as pure without as he desired his heart to be within, and in donning his fresh suit of linen. He would not break his fast, but waited trembling and eager till an hour before sundown, and then at last he set forth to mount the great hill with the sacred crown of trees upon his crest. When at last he stood upon the boundary of the ring, his heart sprang for joy in his breast, and his breath nearly failed him, with amazement at the beauty of the world which lay outspread for leagues below him. "'O oh, lovely earth!' he cried aloud. "'Never till now have I known what beauty I lived in. "'How is it that we cannot see the wonder of our surroundings "'until we gaze upon them from afar? "'But if you look so fair from the hilltops, "'what must you appear from the very sky?' "'And lost in delight, he turned his eyes upward, "'and was recalled to his senses by the sight of the sinking sun. "'Lovely one, how nearly you have betrayed me,' he said, "'and smiling, waved his hand to the dear earth, "'sealed up his lips, and entered the ring. "'And here, between the two midmost beeches, "'he knelt down, and buried his face in his hands, "'and prayed the spirits of that place to make him worthy. "'The hours passed, quarter by quarter, and the king stayed motionless like one in a dream. Presently, however, the dream was faintly shaken by a little lurrup of sound, as light as rain dropping from leaves above a pool. Again and again the sweet round notes fell on the meditations of the king, and he remembered with entrancement that this was the tender signal by which he was summoned to the dew-pond. So rising silently, he wandered through the trees, and keeping his eyes fixed on the soft dim turf, lest some new beauty should tempt him to speech, he went across the open hill to the pond. Here he knelt down again, listening to the childlike bird, until at last the young piping ceased with a joyous chuckle. And at that instant, reflected in the pond, he saw the silver star that watches the invisible young moon, and dipped his head. Oh, my dear maids, when he lifted it again, all wet and bewildered, he saw upon the opposite border of the pond a figure, the white figure of a woman, a girl, a child. He could not tell, for she lay three parts in the shadowy water with her back towards him, and his gaze and senses swam. But in that faint starlight, one bare and lovely arm, as white as the crescent moon, was clear to him, upcurved to her shadowy hair. So she reclined, and so he knelt, both motionless, and his heart trembled, even as it had trembled at the bird's song, with a wish to go near to her, or at least to whisper to her across the water. Indeed he was on the point of doing so, when a sudden contraction seized him, his eyes closed in a delicious agony, and he sneezed once vigorously. And in that moment of shattering blackness, he recalled his vow, and rising turned his back upon the vision, and groped his way again to the shelter of the trees. Here he remained till dawn in meditation, but as to the nature of his meditations, I am, dear maidens, ignorant, nor do I know in what restless wise he passed his Sunday. It is enough to know that on Monday, when he went into the forge, he found the lad already at work, and if he had been pitch black at their parting, he was no less so at their meeting. He appeared to be out of humour, and for some time regarded his apprentice with dissatisfaction, but only remarked at last, You look fatigued. My sleep was broken with dreams, said the king. I am sorry if I am late. Let me to my shoeing. Since Saturday has ended in success, I suppose I shall now finish the business without more ado. He was, however, too hopeful as it appeared, for though he managed to fashion a shoe which was in his own eyes the equal of the other, 
the lad was captious and would not commend it. "'I should be an ill craftmaster,' said he, "'if I let you rest content on what you have already done. I made such a shoe as this on my thirteenth birthday, and my father's only praise was, you must do better yet. So particular was the young smith that William spent the whole of another week in endeavouring to please him. This might have chafed the king, but that it agreed entirely with his desires to remain in that place, sleeping and eating at no cost to himself, and working so strenuously that his hands grew almost as hard as the metal he worked in for the lad now began to entrust him with small jobs of various sorts, although in the matter of the second shoe he refused to be satisfied. When Saturday came, however, the king contrived a shoe so much superior to any he had yet made, that the lad, examining it, was compelled to say, It is better than the other. Then Pepper, who always stood in a noose beside the door awaiting her moment, lifted up her near forefoot of her own accord, and the king took it in his hand. "'How odd!' he exclaimed a moment later. "'The nag has a stone in this foot also. It is not strange that she went so ill.' "'It is not a stone,' said the lad. "'It is a pearl.' And he held out to the king a pearl of such a shining purity that it was as though it had been rounded within the spirit of a saint. This makes you a rich man, said the lad moodily, and you can journey whither you please. But the king shook his head. Keep it, he said, for you have lodged me for a week, and I have given you only the clumsy service of my hands. Very well, said the lad simply, and put the pearl in his pocket. My great aunt is expecting me. There's a cake in the larder. So saying, he walked off and the king was left alone. As before, he bathed himself and changed his linen, and left the contents of the larder untouched. And an hour before sunset, he climbed the hill for the second time, and presently stood panting on the edge of the ring. And again a pang of wonder that was akin to pain shot through his heart at the loveliness of the world below him. "'Beautiful earth!' he cried once more, how fair and dear you are become to me in your remoteness. But, oh, if you appear so beautiful from this summit, what must you appear from the summit of the clouds? And he glanced from the earth to the sky, and saw the sun running down his airy hill. Dear temptress, he said, how cunningly you would snare me from my purpose. And he kissed his hand to her thrice, sealed up his lips, and entered the ring. Between the two tall beeches he knelt down, and drowned the following hours in thought and prayer, till that deep lake of meditation was divided by the sound of singing, as though a shoal of silver fishes swam and leapt upon its surface, putting all quietness to flight, and troubling its waters with a million lovelinesses. For now it was as though the bird's enchanting song came partly from within and partly from without, and if the fall of its music shattered his dream like falling fish, certain it seemed to him that the fish had first leapt from his own heart, out of whose unsuspected caves darted a shoal of nameless longings. He too leapt up and darted through the trees, and with head bent down, for fear of he knew not what, made his way to the pond. Here he knelt again, drinking in the tremulous song of the bird, as tremulous as youth and maidenhood, until at last it ceased with a sweet, uncompleted cry of longing. And at that instant, in the mirror of the pond, he saw the uncompleted disk of the half-moon, and dipped his head. Ah, wonder! When he lifted it again, dazzled and dripping, he saw across the pond a figure rising from the water, the figure, as he could now perceive in the fuller light, of a girl clear to the waist. Her face was half turned from him, and her hair flowed half to him and half away, but within that cloudy setting gleamed the lines of her lovely neck, and one white shoulder and one moonlit breast, whose under curve appeared to float upon the pond like the petal of a water-lily. 
So he knelt on his side, and she on hers, both motionless, and his heart leapt, even as it had leapt at the bird's song, with a longing to kneel beside and even touch that loveliness. Or if he could not, at least to call to her across the pond, so that she would turn and reveal to him what still was hidden. He was in fact about to do so, when suddenly his senses were overwhelmed with a sweet anguish, darkness fell on him, and from its very core he sneezed twice violently. This interruption of the previous spell was sufficient to bring him to a realization of his peril, and rising hastily he ran back to the ring, for he remained till morning. But to what pious thoughts he then committed himself I cannot tell you, neither in what feverish fashion he got through Sunday. End of Part 1 of The King's Barn Section 5 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. The King's Barn continued. On Monday morning, when he arrived at the forge, he found the lad at work before him, and Ebony was not blacker than his face. He glanced at the King with some show of temper, but only said, you look worn out. I have had bad dreams, said the king. Excuse me for being behind my time. I will try to make up for it by wasting no more and fashioning instantly two shoes as good as that I made on Saturday. But though he handled his tools with more dexterity than he had yet exhibited, the lad petulantly pushed aside the first shoe he made, which to the king appeared to be, if anything, superior to the one he had made on Saturday. The lad, however, quickly explained himself, saying, A master smith who intends to make his apprentice his equal will not let him rest at the halfway house. I made a shoe like this when I was fourteen, and all my father said was, I have hopes of you. So for yet another week the king's nose was kept to the grindstone, and it would have irritated most men to find their good work repeatedly condemned. But William was, as you may have observed, singularly sweet-tempered, besides which he desired nothing so much as to remain where he was. And for another five days he slept and ate and worked, until the muscles of his arms began to swell, and he swung the hammer with as much ease as his master, who now left a great part of the work entirely in his hands, although in the matter of the third shoe he refused to be satisfied. Nevertheless, on Saturday morning, the king, making a last effort before the forge was shut, submitted a shoe so far beyond anything he had yet achieved, that the lad could not but say, This is a good shoe. And Pepper, seeing them coming, lifted her off hind foot to be shod. Now as I live, cried the king, another stone! And how she contrived to hobble so far is a miracle! It isn't a stone, said the lad, it is a diamond and he presented to the king a diamond of such triumphant brilliance that it might have been conceived of the ambitions of the mightiest monarch of the earth. "'You now owe in surpassing wealth,' said the lad dejectedly, "'and you have no more need to work.' But William would not even touch the stone. "'Keep it,' he said, "'for you have befriended me for a week, and I have given you only the strength of my arms.' "'Let it be so,' said the lad gently, and put the diamond in his belt. I must not keep my great-aunt waiting. There's a cake in the larder. So saying, he went his way, and the king went his, which, as you may surmise, was to the bath and his clean clothes. He did not go into the larder, and an hour before sunset made the ascent of the hill, and for the third time stood like a conqueror upon the crest. And as he gazed over the lands below, his heart throbbed with a passion for the earth that was half agony and half love, unless it was the whole agony of love. "'Most beautiful earth!' he cried aloud. "'Only as you recede from me do I realize how necessary it is for me to possess you. How is it that when I possess you I know you not as I know you now? But, oh, 
if you are so wonderful from these great hills, what must you be from the greater hills of the air? And he looked up, and saw the sun descending in the west. Sweet earth, he sighed, you would hold me when I should be gone, and never remind me that the moment to depart is due. And he stretched out his arms to her, sealed up his lips, and went into the ring. Once more he knelt between the great beeches, and sank all thoughts in pious contemplation, till suddenly those still waters were convulsed as though with stormy currents, and a wild song beat through his breast, so that he could not believe it was the bird singing from a short distance. It was as though the storm of music broke from his singing heart, yes, from his own heart singing with some unexpressed fulfillment. He was barely conscious of going through the trees, with eyes shut tight against the outer world, but soon he was kneeling at the brink of the pond, while the surge of joy and pain in the song broke on his spirit like waves upon a shore, or love upon a man and a woman. Washed back, towered up, and broke on him again. And at last, on one full glorious phrase, it ceased. And at that instant, deep in the pond, he saw the full orb of the moon, and dipped his head. Oh, when he lifted it, startled and illuminated, he saw on the far side of the pond a woman standing. The moonlight bathed her form from head to foot. Her hair was thrown behind her, and she stood facing him, so that in the cold, clear light he could see her fully revealed. Her strong, tender face, her strong, soft body, her strong, slim legs, her strong and lovely arms. As white as May Blossom she was, and beauty went forth from her like fragrance from the shaken bough. So he knelt on his side, and she stood on hers, both motionless, but gazing into each other's eyes, and his heart broke, even as it had broken at the bird's song, with a passion to take her in his arms, for it seemed to him that this alone would mend its breaking. Or if he might not do this, at least to send his need of her in a great cry across the pond. And as his passion grew, she slowly lifted her arms and opened them to him as though to bid him enter. And her lips parted and she cried out as though she were uttering the cry of his own soul. Beloved! All the joy and the pain fulfilled of the bird's song were gathered in that word. Glorified he leapt up, his whole being answering the cry of hers. But before his lips could translate it, he was gripped by a mighty agony, and sneeze after sneeze shook all his senses, so that he was utterly helpless. When he was able to look up again, he saw the woman moving towards him round the pond, and suddenly he clapped his hands over his eyes and fled towards the ring, as though pursued by demons. Here he passed the remainder of the night, but in what sort of prayers I leave you to imagine, as also amid what ravings he passed his Sunday. On Monday the lad was again before him at the forge, and a crow's wing had looked milky beside his face. He did not raise his eyes as the king came in, but said, You look very ill. He said it furiously. I have had nightmares, said the king, Pardon me, if you can. I will get to work and make my final shoe. But though he had now little more to learn in his craft, the lad, when the shoe was made, picked it up in his pinchers and flung it to the other end of the forge. Yet the king now knew enough to know that few smiths could have made its equal. So he looked surprised, at which the lad, controlling himself, said, When I pass your fourth shoe, you will need no more masters. I forged a shoe like that one yonder when I was fifteen, and my father said of it, You will make a smith one day. And on neither Tuesday, nor Wednesday, nor Thursday, nor Friday could the king succeed in pleasing the lad. The better his shoes, the angrier grew his young master, that they were not good enough. Yet between these gusts of temper he was gentle and remorseful, and once the king saw tears in his eyes and another time the lad came humbly to ask for pardon. Then William laughed and put out his hand, 
but as once before the lad slipped his behind his back and said, It is so dirty, friend. And this time he would not let William take it. So the king was forced instead to lay his arm about the lad's shoulder and press it tenderly. But the lad made no response, and only stood hanging his head until the king removed his arm. All the same, when next the king made a shoe he was full of rage, and stamped on it and ran out of the forge, which surprised the king all the more because it was so excellent a shoe. Yet he was secretly glad of his rejection, for he felt it would break his heart to go away from that place, and he could think of no good cause for remaining once Pepper was shod. So there he stayed, eating, sleeping, and working, while the thews of his back became as strong under the smooth skin as the thews of a beech tree under the smooth bark. And his craft was such that the lad at last left the whole of the work of the forge in his charge, for there was nothing he could not do surpassingly well. And this the lad admitted, save only in the case of the fourth shoe. But on Saturday, just before closing time, the king set to, and made a shoe so fine that when the lad saw it, he said quietly, I could not make a better. Had he not said so, he must have lied, or proved that he did not know a masterpiece when he saw it. And he was too good a craftsman for that, besides being honest. Pepper instantly lifted up her near hind foot. Upon my word, exclaimed the king, the world is full of stones, and Pepper has found them all. The wonder is that she did not fall down on the road. This is not a stone, said the lad, it is an opal. And he displayed an opal, of such marvellous changeability, such milk and fire, shot with such shifting rainbows, that it was as though it had had birth of all the moods of all the women of all time. This enriches you for life, said the lad gloomily, and now you are free of masters forever. But William thrust his hands into his pockets. Keep it, he said, for this week you have given me love, and I have given you nothing but the sinews of my body. The lad looked at him and said, I have given you hard words and fits of temper and much injustice. Have you? said William. I remember only your tenderness and your tears, so keep the opal in love's name. The lad tried to answer, but could not, and he slipped the opal under his shirt. Then he faltered. My great aunt! And still he could not speak. But he made a third effort and said, There is a cake in the larder, and turned on his heel and went away quickly. And the king looked after him till he was out of sight, and then very slowly went to his bath and his fresh linen. But he left the cake where it was. And he sat by the door of the forge with his face in his hands, until the length of his shadow warned him that he must go. And he rose and went for the last time up the hill, but with a sinking heart. And when he stood on the top and gazed upon the beauty of the earth he had left below, in his breast was the ache of loss and longing for one he had loved, and with his eyes he tried to draw that beauty into himself, but the void in him remained unfulfilled. Yet never had her beauty been so great. Beloved and lovely earth, he whispered, why do you appear most fair and most desirable now that I am about to lose you? Why, when I had you, did you not hold me by force and tell me what you were? Only now I discover you from mid-heaven, but, oh, in what way should I discover you from heaven itself? And he looked upward, and, lo, a blurred sun shone upon him, swimming to its rest. Farewell, dear earth, said the king, since you cannot mount to me, and I may not descend to you. And he knelt upon the turf, and laid his cheek and forehead to it, and then he rose, sealed up his lips, and passed into the ring. Between the two tall beeches he sank down, and all sense and thought and consciousness sank with him, as though his being had become a dead forgotten lake, hidden in a lifeless wood, where birds sang not, nor rain fell, nor fishes played, nor currents moved below the stagnant waters. 
but presently a wind seemed to wail among the trees, and the sound of it travelled over the king's senses, stirred them, and passed. But only to return again, moan over him and trail away. And so it kept coming and going, till first he heard, then listened to, and at last realized the haunting signal of the bird. And he went forth into the open night, his eyes wide apart, but seeing nothing until he stumbled at the pond and crouched beside it. The bird grew fainter and fainter, and presently the sound, like a ghost at dawn, ceased to exist. And at that instant, under the pond, he beheld the lessening circle of the moon, and dipped his head. Alas! when he lifted it, shivering and stunned, he saw the form he longed to see on the other side of the pond, but not as he had longed to see it, gazing at him with the love and glory of seven nights ago. Now she stood on the turf, half turned from him, and the wave of her hair blew to and fro like a cloud, now revealing her white side, now concealing it. And he looked, but she would not look. So he knelt on his side, and she remained on hers, both motionless. And suddenly the impulse to sneeze arose within him, and at that instant she began to move, not towards him as before, but away from him downhill. At that he could bear no more, and quelling the impulse with a mighty effort, he got upon his feet, crying, Beloved, stay! Beloved, stay! Beloved! And he staggered round the pond as quickly as his shaking knees would let him. But quicker still she slid away, and when he came where she had been, the place was as empty as the sky in its moonless season. He called and ran about, and called again, but he got no answer, nor found what he sought. All that night he spent in calling and running to and fro. What he did on Sunday you may know, and I may know, but he did not. On Sunday night he stayed beside the pond, but whatever his hopes were they received no fulfillment. On Monday night he was there again, and on Tuesday and on Wednesday. And between the mornings and the nights he went from hill to hill, seeking her hiding-place who came to bathe in the lake. There was not a hill within a day's march that did not know him, from Duncton to Mount Harry. But on none of them he found the woman. How he lived is a puzzle, perhaps upon wild raspberries. After the sun had set on Chanctonbury on Saturday night, he came exhausted to the ring again, and stood on that high hill gazing earthward. But there was no light above or below, and he said, I have lost all, for the earth is swallowed in blackness, and the woman has disappeared into space, and I myself have cast away my spiritual initiation. I will sit by the pond till midnight, and if the bird sings, then I will still hope. But if it does not, I will dip my head in the water, and not lift it again. So he went, and lay down by the pond in the darkness, and the hours wore away. And as the time of the bird's song drew near, he clasped his hands and prayed. But the bird did not sing, and when he judged that midnight was come, he got upon his knees, and prepared to put his head under the water. And as he did so, he saw, on the opposite side of the pond, the feeble light of a lantern. He could not see who held it, because even as he looked the bearer blew out the light. But in that moment it appeared to him that she was as black as the night itself. So for a while he knelt upon his side, and she remained on hers, both trembling. But at last the king, dreading to startle her away, rose softly and went round the pond to where he had seen her. He said into the night in a shaking voice, I cannot see you. If you are there, give me your hand. And out of the night a shaking voice replied, It is so dirty, beloved. Then he took her in his arms, and felt how she trembled, and he held her closely to him to still her, whispering, You are my lad. Yes, said she in a low voice, but wait. And she slipped out of his embrace, and he heard her enter the pond, and she stayed there as it seemed to him a lifetime. 
but presently she rose up, and even in that black night the whiteness of her body was visible to him, and she came to him as she was, and laid her head on his breast, and said, I am your woman. I want my apple, said Martin Pippin. But is this the end? cried little Joan. Why not? said Martin. The lovers are united. Jocelyn. Nonsense! Of course it is not the end. You must tell us a thousand other things. Why was the woman a woman on Saturday night, and a lad all the rest of the week? Joyce. What of the four jewels? Jennifer. Which of the answers to the king's riddle was the right one? Jessica. What happened to the cake? Jane. What was her name? Please, said little Joan, do not let this be the end, but tell us what they did next. Women will be women, observed Marden, and to the end of time prefer unessentials to the essential. But I will endeavor to satisfy you on the points you name. In the morning, William said to his beloved, Now tell me something of yourself. How come you to be so masterful a smith? Why did you live as a black lad all the week, and turn only into a white woman on Saturdays? Have you really got a great aunt, and where does she live? How old are you? Why were you so hard to please about the shoeing of Pepper? And why, the better my shoes, the worse your temper? Why did you run away from me a week ago? Why did you never tell me who you were? Why have you tormented me for a whole month? What is your name? Trust a man to ask questions, said his beloved, laughing and blushing. Is it not enough that I am your beloved? More than enough, yet not nearly enough, said the king. For there is nothing of yourself which you must not tell me in time, from the moment when you first stole barley sugar behind your father's back down to that in which you first loved me. Then I had best begin at once, she smiled, for a lifetime will not be long enough. I am eighteen years old, and my name is Viola. I was born in Farmer, and my father was the best smith in all Sussex, and because he had no other child he made me his bellows boy, and in time, as you know, taught me his trade. But he was, as you also know, a stern master, and it was not until on my sixteenth birthday I forged a shoe the equal of your last that he said I could not make a better. And so saying, he died. Now I had no other relative in all the world except my great-aunt, the wise woman of the bush hovel, and her I had never seen. But I thought I could not do better in my extremity than go to her for counsel. So shouldering my father's tools, I journeyed west until I came to her place, and found her trying to break in a new birch broom that was still too green and full of sap to be easily mastered, and she was in a very bad temper. "'Good day, great-aunt,' I said. I am your great-niece Viola. I have no more use for great-nieces, she snapped, than for little ones. And she continued to tussle with the broomstick, and took no further notice of me. Then I went into the hovel, where a fire burned on the hearth, and I took out my tools, and fashioned a bit on the hob. And when it was ready, I took it to her, and said, This will teach it its manners. And she put the bit on the broom, which became as docile as a lamb. Great-niece, said she, it appears that I told you a lie this morning. What can I do for you? Tell me, if you please, how I am to live now that my father is dead. There is no need to tell you, said she. You have your living at your fingers' ends. But women cannot be smiths, said I. Then become a lad, said she, and ply your trade where none knows you. And lest men should suspect you by your face, which fools though they be, they might easily do. Let it be so sooted from week's end to week's end that none can discover what you look like. And if any one remarks on it, put it down to your trade. But, great aunt, I said, I could not bear to go dirty from week's end to week's end. If you will be so particular, she said, take a bath every Saturday night, and spend your Sundays with me as fair as when you were a babe. And before you go to work again on Monday, you shall once more conceal your fairness past all men's penetration. But, dear great-aunt, I pleaded, it may be that the day will come when I might not wish. And here, dear maidens, Vila faltered. And William put his arm about her a little tighter, because it was there already, and said, 
what might you not wish, beloved? And she murmured, To be concealed past one man's penetration. And my great-aunt said, I need not worry. Because though men, she said, were fools, there was one time in every man's life when he was quick enough to penetrate all obscurities, whether it were a lair of soot or a night without a moon. And she hid her face on the king's shoulder, and he tried to kiss her, but could not make her look up, until he said, Or even a woman's waywardness? Then she looked up of her own accord and kissed him. In this way, she resumed, it became my custom on each Saturday, after closing the forge, to come here with my woman's raiment, and wait in a hollow until night had fallen, and make myself clean of the week's blackness. For I dared not do this by daylight, or be seen going forth from my forge in my proper person. But why did you choose to bathe at midnight? asked the king. She was silent for a few moments, and then said hurriedly, I did not choose to bathe at midnight until a month ago. For the rest, she resumed, I was hard to please in the matter of the shoes, because I knew that when they were finished you would ride away. And therefore the more you improved, the crosser I became. And if I have tormented you for a month, it was because you tormented me by refusing to speak when you saw me here, because of your hateful vow, and you would not even look at my cake in the larder. "'Women are strange,' said the king. "'How do you know I did not look at the cake?' "'I do know,' she said as hurriedly as before. "'And if I would not tell you who I was, "'it was because I could not bear, on the other hand, "'to exhort from you a love you seemed so reluctant to endure, "'until, indeed, it became of its own accord "'too strong even for the purpose which brought you every week to the ring. "'For I knew that purpose.' since all dwellers in Washington know why men go up the hill with the new moon. But when my love did become too strong for my vow, and opened my lips at last, said the king, why did you run away? Viola said, Had you not run away the week before? And now I have answered all your questions. No, said the king, not all. You haven't told me when you first loved me. Fiola smiled, and said, I first stole barley sugar when my father said, This is for the other little girl over the way. And I first loved you when, seeing you had been too absent-minded to know that Pepper had cast her shoes, I feared you were in love. But that was three minutes after we met, cried the king. Was it as much as that? said she. Now after a while, Viola said, Let us get down to the world again. We cannot stay here forever. Why not? said the king. However, they walked to the brow of the hill, and stood together gazing a while over the sunlit earth that had never been so beautiful to either of them, for their sight was newly washed with love, and all things were changed. Now I know how she looks from heaven, said the king, and that is like heaven itself. Let us go for I think she will still look so at our coming, seeing that we carry heaven with us. So they went downhill to the forge, and there Viola said to her lover, I can stay no longer in this place where all men have known me as a lad, and besides, a woman's home is where her husband lives. But I live only in a barn, said William the king. Then I will live there with you, said Viola, and from this very night, but first I will shoe Pepper anew, for she is so unequally shod that she might spill us on the road. And that she may be shod worthily of herself and of us, give me what you have tied up in your blue handkerchief. The king fetched his handkerchief and unknotted it, and gave her his crown and scepter. And she set him at the bellows, and made three golden shoes, and shod the nag on her two forefeet and her off hind foot. But when she looked at the near hind foot, which the king had shod last of all, she said, I could not make a better, and therefore, like his father, the lad must shut his smithy, for he is dead. Then she put the three shoes she had removed into a bag with some other trifles, and while she did so, the king took what remained of the gold, and made it into two rings. This done, they got onto Pepper's back, 
and with her three shoes of gold and one of iron she bore them the way the king had come. When they passed the bush hovel they saw the wise woman currying her broomstick, and Viola cried, Great aunt, give us a blessing. Great niece, said the wise woman, how can I give you what you already have? But I will give you this. And she held out a horseshoe. Good gracious, said the king, this was once Pepper's. It was, said the wise woman, in her merriment at hearing you ask a silly question, she cast it outside my door. A little farther on they came to the guest gate, but when the king, dismounting, swung it open, it grated on something in the road. He stooped and lifted a horseshoe. Wonder of wonders, exclaimed the king, this also was Pepper's. What shall we do with it? Hang it up, hang it up, creaked the gate, and clicked home. In due course they reached the doves, and at the sound of Pepper's hoofs the brothers flocked out to meet them. Is all well? cried the ring dove, seeing the king only, and have you returned to us for the final blessing? I have, replied the king, for I bring my bride behind me, and now you must make us one. The gentle brothers, rejoicing at the sight of their happiness and their beauty, led them in, and there they were wedded. The doves offered them to eat, but the king was impatient to reach his barn by nightfall. So they got again on Pepper's back, and as they were about to leave, the ring dove said, I have something of yours, which is in itself a thing of no moment. Yet, because it is of good augury, take it with you. And he gave the king Pepper's third shoe. Thank you, said the king. I will hang it over my barn door. Now he urged Pepper to her full speed, and they went at a gallop past the hawking sopers, who, hearing the clatter, came running into the road. Stay, gallopers, stay, they cried, and make merry with us. We cannot, called the king, for we are newly married. Good luck to you, then, shouted the sopers, and with his awes and laughter flung something after them. Viola stretched out her hand and caught it in mid-air and it was a horseshoe. The tale is complete, she laughed, and now you know where Pepper picked up her stones. Soon after, the king said, Here is my barn. And he sprang down and lifted his bride from the nag's back and brought her in. It is a poor place, he said gently, but it is all I have. What can I do for you in such a home? I will tell you said Viola, and putting her hand into her left pocket, she drew out the ruby, winking with the wine of mirth. You can dance in it. And suddenly they caught each other by the hands, and went capering and laughing round the barn like children. Hurrah! cried William. Now I know what a king should do in a barn. But he should do more than dance in it, said Viola, and putting her hand into her right pocket, she gave him the pearl, as pure as a prayer. Beloved, he should pray in it, too. And William looked at her, and knelt, and she knelt by him, and in silence they prayed the same prayer, side by side. Then William rose, and said simply, Now I know. But she knelt still, and took from her girdle the diamond, as bright as power, and she put it in his hand, saying very low, Oh, my dear king, but he should also rule in it. And she kissed his hand. But the king lifted her very quickly, so that she stood equal with his heart, and embracing her, he said, with tears in his eyes, And you, beloved, what will a queen do in a barn? The same as a king, she whispered, and drew from her bosom the opal, as lovely and as variable as the human spirit. With the other three stones you may, if you will, buy back your father's kingdom. But this, which contains all qualities in one, let us keep for ever, for our children and theirs, that they may know there is nothing a king and a queen may not do in a barn, or a man and a woman anywhere. But the best thing they can do is to work in it. Then, going out, she came back with the bag which she had slung on Pepper's back, 
and took from it her father's tools. "'In three weeks you learned all I learned in three years,' said she. "'When I shod Pepper this morning I did my last job as a smith, for now I shall have other work to do. But you, whether you choose to get your father's lands again or no, I pray to work in the trade I have given you, for I have made you the very king of smiths, and all men should do the thing they can do best. So take the hammer, and nail up the horseshoes over the door, while I get supper, for you look as hungry as I feel. But there's nothing to eat, said the king ruefully. However, he went outside, and over the door he hung as many shoes as there are nails in one, the four Pepper had cast on the road, and the three he had first made for her. As he drove the last nail home, Viola cried, Supper is ready! And the king went into the barn, and saw a wedding cake. And now, if you please, Mistress Joan, I have earned my apple. End of The King's Barn Section 6 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. First Interlude Now there was a great munching of apples in the tree, for to tell the truth, during the latter part of the story this business had been suspended, and between bites the milkmaids discussed the merits of what they had just heard. Jessica what is your opinion of this tale, Jane? Jane, it surprised me more than anything, for who could have suspected that the lad was a woman? Martin, lads are to be suspected of any mischief, Mistress Jane. Jocelyn, it is not to be supposed, Master Pibbon, that we are acquainted with the habits of lads. Martin, I suppose nothing, but did the story please you? Jocelyn, as a story, it was well enough to pass an hour. I would be willing to learn whether the king regained his kingdom or no. Martin, I think he did, since you may go to this day to the little city on the banks of the Eder, which is renamed after his barn. But I doubt whether he lived there, or anywhere but in the barn, where he and his beloved began their life of work and prayer and mirth and loving rule, and died as happily as they had lived. Joan. I am glad they lived happily. I was afraid the tale would end unhappily. Joyce. And so was I, for when the king roamed the hills for a whole week without success, I began to fear he would never find the woman again. Jennifer. I, for my part, feared lest he should not open his lips during the fourth vigil, and so must become a dove for the remainder of his days. Jane. It was by the grace of a moment he did not drown himself in the pond. Jessica. Or what if, by some unlucky chance, he had never come to the forge at all? Martin. In any of these events, I grant you, the tale must have ended in disaster. And this is the special wonder of love tales, that though they may end unhappily in a thousand ways, and happily in only one, yet that one will vanquish the thousand, as often as the desires of lovers run in tandem. But there is one accident you have left out of count, and it is the worst stumbling block I know of in the path of happy endings. All of the milkmaids. What is it? Martin. Suppose the lovely Viola had been a sworn virgin and a hater of men. There was silence in the apple orchard. Jocelyn. She would have been none the worse for that, singer, and the tale would have been none the less a tale, which is all we look for from you. This talk of happy endings is silly talk. The king might have sought the woman in vain, or kept his vow, or drowned himself, or ridden to the confines of Kent, for aught I care. Joyce, or I. Jennifer, or I. Jessica, or I. Jane, or I. Martin, I am silenced. Tales are but tales, and not worth speculation. And see, the moon is gone to sleep behind a cloud, 
which shows us nothing save the rainbow of her dreams. It is time we did as she does. Like shooting stars in August, the milkmaids slid from their leafy heaven and dropped to the grass. And here they pillowed their heads on their soft arms, and soon were breathing the breath of sleep. But little Joan sat on in the swing. Now all this while she had kept between her hands the promised apple, turning and turning it like one in doubt, and presently Martin looked aside at her with a smile, and held his open palm to receive his reward. And first she glanced at him, and then at the sleepers, and last she tossed the apple lightly in the air. But by some mishap she tossed it too high, and it made an arc clean over the tree, and fell in a distant corner by the hedge. So she ran quickly to recover it for him, and he ran likewise, and they stooped and rose together, she with the apple in her hands, he with his hands on hers, at which she blushed a little, but held fast to the fruit. What? said Martin Pippin. Am I never to have my apple? She answered softly, Only when I am satisfied, as you promised. And are you not? What have I left undone? Joan, please, Master Pippin, what did the young king look like? Martin, fool that I am to leave these vital things untold. I shall avoid this error in future. He was more than middle tall and broad in the shoulders, and he had grey-blue eyes and a fresh colour and a kind and merry look and dark brown hair that was not always as sleek as he wished it to be. Joan, oh! Martin, with this further oddity, that above the nape of his neck was a whitish tuft, which, though he took great pains to conceal it, continually obtruded through the darker hair like the cotton-tail on the back of a rabbit. Joan, oh, oh! And she became as red as a cherry. Martin, may I have my apple? Joan, but had he not a moustache? Martin, he fondly believed so. Joan, with unexpected fire. It was a big and beautiful moustache. Martin, fervently. There was never a king of twenty years with one so big and beautiful. She gave him the apple. Martin, thank you. Will you, because I have answered many questions, now answer one? Joan, yes. Martin, then tell me this. What is your quarrel with men? Joan, oh, Master Pippin, they say that one and one make two. Martin, is it possible? Good heavens, are men such numbskulls? When they have but to go to the littlest woman on earth to learn, what you and I well know, that one and one make one, and sometimes three, or four, or even half a dozen, but never two. Fie upon these men! Joan, I am glad you think I am in the right, but how obstinate they are! Martin, as obstinate as children, and should be birched as roundly. Joan, oh, but you would not birch children. Martin, you are right again. They should be coaxed. Joan, yes, no, I mean, good night, dear singer. Martin, good night, dear milkmaid. Sleep sweetly among your comrades who are wiser than we, being so indifferent to happy endings that they would never unpadlock sorrow though they had the key in their keeping. Then he took her hands in one of his, and put his other hand very gently under her chin, and lifted it till he could look into her face, and he said, Give me the key to Jillian's prison, little Joan, because you love happy endings. Joan, Dear Martin, I cannot give you the key. Martin, Why not? Joan, because I stuck it inside your apple. So he kissed her, and they parted, and lay down and slept, she among her comrades under the apple tree, and he under the bryony in the hedge, and the moon came out of her dream and watched theirs. With morning came a hoarse voice calling along the hedge, 
Maids, maids, maids! Up sprang the milkmaids, rubbing their eyes and stretching their arms. And up sprang Martin likewise, and seeing him, Jocelyn was stricken with dismay. It is old Gilman, our master, she whispered. Come with bread and questions. Quick, singer, quick, into the hollow russet before he reaches the hole in the hedge. Swiftly the milkmaids hustled Martin into the russet tree, and concealed him at the very moment when the farmer was come to the peephole, filling it with his round red face and broad grey fringe of whiskers, like the winter's sun on a sky that is going to snow. "'Good morrow, maids,' quoth old Gilman. "'Good morrow, master,' said they. "'Is my daughter come to her mind yet?' "'No, master,' said little Joan, "'but I begin to have hopes that she may.' "'If she do not,' groaned Gilman, I know not what will happen to the farmstead, for it is six months now since I tasted water, and how can a man follow his business who is fuddled day and night with barley wine? Life is full of hardships, of which daughters are the greatest. Gillian, he cried, when will ye come to your senses and out of the well-house? But Gillian took no more heed of him than of the quacking of the drake on the duck-pond. "'Well, here is your bread,' said Gilman, and he thrust a basket with seven loaves in it through the gap. "'And may to-morrow bring better tidings.' "'One moment, dear master,' entreated little Joan. "'Tell me, please, how Nancy my jersey fares.' "'Pines for you, pines for you, maid, though Charles does his best by her. But it is as though she had taken a vow to let down no milk till you come again. Rack and ruin, rack and ruin!' and the old man retreated as he had come, muttering, Rack and ruin! the length of the hedge. The maids then set about preparing breakfast, which was simplicity itself, being bread and apples, than which no breakfast could be sweeter. There was a loaf for each maid, and one over for Gillian, which they set upon the wall of the well-house, taking away yesterday's loaf untouched and stale. Does she never eat? asked Martin. "'She has scarcely broken bread in six months,' said Jocelyn, "'and what she lives on besides her thoughts we do not know.' "'Thoughts are a fast or a feast according to their nature,' said Martin. "'So let us feed the ducks, who have none.' They broke the stale bread into fragments, and when the ducks had made a meal, returned to their own, and of two loaves made seven parts, that Martin might have his share and to this they added apples according to their fancies, red or russet, green or golden. After breakfast, at Martin's suggestion, they made little boats of twigs and leaves, and sailed them on the duck-pond, where they met with many adventures and calamities from driftwood, small breezes, and the curiosity of the ducks. And before they were aware of it, the dinner-hour was upon them, when they divided two more loaves as before, and ate apples at will. Then Martin, taking a handkerchief from his pocket, proposed a game of blind man's buff, and the girls, delighted, counted inner meaner minor mo to find the blind man, and Joyce was he. So Martin tied the handkerchief over her eyes. "'Can you see?' asked Martin. "'Of course I can't see,' said Joyce. "'Promise?' said Martin. "'I hope, Master Pippin,' said Jane reprovingly, "'that you can take a girl's word for it.' "'I'm sure I hope I can,' said Martin, and turned Joyce round three times, and ran for his life. And Joyce caught Jane on the spot, and guessed her immediately. Then Jane was blindfolded, and she was so particular about not seeing that it was quite ten minutes before she caught Jennifer, but she knew who she was by the feel of her gown. And Jennifer caught Jocelyn, and guessed her by her girdle. And Jocelyn caught Jessica, and guessed her by the darn in her sleeve and Jessica caught Joan, and guessed her by her ribbon, and Joan caught Martin, and guessed him by his difference. So then Martin was blind man, and it seemed as though he would never have eyes again, for though he caught all the girls one after another, he couldn't guess which was which, and gave Jane's nose to Jessica, and Jessica's hands to Jocelyn, and Jocelyn's chin to Joyce, and Joyce's hair to Jennifer, and Jennifer's eyebrows to Joan but when he caught Joan, he guessed her at once by her littleness. 
In due course the change of light told them it was supper-time, and with great surprise they ate the last two loaves to the sweet accompaniment of the apples. "'I would never have supposed,' said Jocelyn, as they gathered under the central tree at the close of the meal, that a day could pass so quickly. "'Bait time with a diversion,' said Marden, "'and he will run like a donkey after a dangled carrot.' "'It has nearly been the happiest day of my life,' said Joyce, with a sly smile at Marden. "'And why not quite?' said he. "'Because it has lacked a story, singer,' she said demurely. "'What can be rectified?' said Marden, must be, and the day is not yet departed, but still lingers like a listener on the threshold of night. So set the swing in motion, dear Mistress Joyce, and to its measure I will endeavour to swing my thoughts, which have till now been laggards. With these words he sat Joyce in the swing, and himself upon the branch beside it as before, and the other milkmaids climbed into their perches, rustling the fruit down from the shaken boughs, and he made of Joyce's lap a basket for the harvest. And he and each of the maids chose an apple as though supper had not been. "'We are listening,' said Jocelyn from above. "'Not all of you,' said Martin. And he looked up at Jocelyn alert on her branch, and down at Gillian prone on the steps. "'You are here for no other purpose,' said Jocelyn, "'than to make them listen that will not. I would not have you think we desire to listen.' "'I think nothing but that you are the prey of circumstances,' said Marden, "'constrained like flowers to bear witness to that which is against all nature.' "'What do you mean by that?' said Jocelyn. "'Flowers are nature itself.' "'So men have agreed,' replied Marden. "'Yet who but men have compelled them repeatedly to assert such unnaturalnesses "'as that foxes wear gloves and cuckoo's shoes, out on the pretty fibbers!' "'Please do not be angry with the flowers,' said Joan. "'How could I be?' said Marden. "'The flowers must always be forgiven, "'because their inconsistencies lie always at men's doors. "'Besides, who does not love fairy tales?' "'Then Marden kicked his heels against the tree and sang idly. "'When cuckoos fly in shoes and foxes run in gloves,' Then butterflies won't go in twos, and boys will leave their loves. A silly song, said Jocelyn. Marden, if you say so, for my part I can never tell the difference between silliness and sense. Jane, then how can a good song be told from a bad? You must go by something. Marden, I go by the sound. But since Mistress Jocelyn pronounces my song silly, I can only suppose she has seen cuckoos flying in shoes. Jocelyn, you are always supposing nonsense. Who ever heard of cuckoos flying in shoes? Jane, or of foxes running in gloves? Joan, or of butterflies going in ones? Martin, or of boys? Jocelyn, I have frequently seen butterflies going in ones, foolish Joan, and the argument was not against butterflies but cuckoos. Martin, and their shoes. Please, dear Mistress Joan, do not look so downcast, nor you, dear Mistress Jocelyn, so vexed. Let us see if we cannot turn a more sensible song upon this theme. And he sang, Cuckoo shoes aren't cuckoo's shoes, they're shoes which cuckoos never don and cuckoo nests aren't cuckoo's nests, but other birds for a moment gone, and nothing that the cuckoo has but he does make a mock upon. For even when the cuckoo sings, he only says what isn't true. When happy lovers first swore oaths, an artful cuckoo called and flew. Yes, and when lovers weep like dew, the teasing cuckoo laughs, Cuckoo! What need for tears? Cuckoo! Cuckoo! As Marden ended, Gillian raised herself upon an elbow, and looked no more into the green grass, but across the green duck pond. "'The second song seems to me as irrelevant as the first, said Jocelyn. "'But I observe that you cuckooed so loudly as to startle our mistress out of her inattention. So if you mean to tell us another story, by all means tell it now. Not that I care, except for our extremity.' It is my only object to ease it, 
said Martin, so bear with me as well as you may during the recital of young Gerard. End of First Interlude Section 7 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Young Gerard. There was once, dear maidens, a shepherd who kept his master's sheep on Amberley Mount. His name was Gerard, and he was always called Young Gerard, to distinguish him from the other shepherd who was known as Old Gerard yet was not as you might suppose his father. Their master was the lord of Coom Ivy, that lay in the southern valleys of the hills toward the sea. He owned the grazing of the whole circle of the downs between the two great roads, on Amberley and Perry and Wepham and Blackpatch and Cockhill and Highdown and Barnes Farm and Solington and Chantry. But the two Gerards lived together in the great shed behind the copse between Rackham Hill and Kithurst, and the way they came to do so was this. One night in April, when old Gerard's grey beard was still brown, the door of the shed was pushed open, letting in not only the winds of spring, but a woman wrapped in a green cloak, with a lining of cherry colour and a border of silver flowers and golden cherries. In one hand she swung a crystal lantern set in a silver frame, but it had no light in it, and in the other she held a small slip of a cherry tree, but it had no bloom on it. Her dress was white, or had been, for the skirts of it and her mantle were draggled and sodden, and her green shoes stained and torn, and her long fair hair lay limp and dank upon her mantle, whose hood had fallen away, and the shadows round her blue eyes were as black as pools and her hedgerows thawing after a frost, and her lovely face was as white as the snowbanks they bed in. Behind her came another woman in a duffel cloak, a crone with eyes as black as sloes, and a skin as brown as beech nuts, and unkempt hair like the fireless smoke of old man's beard straying where it will on the November woodsides. She too was wet and soiled, but full of life, where the young one seemed full of death. The shepherd looked at the strange pair, and said surlily, what want ye? Shelter, replied the crone. She pushed the lady, who never spoke, into the bed, and took from her shoulders the wet mantle, and from her hands the lantern into the tree, and led her to the shepherd's bed, and laid her down. Then she spread the mantle over the shepherd's bench, and, Lie there, said she, till love warms ye. Next she hung the lantern up on a nail in the wall, and, Swing there, said she, till love lights ye. Last she took the shepherd's trowel, and went outside the shed, and set the cherry slip beside the door, and she said, Grow there till love blossoms ye. After this she came inside, and sat down at the bedhead. Gerard, the shepherd, who had watched her proceedings without word or gesture, said to himself, They've come through the floods. He looked across at the women, and raised his voice to ask, Did ye come through the floods? The lady moaned a little, and the crone said, Let her be, and go to sleep. What does it matter where we came from by night? By daybreak we shall both of us be gone, no matter whither. The shepherd said no more, for though he was both curious and ill-tempered, he had not the courage to disturb the lady, knowing by the richness of her dress that she was of the quality, and the iron of serfdom was driven deep into his soul. So he went to sleep on his stool as he had been bidden. But in the middle of the night he was awakened by a gusty wind and the banging of his door, and he started up, rubbing his knuckles in his eyes, saying, I've been dreaming of strange women, but was it a dream or no? He peered about the shed, and the crone had vanished utterly, but the lady still lay on his bed. And when he went over to look at her, she was dead. But beside her lay a newborn child that opened its eyes and wailed at him. Then the shepherd ran to his open door and stared into the blowing night, 
but there were no more signs of the crone without than there were within. So he fastened the latch and came back to the bedside and examined the child. But at this point Martin Pippin interrupted himself, and seizing the rope of the swing set it rocking violently. Joyce, I shall fall, I shall fall. Martin, then you will be no worse off than I, who have fallen already, for I see you do not like my story. Joyce, what makes you say so? Martin, till now you listened with all your ears, but a moment ago you turned away your head, a moment too late to hide the disappointment in your eyes. Joyce, it is true I am disappointed, because the beautiful lady is dead, and how can a love story be if half the lovers are dead? Martin, dear Mistress Joyce, what has love to do with death? Love and death are strangers, and speak in different tongues. Women may die, and men may die, but lovers are ignorant of mortality. Joyce, pouting, that may be, singer, but lovers are also a man and a woman, and the woman is dead, and the love tale ended before we have even heard it. You should not have let the woman die. What sort of love tale is this, now the woman is dead? Martin, are not more nests than one built in a springtime? Give me, I pray, two hairs of your head. She plucked two and gave them to him, turning her pouting to laughing. One of them Martin coiled and held before his lips and blew on it. There it flies, said he, and gave her back the second hair. Hold fast by this, and keep it from its fellow with all your might, for to part true mates baffles the forces of the universe. And when you give me the second hair again, I swear I will send it where it will find its fellow. But I will never ask for it, until, my story ended, you say to me, I am content. Examining the child, repeated Martin, the shepherd discovered it to be a lusty boy-child, and this rejoiced him, so that while the baby wept he laughed aloud. "'It is better to weep for something than for nothing,' said he, "'and to laugh for something likewise. Tears are for serfs, and laughter is for freedmen.' For he had conceived the plan of selling the child to his master, the lord of Coom Ivy, and buying his freedom with the purchase money. So in the morning he carried the body of the lady into the heart of the copse, and there he dug a grave, and laid her in it in her white gown. And afterwards he went up hill and down dale to his master, and said he had a man for sale. The lord of Coombe Ivy, who was a jovial lord and a bachelor, laughed at the tale he had to tell. But being always of the humour for a jest, he paid the shepherd a gold piece for the child, and promised him another each midnight on the anniversary of its birth. But on the twenty-first anniversary, he said, the shepherd was to bring back the twenty-one gold pieces he had received, and instead of adding another to them, he would take them again, and make the serf a freedman, and the child his serf. For, said the lord of Coom Ivy, an infant is a poor deal for a man in his prime, as you are, but a youth come to manhood, is a good exchange for a greybeard, as you will be. Therefore, rear this babe as you please, and if he live to manhood, so much the better for you. But if he die first, it's all one to me. The shepherd had hoped for a better bargain, but he must needs be content with seeing liberty at a distance. So he returned to his shed on the hills, and made a leather purse to keep his gold piece in, and hung it round his neck, touching it fifty times a day under his shirt to be sure it was still there. And presently he sought among his ewes one who had borne her young, saying, You shall mother two instead of one. And the baby sucked the ewe like her very lamb, and thrived upon the milk. And the shepherd called the child Gerard after himself. Since, he said, it is as good a name for a shepherd as another. And from that time, they became the young and old Gerards to all who knew them. So the young Gerard grew up, and as he grew the cherry tree grew likewise, but in the strangest fashion. For though it flourished past all expectation, it never put forth either leaf or blossom. 
This bitterly vexed old Gerard, who had hoped in time for fruit, and the frustration of his hopes became to him a cause of grievance against the boy. A further grudge was that by no manner of means could he succeed in lighting any wick or candle in the silver lantern, of which he desired to make use. "'But if your tree and your lantern won't work,' said he, "'it's no reason why you shouldn't.' So he put young Gerard to work, first a sheep-boy to his own flock, but later the boy had a flock of his own. There was no love lost between these two, and kicks and curses were the young one's fare, for he was often idle, and often a truant, and none was held responsible for him except the old shepherd who was selling him piecemeal, year by year, to their master. Because of what depended on him, old Gerard was constrained to show him some sort of care when he would liefer have wrung his neck. The boy's fits exasperated the man, whether he was cutting strange capers and laughing without reason, as he frequently did, or sitting a whole evening in a morose dream, staring at the fire or at the stars and saying never a word. The boy's colouring was as mingled as his moods, a blend of light and dark, black hair, brown skin, blue eyes and golden lashes, a very odd anomaly. Martin, what is it, Mistress Joyce? Joyce, I said nothing, Master Pippin. Martin, I thought I heard you sigh. Joyce, I did not, you did not. Martin, my imagination exceeds all bounds. Because of their mutual dislike, when the boy was put in charge of his own sheep, the two shepherds spent their days apart. The old Gerard grazed his flock to the east as far as Chantry, but the young Gerard grazed his flock to the west as far as Amberley, whose lovely dome was dearer to him than all the other hills of Sussex. And here he would sit all day, watching the cloud shadows stalk over the face of the downs, or slipping along the land below him, with the sun running swiftly after, like a carpet of light unrolling itself upon a dusky floor. And in the evening he watched the smoke going up from the tiny cottages till it was almost dark, and a hundred tiny lights were lit in a hundred tiny windows. Sometimes on his rare holidays, and on other days too, he ran away to the wild brooks to watch the herons, or to find in the water meadows the tallest king cups in the whole world, and the myriad treasures of the river, the giant comfrey, purple and white, meadowsweet, St. John's wort, purple loosestrife, willow herb, and the ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-five others, or whatever number else you please, that go to make a myriad. He came to know more about the ways of the wild brooks than any other lad of those parts, and one day he rediscovered the lost causeway that can be travelled even in the floods, when the land lies under a lake at the foot of the hills. He kept this, like many other things, a secret. But he had one more precious still. For as he lay and watched the play of sun and shadow on the plains, he fancied a world of strange places he had known, somewhere beyond the veils of light and mist that hung between his vision and the distance, and he fell into a frequent dream of tunes and laughter and sunlit boughs in blossom and dancing under the boughs, or of fires burning in the open night and a wilder singing and dancing in the starlight. And often when his body was lying on the round hill or by the smoky hearth, his thoughts were running with lithe boys as strong and careless as he was, or playing with lovely free-limbed girls with flowing hair. Sometimes these people were fair and bright-haired, and in light and lovely clothing, and at others they were dark, with eyes of mischief, and clad in the gayest rags. And sometimes they came to him in a mingled company, made one by their careless hearts. One evening in April, on the twelfth anniversary, when young Gerard came to gather his flock, a lamb was missing. So to escape a scolding, he waited a while on the hills, till old Gerard should be gone about his business. What this was, young Gerard did not know. He only knew that each year on this night the old shepherd left him to his own devices, and returned in the small hours of the morning. Not, therefore, until he judged that his master must have left the hut, 
did the boy fold his sheep. And this done, he ran out on the hills again, seeking the lost lamb. For careless though he was, he cared for his sheep, as he did for all things that ran on legs or flew on wings. So he went swinging his lantern under the stars, singing and whistling, and smelling the spring. Now and then he paused and bleated like a ewe, and presently a small whimper answered his signal. "'My lost lamb crying on the hills,' said young Gerard. He called again, but at the sound of his voice the others stopped, and for a moment he stood quite still, listening and perplexed. "'Where are you, my lamb?' said he. "'Here,' said a little frightened voice behind a bush. He laughed aloud and went forward, and soon discovered a tiny girl cowering under a thorn. When she saw him, she ran quickly and grasped his sleeve, and hid her face in it and wept. She was small for her years, which were not more than eight. Young Gerard, who was big for his, picked her up and looked at her kindly and curiously. "'What is it, you little thing?' said he. "'I got lost,' said the child shyly through her tears. "'Well, now you're found,' said young Gerard. "'So don't cry any more.' "'Yes, but I'm hungry,' sobbed the child. "'Then come with me, will you?' "'Where to?' "'To a feast in a palace.' "'Oh, yes!' she said. Young Gerard set her on his shoulder, and went back the way he had come, till the dark shape of his wretched shed stood big between them and the sky. "'Is this your palace?' said the child. "'That's it,' said young Gerard. "'I didn't know palaces had cracks in the walls,' said she. "'This one has,' explained young Gerard, because it's so old. And she was satisfied. Then she asked, "'What is that funny tree by the door?' "'It's a cherry tree.' "'My father's cherry trees have flowers on them,' said she. "'This one hasn't,' said young Gerard, "'because it's not old enough.' "'One day will it be?' she asked. "'One day,' he said, and that contented her. He then carried her into the shed, and she looked around eagerly to see what a palace might be like inside and it was full of flickering lights and shadows and the scent of burning wood. And she did not see how poor and dirty the room was, for the firelight gleamed upon a mass of golden fruit and silver bloom embroidered on the covering of the settle by the hearth, and sparkled against a silver and crystal lantern hanging in the chimney. And between the cracks on the walls young Gerard had stuck wands of gold and silver palm and branches of snowy blackthorn, and on the floor was a dish full of celandine and daisies, and a broken jar of small wild daffodils. And the child knew that all these things were the treasures of queens and kings. "'Why don't you have that?' she asked, pointing to the crystal lantern as young Gerard set down his horn one. "'Because I can't light it,' said he. "'Let me light it!' she begged. So he fetched it from its nail and thrust a pine twig in the fire, and gave her the sweet smoking torch. But in vain she tried to light the wick, which always spluttered and went out again. So seeing her disappointment, young Gerard hung the lantern up, saying, Firelight is prettier. And he set her by the fire, and filled her lap with cones and dry leaves, and dead bracken to burn and make crackle and turn into fiery ferns and she was pleased. Then he looked about, and found his own wooden cup, and went away and came back with the cup full of milk, sat on a platter heaped with primroses. And when he brought it to her, she looked at it with shining eyes, and asked, Is this the feast? That's it, said young Gerard. And she drank it eagerly. And while she drank, young Gerard fetched a pipe, and began to whistle tunes on it as mad as any thrush, and the child began to laugh, and jumped up spilling her leaves and primroses, and danced between the fitful lights and shadows as though she were, 
now a shadow taken shape, and now a flame. Whenever he paused, she cried, Oh, let me dance, don't stop, let me go on dancing! Until, at the same moment, she dropped panting on the hearth, and he flung his pipe behind him, and fell on his back with his heels in the air, crying, Poof! Do you think I've the four quarters of heaven in my lungs, or what? But, as though to prove he had yet a capful of wind under his ribs, he suddenly began to sing a song she'd never heard before, and it went like this. I looked before me and behind, I looked beyond the sun and wind, beyond the rainbow and the snow, and saw a land I used to know. The floods rolled up to keep me still a captive on my heavenly hill, and on their bright and dangerous glass was written, Boy, you shall not pass. I laughed aloud, you shining seas, I'll run away the day I please. I am not winged like any plover, yet I've a way shall take me over. I am not finned like any bream, yet I can cross you lake and stream. And I my hidden land shall find that lies beyond the sun and wind, past drowned grass and drowning trees. I'll run away the day I please. I'll run like one whom nothing harms, with my bonny in my arms. What does that mean? asked the child. I'm sure I don't know, said young Gerard. He kicked at the dying log on the hearth, and sent a fountain of sparks up the chimney. The child threw a dry leaf and saw it shrivel, and young Gerard stirred the white ash and blew up the embers, and held a fan of bracken to them, till the fire ran up its veins like life in the veins of a man, and the frond that had already lived and died became a gleaming spirit, and then it too fell in ashes among the ash. Then young Gerard took a handful of twigs and branches, and began to build upon the ash a castle of many sorts of wood, and the child helped him, laying hazel on his beech and fir upon his oak. And often before their turret was quite reared, a spark would catch at the dry fringes on the fir, or the brown oak leaves, and one twig or another would vanish from the castle. "'How quickly wood burns!' said the child. That's the lovely part of it, said young Gerard. The fire is always changing and doing different things with it. And they watched the fire together, and smelled its smoke, that had as many smells as there were sorts of wood. Sometimes it was like roast coffee, and sometimes like roast chestnuts, and sometimes like incense. And they saw the lichen on old stumps crinkle into golden ferns, or fire run up a dead tail of creeper in a red S, and vanish in mid-air like an Indian boy climbing a rope, or crawl right through the middle of a birch twig, making hieroglyphics that glowed and faded between the grey scales of the bark. And then suddenly it caught the whole scaffolding of their castle, and blazed up through the fir and oak and spiny thorns and dead leaves, and the bits of old bark all over blue-grey-green rot, and the young sprigs almost budding and hissing with sap. And for one moment they saw all the skeleton and soul of the castle without its body before it fell in. The child sighed a little and yawned a little and said, How nice it is to live in a palace. Who lives here with you? My friends, said young Gerard, poking at the log with a bit of stick. What are your friends like? she asked him, rubbing her knuckles in her eyes. He was silent for a little, stirring up sparks and smoke. Then he answered, They are gay in their hearts, and they're dressed in bright clothes, and they come with singing and dancing. Who else lives in your palace with you? she asked drowsily. You do, said young Gerard. The child's head drooped against his shoulder, and she said, My name's Dorothea, but my father calls me Thea, and he is the lord of Coombe Ivy. And she fell fast asleep. For a little while young Gerard held and watched her in the firelight, and then he rose and wrapped her in the old embroidered mantle on the saddle, and went out. And surefoot as a goat he carried her over the dark hills by the tracks he knew, 
for roads there were none, and his arms ached with his burden, but he would not wake her till they stood at her father's gates. Then he shook her gently and set her down, and she clung to him a little dazed, trying to remember. "'This is Coomb Ivy,' he whispered. "'You must go in alone. Will you come again?' "'One day,' said Thea. "'One day there'll be flowers on my cherry tree,' said young Gerard. "'Don't forget.' "'No, I won't,' she said. He returned through the night, up hill and down dale, but did not go back to the shed until he had recovered his lamb. By then it was almost dawn, and he found his master awake and cursing. He had feared the boy had made off, and he had had curt treatment at Coom Ivy, which was in a stir about the loss of the little daughter. Young Gerard showed the lamb as his excuse. Nevertheless, the old shepherd leathered the young one soundly, as he did six days and seven. After this, when young Gerard sat dreaming on the hills, he dreamed not only of his happy land and laughing friends, but of the next coming of little Thea. But Coom Ivy was far away, and the months passed and the years, and she did not come again. Meanwhile, young Gerard and his tree grew apace, and the limbs of the boy became longer and stronger, and the branches of the tree spread up to the roof, and even began to thrust their way through the holes in the wall. But the boy's life, save for his dreaming, was as friendless as the tree's was flowerless. And of a tree's dreaming, who shall speak? Meanwhile, old Gerard thrashed and raided him, and reckoned his gold pieces, and counted the years that still lay between him and his freedom. At last came another April, bringing its hour. For as he sat on the mount in the early morning, when he was in his seventeenth year, young Gerard saw a slender girl, running over the turf and laughing in the sunlight, sometimes stopping to watch a bird flying, or stooping to pluck one of the tiny down flowers at her feet. So she came with a dancing step to the top of the mount, and then she saw him, and her glee left her, and shyness took its place. But a little pride in her prevented her from turning away, and she still came forward until she stood beside him and said, "'Good morning, shepherd. Is it true that in April the country north of the hills is filled with lakes?' "'Yes, sometimes, Mistress Thea,' said young Gerard. She looked at him with surprise, and said, "'You must be one of my father's shepherds, but I do not remember seeing you at Coombe Ivy.' "'I was only once near Coombe Ivy,' said young Gerard, "'when I took you there five years ago, the night you were lost on these hills.' "'Oh, I remember,' she said with a faint smile. "'How they did scold me. Is your cherry tree in flower yet, shepherd?' "'No, mistress,' said young Gerard. "'I want to see it,' she said suddenly. Young Gerard left his flock to the dog, and walked with her along the hill-brow. "'I have run away,' she told him as they went. "'I had to get up very early while they were asleep. I shall be scolded again. But travellers come who talk of the lakes, and I wanted to see them and to swim in them.' "'I wouldn't do that,' said young Gerard, hiding a smile. "'It's dangerous to swim in the April floods, and it would be rather cold.' "'What lies beyond?' she asked. "'I'm not able to know,' said young Gerard. "'Some day I mean to know, shepherd.' "'Yes, mistress,' he said. "'You'll be free to.' She looked at him quickly, and reddened a little. It might have been from shame or pity. Young Gerard did not know which. And her shyness once more enveloped her. It always came over her unexpectedly, taking her breath away like a breaking wave. So she said no more, and they walked together, she looking at the ground, he at the soft brown hair blowing over the curve of her young cheek. She was fine and delicate in every line, and in her color, and in the touch of her too, young Gerard knew. He wanted to touch her cheek with his finger, as he would have touched the petal of a flower. Her neck, the back of it especially, was one of the loveliest bits of her, like a primrose stalk. He fell a step behind, so that he could look at it. 
they did not speak as they went. He did not want to, and she did not know what to say. When they reached the shed, she lingered a moment by the tree, tracing a bare branch with her finger, and he waited, content till she should speak or act, to watch her. At last she said with her faint smile, I am very thirsty. Then he went into the shed, and came out with his wooden cup filled with milk. She drank and said, Thank you, shepherd. How pretty the violets are in your copse. Would you like some? he asked. Not now, she said. Perhaps another day. I must go now. She gave him back his cup and went away, slowly at first, but when she was at some distance, he saw her begin to run like a fawn. End of Part 1 of Young Gerard Section 8 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Fargen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Young Gerard continued. She did not come again that spring, and so the stark lives of the boy and the tree went forward for another year. But one evening in the following April, when the green was quivering on wood and hedgerow, he came to the door of the shed and saw her bending like a flower at the edge of the copse, filling her little basket and singing to herself. She looked up soon and said, "'Good evening, shepherd. How does your cherry tree?' "'As usual, Mistress Thea.' "'So I see. What a lazy tree it is. Have you some milk for me?' He brought her his cup, and she drank of it for the third time, and left him before he had had time to realize that she had come and gone, but only how greatly her delicate beauty had increased in the last year. However, before the summer was over she came again. To swim in the river, she told him, as she passed him on the hills without lingering. And in the autumn she came to gather blackberries, and he showed her the best place to find them. Any of these things she might have done as easily nearer Coombe Ivy, but it seemed she must always offer him some reason for her small truancies, whether to gather berries or flowers, or to swim in the river. He knew that her chief delight lay in escaping from her father's manor. Winter closed her visits, but young Gerard was as patient as the earth, and did not begin to look for her till April. As surely as it brought leaves to the trees and flowers to the grass, it would, he knew, bring his little mistress's question, half shy, half smiling, Is your cherry tree in blossom, shepherd? And later her request, smiling and shy, for milk. They seldom exchanged more than a few words at any time. Sometimes they did not speak at all, for he, who was her father's servant, never spoke first and she, growing in years and loveliness, grew also in timidity, so that it seemed to cost her more and more to address her greeting or her question even to her father's servant. The sweet, quick reddening of her cheek was one of young Gerard's chief remembrances of her. But after a while, when they met by those sly chances which she could control and he could not, and when she did not speak but glanced and hesitated and passed on, or glanced and passed without hesitation, or passed without a glance, he came to know that she would not mind if he arose and walked with her, if he could control the pretext which she could not. And he did so quietly, having always something to show her. He showed her his most secret nests and his greatest treasures of flowers, his because he loved them so much. He would have been jealous of showing these things to any one but her. In a great water meadow in the valley, he had once shown her king cups making sheets of gold, enameled with every green grass ever seen in spring. Thousands of king cups, and a myriad of milkmaids in between, dancing attendants in all their faint shades of silver white and rosy mauve. When a breeze blew, this world of milkmaids swayed and curtsied above the king's daughters in their glory. Then Gerard and Thea looked at each other smiling 
because the same delight was in each. And soon she looked away again at the gentle maids and the royal ladies, but he looked still at her, who was both to him. In silence he showed her what he loved. But you must not suppose that she came frequently to those hills. She was to be seen no more often than you will see a kingfisher when you watch for it under a willow. Yet, because in the season of kingfishers, you know you may see one flash at any instant, so to young Gerard each day of spring and summer was an expectancy, and this it was that kept his life alight. This, and his young troop of friends, in a land of fruit and blossom, and a sky and stars. For men, dear maids, live by the daily bread of their dreams. On realizations they would starve. At last came the winter that preceded young Gerard's twenty-first year. With the stripping of the boughs, he stripped his heart of all thoughts of seeing her again till the green of the coming year. The snows came, and he tended his sheep and counted his memories. And old Gerard tended his sheep and counted his coins. The count was full now, and he dreamed of April and the freeing of his body. Young Gerard also dreamed of April and the freeing of his heart. And under the ice that bound the flooded meadows, doubtless the earth dreamed of the freeing of her waters and the blooming of the land. The snows and the frosts lasted late that year, as though the winter would never be done, and to the two Gerards the days crawled like snails. But in time March blew himself off the face of the earth, and April dawned, and the swollen river went rushing to the sea above the banks it had drowned with its wild overflow. And as old Gerard began to mark the days off on a tally, young Gerard began to listen on the hills. When the day came whose midnight was to make the old man a freedman, Thea had not appeared. On the morning of this day, as the two shepherds stood outside their shed before they separated with their flocks, their ears were accosted with shoutings and halloos on the other side of the copse, and soon they saw coming through the trees a man in gay attire. He had a scalloped jerkin of orange leather, and his shoes and cap were of the same, but his sleeves and hose and feather were of a vivid green like nothing in nature. He looked garish in the sun. Seeing the shepherds, he took off his cap, and solemnly thanked heaven for having, after all, created something besides hills and valleys. For, said he, after being lost among them I know not how many hours, with no other company than my own shadow, I had begun to doubt whether I was not the only man on earth, and my name Adam. A curse on all lords who do not live by high roads. Where are you bound for, master? asked old Gerard. Coom Ivy, said the stranger, and the wedding. Old Gerard nodded as one little surprised. But to young Gerard, this mention of a wedding at Coombe Ivy came as news. It did not stir him much, however, for he was not curious about the doings of the master and the house he never saw. All that concerned him was that to-day, at least, he must cease to listen on the hills, since his young mistress would be at the wedding with the others. Old Gerard said to the stranger, Keep the straight track to the south till you come under Wepham then follow the valley to the east, and so you'll be in time for the feasting master. That's certain, said the stranger, for the lord of Coom Ivy and the rough master of coats have had no peers at junketing since Gay Street lost its lord, and the feast is like to go on till midnight. With that he went on his way, and old Gerard followed him with his eyes, muttering, Would I also were there? But for you, he said, turning on the young man with a sudden snarl, I should be. Had ye not come a day too late, I'd be a freed man to-night instead of to-morrow, and junketing at the wedding with the rest. Young Gerard did not understand him. He was not in the habit of questioning the old man, and if he had would not have expected answers. But certain words of the stranger had pricked his attention, and now he said, Where is Gay Street? Far away over the store and the chill, growled old Gerard. It's a jolly name. Maybe, but they say it's a sorry place now that it lacks its lord. What became of him? 
how should I know? What can a man know who lives all his life on a hill with peewits for gossips? You know more than I, said young Gerard indolently. You know there's a wedding down yonder. Who's the rough master of coats? The bridegroom, young know-nothing. You've a tongue in your head today. Why do they call him the rough master? Because that's what he is, and so are his people. As rough as furs on a common, they say. Have you any more questions? Yes, said young Gerard. Who is the bride? Who should the bride be? Coom Ivy's mother? She's dead, said young Gerard. His daughter, then, scoffed old Gerard. Young Gerard stared at him. Get about your business, shouted the old shepherd with sudden wrath. Why do ye stare so? You're not drunk. Ha! Down yonder they'll be getting drunk without me. Enough of your idling and staring. He raised his staff, but young Gerard thrust it aside so violently that he staggered, and the boy went away to his sheep, and they met no more till evening. The whole of that day young Gerard sat on the mount, not looking as usual to the busy north, dreaming of the unknown land beyond the water, but over the silent slopes and valleys of the south, whose people were only birds and foxes and rabbits, and whose only cities were built of lights and shadows. Somewhere beyond them was Coom Ivy, and little Thea getting married to the rough master of coats, in the midst of feasting and singing and dancing. He thought of her dancing over the downs for joy of being free. He thought of her singing to herself as she gathered flowers in his copse, and he thought of her feasting on wild berries he had helped her to find. That also was a feasting and singing and dancing. All day long his thoughts ran. She will not come any more in the mornings to bathe in the river over the hill. She will not come with her little basket to gather flowers and berries. She will not stop and ask for a cup of milk, or say, Let me see the young lambs, or say, Is your cherry tree in flower yet, shepherd? She will not ask me with her eyes to come with her. Oh, she will not ask me by turning her eyes away, with her little head bent. You, you rough master of coats, what are you like? What are you like? In the evening, when he gathered his sheep, one was missing. He had to take the flock back without it. Old Gerard was furious with him. It seemed as though on this last night that separated him from the long fulfillment of his hopes, he must be more furious than he had ever been before. He was furious at being thwarted of the fun in the valley, furious at the loss of the lamb, most furious at young Gerard's indifference to his fury. He told the boy he must search on the hills, and young Gerard only sat down by the side of the shed and looked to the south and made no answer. So he went himself, leaving the boy to prepare the mess for supper, for he feared that if he went to Coom Ivy that night with a bad tale to tell, his master for a whim might say that a young sheep was a fair deal for an old shepherd, and take his gold and keep him a bondman still. For the lord of Coom Ivy lived by his whimsies. But old Gerard could not find the lost sheep, and when he came back the boy was where he had left him, looking over the darkening hills. "'Is the mess ready?' said old Gerard. "'No,' said young Gerard. "'Why not?' "'Because I forgot.' Old Gerard slashed at him with a rope he had taken in case of need. "'That will make you remember.' "'No,' said young Gerard. "'Why not?' Young Gerard said, "'You beat me too often. I cannot remember all the reasons.' Then, said old Gerard, full of wrath, I will beat you out of all reason. And he began to thrash young Gerard with all his might, talking between the blows. Haven't you been the curse of my life for twenty-one years, snarled he. Can I trust you? Can I leave you? Would the sheep get their straw? Would the lambs be brought alive into the world? Bah! For all you care, the sheep would go cold and their young would die, and down yonder they are getting drunk without me. Old Shepherd, said a voice behind him. The angry man, panting with his rage and the exertion of his blows, paused and turned. 
Near the corner of the shed he saw a woman in a duffel cloak, standing, or rather stooping, on her crutch. She was so ancient that it seemed as though Death himself must have forgotten her, but her eyes in their wrinkled sockets were as piercing as thorns. Old Gerard, staring at them, felt as though his own eyes were pricked. "'Where have I seen you before, Hag?' he said. "'Have you ever seen me before?' asked the old woman. "'I thought so, I thought so.' He fumbled with his memory. "'Then it must have been when we were courting in April, nine and ninety years ago,' said the old woman dryly. "'But you lads remember me better than I do you. Can I sleep by your hearth to-night?' "'Where are you going to?' asked old Gerard, half grinning, half sour. "'Where I'll be welcome,' said she. "'You're not welcome here, but there's nothing to steal. You may sleep by the hearth.' "'Thank you, shepherd said the crone, for your courtesy. Why were you beating the boy? Because he's one that won't work. Is he your slave? He's my master's slave, but he's idle. I am not idle, said young Gerard. The year round I'm busy long before dawn and long after dark. Then why are you idle today? sneered old Gerard, of all the days in the year. I've something else to think of, said the boy. "'You see,' said the old man to the crone. "'Well,' said she, "'a boy cannot always be working. "'A boy will sometimes be dreaming. "'Life isn't all labor, shepherd.' "'What else is it?' said old Gerard. "'Joy.' "'Ho, ho, ho,' went old Gerard. "'And power. "'Ho, ho, ho.' "'And triumph.' "'Not for serfs,' said old Gerard. "'For serfs and lords,' she said. "'Ho, ho, ho!' "'You were young once,' said the crone. "'Old Gerard said, "'What if I was?' "'Good night,' said the crone, "'and she went into the shed. "'The shepherds looked after her, "'the old one stupidly, "'the young one with lighted eyes. "'Will you get supper?' growled old Gerard. "'No,' said young Gerard. I won't. I want no supper. Put down that rope. I am taller and stronger than you, and why I've let you go on beating me so long I don't know, unless it is that you began to beat me when you were taller and stronger than I. If you want any supper, get it yourself. Old Gerard turned red and purple. The boy's mad, he gasped. Do you know what happens to servants who defy their masters? Yes, said young Gerard. Then their lords, and he too went into the shed. Try that on Coom Ivy, bawled old Gerard, and see what you'll get for it. I thank fortune I'll be quit of you tomorrow. What's that to do in the valley? he muttered, and stared down the hill. Away in the hollows and shadows he saw splashes of moving light, and heard far off snatches of song and laughter but the movements and sounds were still so distant that they seemed to be only those of ghosts and echoes. Nearer they came and nearer, and now in the night he could discern a great rabble stumbling along the dips and rises of the hills. "'They're heading this way,' said old Gerard. "'Why, tis the wedding party,' he said amazed, "'if it's not witchcraft. But why are they coming here?' "'Hola, hola, hola!' shouted a tipsy voice hard by. "'Here's dribblings from the wine-skin,' said old Gerard. And up the track struggled a drunken man, waving a torch above his head. It was the guest whom he had directed in the morning. "'Hola!' he shouted again on seeing old Gerard. "'Well, racketer,' said the shepherd with a chuckle. "'Shall a man not racket at another man's wedding?' he cried. Let someone be jolly, say I. The bridegroom, said old Gerard. Ha, ha, laughed the other, the bridegroom. He was first in high feather and last in the sulks. The bride, then. Ha, 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 ha. During the toasts he tried to kiss her. Wouldn't she? She wouldn't. Hark, said old Gerard, here they come. The sound of rollicking increased as the rout drew nearer. 
He's taking her home across the river, said the guest. I wouldn't be she. There she sat, her pretty face fixed and frozen, but a fright in her that shook her whole body. You can see it shake. And we drank, how we drank, to the bride and the groom and their daughters and sons, to the sire and the priest and the ring and the bed, to the kiss and the quarrel, to love which is one thing and marriage which is another. Lord, how we drank! But she drank nothing, and for all her terror the rough could do no more with her than with a stone. Something in her turned him cold every time. Suddenly up he gets. We'll have no more of this, he says. We'll go. Coom Ivy would have had them stay, but she's where she's used to lord it here, says Ruff. I'll take her where I lord it, and teach her who's master. And he pushes down his chair, and takes her hand and pulls her away, and out we tumble after him. Coom Ivy cries to him to wait for the horses, but no. We'll foot it, says he, up hill and down dale as the crow flies, and if she hates me now without a cause, I swear she'll love me with one at the end of the dance. We're dancing them as far as the wild brooks. On to other side they may dance for themselves. Here they come dancing. Dance you, cried the guest, and whirled his torch like a madman. And as he whirled and staggered, up the hill came the wedding party, as tipsy as he was. A motley procession, waving torches and garlands, wine cups, flagons, colored napkins, shouting and singing and beating on trenchers and savers, on anything that they could snatch from the table as they quitted it. They came in all their bravery, in doublets of flame-colored silk and blue, in scarlet leather and green velvet, in purple slashed with silver and crimson fringed with bronze. But their vests were unlaced, their hose sagged, and silk and velvet and leather were stained bright or dark with wine. Some had stuck leaves and flowers in their hair, Others had tied their forelocks with ribbons like horses on a holiday, and one had torn his yellow mantle in two, and capered in advance, waving the halves in either hand like monstrous banners, or the flapping wings of some golden bird of prey. In the midst of them, pressing forward and pressed on by the riot behind, was the rough master of coats, and with him, always hanging a little away and shrinking under her veil, Thea whose right wrist he grasped in his left hand. Breathless she was among the breathless rabble, who, gaining the hilltop, seized each other suddenly, and broke into antics, shaking their napkins and rattling on their plates. Their voices were hoarse with laughter and drink, and their faces flushed with it. Only among those red and swollen faces, the bridegrooms in the flare of the torches looked as black as the brides looked white, the night about the newly wedded pair was one great din and flutter. Then in a trice the dancers all lost breath, and the dance parted as they staggered aside. And at the door of the shed young Gerard stood, and gazed through the broken revel at little Thea, and she stood gazing at him. And behind and above him, along the walls of the hut and over the doorway, and making lovely the very roof, she saw a cloud of snow-white blossom. Somebody cried, Here's a boy! He shall dance too! Boy, is there drink within? The others took up the clamor. Drink! Bring us something to drink! The red grape! cried one. The yellow grape! cried another. The sap of the apple! The juice of the pear! Nut-brown ale! The spirit that burns! Bring us a drink! they cried in a breath. "'Will you have milk?' said young Gerard. At this the company burst into a roar of laughter. They laughed till they rocked. But when they were silent, little Thea spoke. She said in a faint, clear voice, "'I would like a cup of milk.' Young Gerard went into the hut, and came out with his wooden cup filled with milk, and brought it to her, and she drank. None spoke or moved while she drank, but when she gave him the cup again, one of the crew said chuckling, Now she is drunk, now she's merrier. Try her again, rough, try her on milk. Again the night reeled with their laughter. They surrounded the wedded pair, crying, Kiss her, kiss her, kiss her. 
Then the rough master of coats pulled her round to him, dark with anger, and tried to kiss her. But she turned sharply in his arms, bending her head away. And despite his force, and though he was a man and she little more than a child, he could not make her mouth meet his. And the laughter of the guests rose higher and infuriated him. Then he who had spoken before said, By Hymen, the bride should kiss something. If the Lord's not good enough, let her kiss the churl. At this, the revellers, wild with delight, beat on their trenchers and shouted, I let her! And suddenly they surged in, parting Thea from the rough. While some pulled him back, others dragged young Gerard forward, till he stood where the bridegroom had stood. And in that seething throng of mockery, he felt her clinging helplessly to him, and his arm went round her. "'Kiss him! Kiss him! Kiss him!' cried the guests. She looked up pitifully at him, and he bent his head, and she heard him whisper, "'My cherry tree's in flower.' She whispered, "'Yes.' and they kissed each other. Then the tumult of laughter passed all bounds, so that it was a wonder if it was not heard at Coom Ivy. And the guests clashed their trenchers one against another, and whirled their torches till the sparks flew, yelling, The bride's kiss! Ha ha! The bride's kiss! But the rough master of coats had had enough, Snarling like a mad dog, he thrust his way through the crowd on one side, as old Gerard, seeing his purpose, thrust through on the other, and both at the same instant fell on the boy, the one with his scabbard, the other with his staff. "'Kisses, will ye?' cried the rough master of coats. "'Here's kisses for ye!' "'Ha, ha!' cried the guests. "'More kisses! More kisses for him that kissed the bride!' And then they all struck him at once, kicking and beating him without mercy, till he lay prone on the earth. When he had fallen, the rough shouted, Away to the wild brooks, away! And he seized Thea in his arms, and rushed along the brow of the hill, and all the company followed in a confusion, and were swallowed up in the night. But young Gerard raised himself a little, and groaned, The wild brooks? Are they going to the wild brooks? Ay, and over the wild brooks, said old Gerard. But they're in flood, gasped young Gerard. They'll never cross it in the spring floods. They'll manage it somehow. The rough, did you see his eyes when you... Ho, ho, he'll cross it somehow. He can't, the boy muttered. The April tide's too strong. He will drown in the flood. And she, said old Gerard. Perhaps she will swim on the flood, said young Gerard faintly. And he sighed and sank back to the earth. Hi, you'll be sore, chuckled the old man. You had your salve before you had your drubbing. Lie there, I must be gone on business. He took up his staff and went down the hill for the last time to Coombe Ivy to purchase his freedom. But young Gerard lay with his face pressed to the turf. And that was the bridegroom, he said, and shook where he lay. End of Part 2 of Young Gerard Section 9 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman Young Gerard Continued Young shepherd, said a voice beside him. He looked up and saw the hooded crone come out of the hut. Why do you water the earth? said she. Have not the rains done their work? What work, dame? You've as fine a cherry in flower, said she, as ever blossomed in Gay Street in the season of singing and dancing. Singing and dancing, he cried, his voice choking and he sprang up despite his pains. Don't speak to me, dame, of singing and dancing. You're old like the withered branch of a tree, but did you not see with your old eyes and hear with your old ears? Did you not see her come up the green hillside with singing and dancing? Oh, yes, my cherries in flower, like a crown for a bride. 
and the spring is all in movement, and the birds are all in song, and she, she came up the hillside with singing and dancing. I saw, said the crone, and I heard. I am not so old, young shepherd, that I do not remember the curse of youth. What's that? he said moodily. To bear the soul of a master in the body of a slave, said she, to be a flower in a sealed bud, the moon in a cloud, water locked in ice, spring in the womb of the year, love that does not know itself. But when it does know, said young Gerard slowly, oh, when it knows, said she, then the flower of the fruit will leap through the bud, and the moon will leap like a lamb on the hills of the sky, and April will leap in the veins of the year, and the river will leap with the fury of spring, and the headlong heart will cry in the body of youth, I will not be a slave, but I will be the lord of life, because... Because, said young Gerard, because I will. Young Gerard said nothing, and they sat together in a long silence in the darkness, and time went by, filling the sky with stars. Now as they sat, the hilltop once more began to waver with shadows and voices. But this time the shadows came on heavy feet and weary, and the voices were forlorn. One feebly cried, Hola! And round the belt of trees straggled the rout that had left them an hour or so earlier. But now they were sodden and dejected, draggled and woebegone, as sorry a spectacle as so many drowned rats. Fire! moaned one. Fire! Fire! Who's burning? said young Gerard, and got quickly on his feet. But he did not see the two he looked for. None's burning, fool, but many are drowning. Do we not look like drowned men? How shall we ever get back to Coombe Ivy, and warmth, and drink, and comforts? Would we were burning! What has happened? the boy demanded. We went in search of the fairy, he said, but the fairy was drowned too. We couldn't find the fairy, said a second. No, mumbled a third, the river had drunk it up. Where there were paths there were brooks, and where there were meadows, lakes. The miserable crew broke out into plaints and questions. Have you no fire? Have you no food? No coverings? None, said young Gerard. Where is the bride? Have you no drink? Where is the bride? The groom stumbled, said one. Let us to Coombe Ivy in comfort's name. There'll be drink there. He staggered down the hill, and his fellows made after him. But young Gerard sprang upon one, and gripped him by the shoulder, and shook him, and for the third time cried, Where is the bride? In the water, he answered heavily, because there was no wine. Then he dragged himself out of the boy's grasp, and fell down the hill after his companions. Young Gerard stood for one instant listening and holding his breath. Suddenly he said, My lost lamb crying on the hills. He ran into the shed and looked about, and snatched from the settle the green and cherry cloak, and from the wall the crystal and silver lantern. He struck a spark from a flint and lit the wick. It burned brightly and steadily. Then he ran out of the shed. The old woman rose up in his path. That's a good light, said she, and a warm cloak. Don't stop me, said young Gerard, and ran on. She nodded, and as he vanished in one direction, she vanished in the other. He had not run far when he saw one more shadow on the hills, and it came with faltering steps and a trembling, sobbing breath, and he held up his lantern, and the light fell on Thea, shivering in her wet veil. As the flame struck her eyes, she sighed, Oh, I can't see the way, I can't see. Young Gerard hurried to her and said, Come this way, and he took her hand, but she snatched it quickly from him. Go, man, she said, don't touch me, go. Don't be frightened of me, said young Gerard gently. Then she looked at him and whispered, Oh, it is you, shepherd. I was trying to find you. I'm cold. Young Gerard wrapped the cloak about her and said, 
Come with me. I'll make you a fire. He took her back to the shed, but she did not go in. She crouched on the ground under the cherry tree. Young Gerard moved about collecting brushwood. They scarcely looked at each other, but once, when he passed her, he said, You're shivering. It's because I'm so wet, said Thea. Did you fall in the water? She nodded. The floods were so strong. It's a bad night for swimming, said young Gerard. Yes, shepherd. She then said again, Yes. He could tell by her voice that she was smiling faintly. He glanced at her and saw her looking at him. Both smiled a little and glanced away again. He began to pile his brushwood for the fire. After a short pause, she said timidly, Are you sore, shepherd? No, I feel nothing, said he. They beat you very hard. I did not feel their blows. How could you not feel them? she said in a low voice. He looked at her again, and again their eyes met, and again parted quickly. Now I'll strike a spark, said young Gerard, and you'll be warm soon. He kindled his fire. The branches crackled and burned, and she knelt beside the blaze and held her hands to it. I was never here by night before, she said. Yes, once, said young Gerard. You often came, didn't you, to gather flowers in the morning and to swim in the river at noon? But once before you were here in the night. Was I? said she. He dropped a handful of cones into her lap, throwing the last on the fire. She threw another after it, and smiled as it crackled. I remember, she said. Thank you, shepherd. You were always kind, and found me the things I wanted, and gave me your cup to drink of. Who will drink of it now? No one, he said, ever again. He went and fetched the cup and gave it to her. Burn that too, said young Gerard. Thea put it into the fire and trembled. When it was burned, she asked very low, Will you be lonely? I'll have my sheep and my thoughts. Yes, said Thea, and stars when the sheep are folded. The stars are good to be with too. Good to see and not be seen by, he said. How do you know they don't see you? she asked shyly. One shepherd on a hill isn't much for the eye of a star. He may watch them unwatched, while they come and go in their months. Sometimes there aren't any, and sometimes not more than one pricking the sky near the moon. But tonight, look, the sky's like a tree with full branches. Thea looked up and said with a child's laugh, Break me a branch. I'd want Jacob's ladder for that, smiled young Gerard. Then shake the tree and bring them down, she insisted. Here come your stars, said young Gerard. Suddenly she was enveloped in a falling shower, white and heavenly. The stars, she cried. Oh, what is it? My cherry tree, it's in flower, said young Gerard, and his voice trembled. She looked up quickly and saw that he was standing beside her, shaking the tree above her head and now their eyes met and did not separate. He put out his hand and broke a branch from the tree and offered it to her. She took it from him slowly, as though she were in a dream, and laid it in her lap and put her face in her hands and began to cry. Young Gerard whispered, Why are you crying? Thea said, Oh, my wedding, my wedding! Only last year I thought of the night of my wedding and how it would be. It was not with torchlight and shouting and wine, but moonlight and silence and the scent of wild blossoms, and now I know that it was not the night of my wedding I dreamed of. What did you dream of? asked young Gerard. The night of my first love. Thea, said young Gerard, and he knelt beside her and my love's first kiss. Oh, Thea, said young Gerard, and he took her hands. Why did you not feel their blows? she said. I felt them. 
their arms went round each other, and for the second time that night they kissed. Young Gerard said, I've always wondered if this would happen. And Thea answered, I didn't know it would be you. Didn't you? Didn't you? He whispered, stroking her head, wondering at himself, doing what he had so often dreamed of doing. Oh, she faltered, sometimes I thought it might be you, darling. Thea, Thea. When I came over the mount to swim in the river, and saw you in the distance among your sheep, there was a swifter river running through all my body. When I came every April to ask for your cherry tree, what did it matter to me that it was not in bloom? For all my heart was wild with bloom. Oh, Gerard, my lover. Oh, Thea, my love, what can I give you, Thea? I, a shepherd. You were the lord of the earth, and you gave me its flowers and its birds and its secret waters. What more could you give me, you, a shepherd and my lord? The wild white bloom of its fruit trees that comes to the branches in April like love to the heart. I'll give it you now. Sit here, sit here. I'll make you a bower of the cherry, and a crown and a carpet too. There's nothing in all April lovely and wild enough for you tonight, your bridal night, my lady and my darling. And in a great fit of joy, he broke branch after branch from the tree as she sat at its foot, and set them about her, and filled her arms to overflowing, and crowned her with blossoms, and shook the bloom under her feet, till her shy, happy face, paling and reddening by turns, looked out from a world of flowers, and she cried between laughing and weeping, Oh, Gerard, oh, you're drowning me! It's the April floods! shouted young Gerard, and I must drown with you, Thea, Thea, Thea! And he cast himself down beside her, and clasped her amid all the blossoming, and with his head on her shoulder kissed and kissed her, till he was breathless, and she as pale as the flowers that smothered their kisses. And then suddenly he folded her in the green mantle, blossoms and all, and sprang up and lifted her to his breast, till she lay like a child in the arms of its mother, and he picked up the lantern and said, Now we will go away for ever. Where are we going? she whispered with shining eyes. To the wild brooks, he said. To drown in the floods together? She closed her eyes. There's a way through all floods, said young Gerard, and he ran with her over the hills with all his speed and old Gerard returned to a hut as empty as it had been one and twenty years ago. And they say that Coom Ivy, having never set eyes on the boy in his life, swore that the shepherd's tale had been a fiction from first to last, and kept him a serf to the end of his days. "'What a night of stars it is!' said Martin Pippin, stretching his arms. "'Good heavens, Master Pippin!' cried Joyce. "'What a moment to mention it!' It is worth mentioning, said Marden, at all moments when it is so. I would not think of mentioning it in the middle of a snowstorm. You should as little think of mentioning it, said Joyce, in the middle of a story. But I am at the end of my story, Mistress Joyce. Jocelyn. Preposterous! Oh, oh, how can you say so? I am ashamed of you. Marden. Dear Mistress Jocelyn, I thank you in charity's name, for being that for me which I have never yet succeeded in being for myself. Jocelyn. What? Are you not ashamed to offer us a broken gift? Your story is like a cracked pitcher with half the milk leaked out. What was the secret of the lantern, the cloak, and the cherry tree? Joyce. Who is the lovely lady, his mother, and who the old crone? Jennifer. What was the end of the rough master of coats? Jessica, did not the lovers drown in the floods? Jane, and if they did not, what became of them? Please, said little Joan, tell us why young Gerard dreamed those dreams. Oh, please tell us what happened. Women's taste is for trifles, said Marden. I have offered you my cake, and you wish only to pick off the nuts and the cherries. No, said Joan, we wish you to put them on. Do you not love nuts and cherries on a cake? More than anything, said Marden. 
A long while ago, dear maidens, there were lords in Gay Street, and up and down the street the cherry trees bloomed in spring, as they bloomed nowhere else in Sussex, and under the trees sang and danced the loveliest lads and lasses in all England, with hearts like children. And on all their holiday clothes they worked the leaf and branch and flower and fruit of the cherry. And they never wore anything else but their holiday clothes, because in Gay Street it was always holidays. And a long while ago there were gypsies on Nightimber Common, the merriest gypsies in the Southlands, with the gayest tatters and the brightest eyes, and the maddest hearts for mirth-making. They were also makers of lanterns, when they were anything else but what all gypsies are. And once the son of a gypsy king loved the daughter of a lord of Gay Street, and she loved him. And because of this there was wrath in Gay Street, and scorn on Nightember, and all things were done to keep the lovers apart. But they who attempt this might more profitably chase wild geese. So one night in April, they were taken under one of her father's own wild cherries, by the light of one of his father's own lanterns. And it was her father and his father who found them, as they had missed them in the same moment, and were come hunting for sweethearts by night with their people behind them. Then the Lord of Gay Street pronounced a curse of banishment on his own daughter, that she must go far away beyond the country of the floods, and another on his own tree that it might never blossom more. And there and then it withered. And the gypsy king pronounced as dark a curse of banishment on his own son, and a second on his own lantern, that it might never more give light. And there and then it went out. Then from the crowd of gypsies came the oldest of them all, who was the king's great-grandmother. And she looked from the angry parents to the unhappy lovers, and said, you can blight the tree and make the lantern dark. Nevertheless, you cannot extinguish the flower and the light of love. And till these things lift the curse and are seen again united among you, there will be no lords in Gay Street nor kings on Night Ember. And she broke a shoot from the cherry, and picked up the lantern, and gave them to the lady and her lover. And then she took them, one by each hand, and went away. And the lord of Gay Street and the gypsy king died soon after without heirs, and the joy went out of the hearts of both peoples, and they dressed in sad colours for one and twenty years. But the three travelled south through the country of the floods, and on the way the king's son was drowned, as others had been before him, and after him the rough master of coats. But the crone brought the lady safely through, and how she was at once delivered of her son and her sorrow, dear maidens, you know. And for one and twenty years the crone was seen no more, and then of a sudden she reappeared at daybreak, and bade her people put on their bright apparel, because their king was coming with the young queen. And after this she led them to Gay Street, where she bade the folk to don their holiday attire, because their lord was on his way with a fair lady. And all those girls and boys, the dark and the light, felt the child of joy in their hearts again, and they went in the morning with singing and dancing to welcome the comers under the cherry trees. I entreat you now, Mistress Joyce, for the second hair from your head. End of Young Gerard Section 10 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Second Interlude The milkmaids put their forgotten apples to their mouths, and the chatter began to run out of them, like juice from bitten fruit. Jessica, what did you think of this story, Jane? Jane, I did not know what to think, Jessica, until the very conclusion, and then I was too amazed to think anything. For who would have imagined the young shepherd to be in reality a lord? Martin. Few of us are what we see, Mistress Jane. Even chimney-sweeps are Jackson Green on May Days. For the other three hundred and sixty-four days in the year they pretend to be chimney-sweeps, and I have actually known men who appeared to be haters of women, when they secretly loved them most tenderly. 
Jocelyn. It does not surprise me to hear this. I have always understood men to be composed of caprices. Martin. They are composed of nothing else. I see you know them through and through. Jocelyn. I do not know anything at all about them. We do not study what does not interest us. Martin. I hope, Mistress Jocelyn, you found my story worthy of study. Jocelyn. It served its turn. Might one, by going to Rackham Hill, see the same cherry tree and the same shed? Martin. Alas, no. The shed rotted with time and weather, and bit by bit its sides were rebuilt with stone. And the cherry tree, old Gerard chopped down in a fury and made firewood of it. But it, too, had served its turn. For as every man's life, and perhaps, but you must answer for this, every woman's life, awaits the hour of blossoming that makes it immortal, so this tree passed in a single night from sterility to immortality. And it mattered as little if its body were burned the next day, as it would have mattered had Gerard and Thea gone down through the waters that night, instead of many years later, after a lifetime of great joy and delight. Joyce. I am glad of that. There were moments when I feared it would not be so. Jennifer. I, too, for how could it be otherwise, seeing that he was a shepherd and she a lord's daughter? Jessica. And when it was related how she was to wed the rough master of coats, my hopes were dashed entirely. Jane. And when they beat young Gerard, I was perfectly certain he was dead. Joan. I rather fancied the tale would end happily all the same. Marden. I fancied so, too, for though any of these accidents would have marred the ending, love is a divinity above all accidents, and guards his own with extraordinary obstinacy. Nothing could have thwarted him of his way but one thing. Five of the milkmaids. Oh, what? Martin. Had Thea been one of those who are not interested in the study of men? Nobody said anything in the apple orchard. Jocelyn. She need not have been condemned to unhappiness on that account, Singer. And what does the happiness or unhappiness of an idle story weigh? Whether she wedded another, or whether they were parted by whatever cause, such as her superior station, or even his death, it's all one to me. Jennifer. And me. Jessica. And me. Jane, and me. Martin, the tale is judged. Let it go hang. For a cloud has dropped over nine-tenths of the moon, like the eyelid of a girl who still peeps through her lashes, but will soon fall asleep for weariness. I have made her lids as heavy as yours with my poor story. Let us all sleep and forget it. So the girls lay down in the grass and slept. But Joyce went on swinging, and every time she swayed past him she looked at Marden, and her lips opened and shut again, nothing having escaped them but a very little laughter. The tenth time this happened, Marden said, What keeps your lashes open, Mistress Joyce, when your comrades lie tangled on their cheeks? Is it the same thing that opens your lips and peeps through the doorway and runs away again? Must my lashes shut because others do? said Joyce. May not lashes have whims of their own? Nothing is more whimsical, said Martin Pippin. I have known, for instance, lashes that will be golden, though the hair of the head be dark. It is a silly trick. I don't dislike such lashes, said Joyce. That is, I think I should not if ever I saw them. Martin, perhaps you are right. I should love them in a woman. Joyce, I never saw them in a woman. Martin, in a man they would be regrettable. Joyce, then why did you give them to young Gerard? Martin, did I? It was pure carelessness. Let us change the color of his lashes. Joyce, no, no, I will not have them changed. I would not for the world. Martin, Dear Mistress Joyce, if I had the world to offer you, 
I would sit by the road and break it with a pickaxe rather than change a single eyelash in young Gerard's lids, since you love them. Joyce. Oh, did I say so? Martin. Didn't you? Mistress Joyce, when you laugh, I am ready to forgive you all your debts. Joyce. Why, what do I owe you? Martin. An eyelash. Joyce. I am sure I do not. Martin. No, then a hair of some sort. How will you be able to sleep tonight with a hair on your conscience? For your own sake, lift that crowbar. Joyce. To tell you the truth, I fear to redeem my promise, lest you are unable to redeem yours. Martin. Which was? Joyce. To blow it to its fellow, who is now wandering in the night like thistledown. Martin. I will do it nevertheless. Joyce. It is easier promised than proved, but here is the hair. Martin. Are you certain it is the same hair? Joyce. I kept it wound round my finger. Martin. I know no better way of keeping a hair, so here it goes. And he held the hair to his lips and blew on it. Martin. A blessing on it. It will soon be wedded. Joyce. I have your word for it. Martin. You shall have your eyes for it if you will tell me one thing. Joyce. Is it a little thing? Martin. It's as trifling as a hair. I wish only to know why you have fallen out with men. Joyce. For the best of reasons. Why, Master Pippin, they say the world is round. Martin. Heaven preserve us! Was ever so giddy a statement? Round? Why, the world's as full of edges as the dealings of men and women, in which you can scarcely go a day's march without reaching the end of all things and tumbling into heaven. I tell you, I have travelled the world more than any man living, and it takes me all my time to keep from falling off the brink. Round? The world is one great precipice. Joyce. I said so, I said so, I knew I was right. I should like to tell them so. Martin, were you only able to go out of the orchard, you would be free to tell them so. They are such fools, these men. Joyce, not in all matters, Master Pippin, but certainly in this. They are good at some things. Martin, for my part, I can't think what. Joyce, they whitewash cowsheds beautifully. Martin, who wouldn't? Whitewash is such beautiful stuff. No, let us be done with these round-minded men and go to bed. Good night, dear milkmaid. Joyce, ah, but singer, you have not yet proved your fable of the two hairs, which you swore were as hard to keep apart as the two lovers in your tale. Whom love guarded against accidents said Martin, and he held out to her the third finger of his left hand, and wound at its base were the two hairs, in a ring as fine as a cobweb. She took his finger between two of hers, and laughed, and examined it, and laughed again. "'You have been playing the god of love to my hairs,' said Joyce. "'Somebody must protect those that cannot, or will not, be kind to themselves,' said Martin." and then his other fingers closed quickly on her hand, and he said, Dear Mistress Joyce, help me to play the god of love to Jillian, and give me your key to the well-house, because there were moments when you feared my tale would end unhappily. She pulled her hand away, and began to swing rapidly without answering. But presently she exclaimed, Oh, oh, it has dropped! What, what? said Martin anxiously. But she only cried again, Oh, my heart, it is dropped under the swing. In love's name, said Martin, let me recover your heart. He groped in the grass and found what she had dropped, and then was obliged to fall flat on his back to escape her feet as she swung. Well, any time's a time for laughing, said Martin, crawling forth and getting on his knees. Here's the key to your heart, laughing Joyce. Oh, Martin! How can I take it with my hands on the ropes? Then I'll lay it on your lap. 
Oh, Martin, how do you expect it to stay there while I swing? Then you must stop swinging. Oh, Martin, I will never stop swinging as long as I live. Then what must I do with this key? Oh, Martin, why do you bother me so about an old key? Can't you see I'm busy? Oh, Joyce, when you laugh, I must, I must, yes, I must. And he caught her two little feet in his hands as she next flew by, and kissed each one upon the instep. Then he ran to his bed under the hedge, and she sat where she was, till her laughing turned to smiling, and her smiling to sleeping. Maids, maids, maids! It was morning. To your hiding place, Master Pippin, urged Jocelyn. It's our master come again. Martin concealed himself with speed, and an instant later the farmer's burly face peered through the gap in the hedge. Good morrow, maids. Good morrow, master. Has my daughter stopped weeping yet? No, master, said Joyce, but I begin to think that she will before long. A little longer will be too long, moaned Gilman, for my purse is running dry with these droughty times, and I shall have to mortgage the farm to buy me ale, since I am foiled of both water and milk. Who would have daughters when ye might have sons? Gillian, he cried, when will ye learn that old heads are wiser than young ones? But Gillian paid no more attention to him than to the cawing rooks and the elms in the oat-field. Take your bread, maids, said Gilman, and heaven send us grace to-morrow. Just an instant, master, said Joyce. I would like to know if Blossom my shorthorn is well. As well as a child without his mother maid, though Michael has turned nurse to her. But she seems sworn to hold back her milk till you come again. Rack and ruin, nothing but rack and ruin. And off he went. Then breakfast was prepared as on the previous day, and Gillian's stale loaf was broken for the ducks. But Jocelyn pointed out that one of the kissing crusts had been pulled off in the night. "'Your stories, Master Pippin, are doing their work,' said she. "'I begin to think so,' said Martin cheerfully. And then they fell to on their own white loaves and sweet apples. When they had breakfasted, Martin observed that he could make better and longer daisy chains than anyone else in the world, and his statement was pooh-poohed by six voices at once. For girls' fingers, said these voices, had been especially fashioned by nature for the making of daisy chains. Martin challenged them to prove this, and they plucked lapfuls of the small white daisies with big yellow eyes, and threaded chains of great length, and hung them about each other's necks and so deft and dainty was their touch that the chains never broke in the making, or what is still more delicate a matter, in the hanging. But Martin's chains always broke before he had joined the last daisy to the first, and the girls jeered at him for having no necklace to match their necklaces of pearls and gold, and for failing so contemptibly in his boast. And he appeared so abashed by their jeers that little Joan relented, and made a longer chain than any that had been made yet, and hung it round his neck, at which he was merry again, and confessed himself beaten, and the girls became very gracious, being in their triumph even more pleased with him than with themselves, which was a great deal, and by then it was dinner-time. After dinner, Martin proposed that, as they had sat all the morning, they should run all the afternoon, so they played touchwood, and Martin was he but an orchard is so full of wood that he had a hard job of it. And he observed that Jennifer had very little daring, and scarcely ever lifted her finger from the wood as she ran from one tree to another, and that Jane had no daring at all, and never even left her tree. And that Jocelyn was extremely daring when it was safe to be so, and that Jessica was daring enough to tweak him and run away, while Joyce was more daring still for she tweaked him and did not run. As for little Joan, she puzzled him most of all. For half the time she outdid them all in daring, and then she was uncatchable, slipping through his very fingers like a ray of sunlight a child tries to hold. But the other half of the time she was timidity itself, 
and crept from tree to tree, and if he were near, became like a little frightened rabbit, forgetting, or being through her fear unable, to touch safety. And then she was snared more easily than any. By supper, however, every maid had been he but Jane, for no man can catch what doesn't run. "'How the time has flown!' said Jocelyn, when they were all seated about the middle tree after the meal. "'It makes such a difference,' said Jennifer, "'when there's something to do. "'We never used to have anything to do till Master Pippin came, "'and now life is all games and stories.' "'The games,' said Jocelyn, "'are well enough.' "'Shall we,' said Martin, "'forgo the stories?' "'Oh, Master Pippin,' said Jennifer anxiously, "'we surely are to have a story to-night.' "'Unless we are to remain here forever,' said Martin, "'I fear we must. "'But for my part I am quite happy here. "'Are not you, Mistress Jocelyn?' "'Your questions are idle,' said she. "'You know very well that we cannot escape a story.' "'You see, Mistress Jennifer,' said Martin, "'let us resign ourselves, therefore. "'And for your better diversion, please sit in the swing, "'and when the story is tedious you will have a remedy at hand.' So saying, he put Jennifer on the seat, and her hands on the ropes, and the five other girls climbed into the tree, while he took the bough that had become his own, and all provided themselves with apples. Begin, said Jocelyn. A storyteller, said Marden, as much as any other craftsman, needs his instruments, of which his auditors are the chief, and of these I lack one and he fixed his eyes on the weeper in the well-house. "'You have six already,' said Jocelyn. "'The seventh you must acquire as you proceed, so begin.' "'Without the vital tool,' cried Marden. "'As well might you bid Madame Toad to spin flax without her distaff.' "'What folly is this?' said Jocelyn. "'Toads don't spin.' "'Don't they?' said Marden, much astonished. "'I thought they did.' What, then, is toad-flax? Do the wild flowers not know? And still keeping his eyes fixed on Gillian, he thrummed and sang, Toad, toad, old toad, what are you spinning? Seven hanks of yellow flax into snow-white linen. What will you do with it, then, toad, pray? Make shifts for seven brides against their wedding day. Suppose e'er one of them refuses to be wed, then she shall not see the jewel I wear in my head. As he concluded, Gillian raised herself on her two elbows, and with her chin on her palms, gazed steadily over the duck pond. Jocelyn, why seven? Martin, is it not as good a number as another? Jennifer, what is the jewel like in the toad's head, Master Pippin? Martin, how can I say, Mistress Jennifer? There's but one way of knowing, according to the song, and like a fool I refused it. Jennifer, I wish I knew. Martin, the way lies open to all. Jocelyn, these are silly legends, Jennifer. It is as little likely that there are jewels in toads' heads as the toads spin flax. But Master Pippin pins his faith to any nonsense. Martin, True, Mistress Jocelyn, my faith cries for elbow-room, and he who pins his faith to common sense is like to get a cramp in it. Therefore, since women, as I hear tell, have ceased to spin bride's shifts, I am obliged to believe that these things are spun by toads, because brides there must be, though the wells should run dry. Jocelyn, I do not see the connection. However, it is obvious that the bad logic of your song has aroused even Gillian's attention, so for mercy's sake make short work of your tale before it flags again. Martin, I will follow your advice, and do you follow me with your best attention while I turn the wheel of the Mill of Dreams. End of Second Interlude Section 11 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. The Mill of Dreams. 
There was once, dear maidens, a girl who lived in a mill on the Seidelsham marshes. But in those days the marshlands were meadowlands, with streams running in from the coast, so that their water was brackish and salt. And sometimes the girl dipped her finger in the water, and sucked it, and tasted the sea. And the taste made storms rise in her heart. Her name was Helen. The mill-house was a gaunt and gloomy building of stone, as grey as sleep, weather-stained with dreams. It had fine proportions, and looked like a noble prison. And, in fact, if a prison is the lock-house of secrets, it was one. The great millstones ground day and night, and what the world sent in as corn it got back as flour. And as to the secrets of the grinding, it asked no questions, because to the world results are everything. It understands death better than sorrow, marriage better than love, and birth better than creation. And the millstones of joy and pain, grinding dreams into bread, it seldom hears. But Helen heard them, and they were all the knowledge she had of life, for if the mill was a prison of dreams, it was her prison too. Her father, the miller, was a harsh man and dark. He was dark within and without. Her mother was dead. She did not remember her. As she grew up, she did little by little the work of the big place. She was her father's servant, and he kept her as close to her work as he kept his millstones to theirs. He was morose, and welcomed no company. Gaiety he hated. Helen knew no songs, for she had heard none. From morning till night she worked for her father. When she had done all her other work, she spun flax into linen for shirts and gowns, and wool for stockings and vests. If she went outside the mill-house, it was only for a few steps for a few moments. She wasn't two miles from the sea, but she had never seen it. But she tasted the salt water, and smelt the salt wind. Like all things that grow up away from the light, she was pale. Her oval face was like ivory, and her lips, instead of being scarlet, had the tender red of apple blossom after the unfolding of the bright bud. Her hair was black and smooth and heavy, and lay on either side of her face like a starling's wings. Her eyes, too, were as black as midnight, and sometimes like midnight they were deep and sightless. But when she was neither working nor spinning, she would steal away to the millstones and stand there watching and listening. And then there were two stars in the midnight. She came away from those stolen times powdered with flour. Her black hair and her brows and lashes, her old blue gown, her rough hands and fair neck, and her white face. All that was dark and pale in her was merged in a mist and seen only through the clinging dust of the millstones. She would try to wipe off all the evidences of her secret occasions, but her father generally knew. Had he known by nothing else, he need only have looked at her eyes before they lost their starlight. One day, when she was seventeen years old, there was a knock at the mill-house door. Nobody ever knocked. Her father was the only man who came in and went out. The mill stood solitary in those days. The face of the country has since been changed by man and God but at that time there were no habitations in sight. At regular times the peasants brought their grain and fetched their meal, but the miller kept his daughter away from his custom. He never said why. Doubtless, at the back of his mind, was the thought of losing what was useful to him. Most parents have their ways of trying to keep their children. In some it is this way, in others that. Not many learned to keep them by letting them go. So when the knock came at the door, it was the strangest thing that had ever happened in Helen's life. She ran to the door, and stood with her hand on the heavy wooden bar that fell across it into a great socket. Her heart beat fast. Before we know a thing, it is a thousand things. Only one thing would be there when she lifted the bar. But as she stood with her hand upon it, a host of presences hovered on the other side. A knight in armor, 
a king in his gold crown, a god in the guise of a beggar, an angel with a sword, a dragon even, a woman to be her friend, her mother, a child. Would it be better not to open, thought Helen, for then she would never know. Yes, then she could run to her millstones and fling them her thoughts in the husk and listen, listen, while they ground them into dreams. What knowledge would be better than that? What would she lose by opening the door? But she had to open the door. Outside on the stones stood a common lad. He might have been three years older than she. He had a cap with a hole in it in his hand, and a shabby jersey that left his brown neck bare. He was whistling when she lifted the bar, but he stopped as the door fell back, and gave Helen a quick and careless look. "'Can I have a bit of bread?' he asked. Helen stared at him without answering. She was so unused to people that her mind had to be summoned from a world of ghosts before she could hear and utter real words. The boy waited for her to speak, but as she did not, shrugged his shoulders and turned away whistling his tune. Then she understood that he was going, and she ran after him quickly and touched his sleeve. He turned again, expecting her to speak, but she was still dumb. "'Thought better of it?' he said. Helen said slowly, "'Why did you ask me for bread?' "'Why?' He looked her up and down. "'To mend my boots with, of course.' She looked at his boots. "'You silly thing!' grinned the boy. A faint color came under her skin. "'I'm sorry for being stupid. I suppose you're hungry.' "'As a hunter. But there's no call to trouble you. I'll be where I can get bread, and meat too, in forty minutes. Good-bye, child.' "'No,' said Helen. "'Please don't go. I'd like to give you some bread.' "'Oh, all right,' said the boy. "'What frightened you? Did you think I was a scamp?' "'I wasn't frightened.' said Helen. "'Don't tell me,' mocked the boy. "'You couldn't get a word out.' "'I wasn't frightened.' "'You thought I was a bad lot. You don't know I'm not one now.' Helen's eyes filled with tears. She turned away quickly. "'I'll get you your bread,' she said. "'You are a silly, aren't you?' said the boy as she disappeared. Before long, she came back with half a loaf in one hand, and something in the other which she kept behind her back. "'Thanks,' said the boy, taking the bit of loaf. "'What else have you got there?' "'It's something better than bread,' said Helen slowly. "'Well, let's have a look at it.' She took her hand from behind her, and offered him seven ears of wheat. They were heavy with grain, and bowed on their ripe stems. "'Is this what you call better than bread?' he asked. "'It is better.' "'Oh, all right. I shan't eat it, though. Not all at once.' "'No,' said Helen. "'Keep it till you're hungry. The grains go quite a long way when you're hungry.' "'I'll eat one a year,' said the boy, "'and then they'll go so far they'll outlast me my lifetime.' "'Yes,' said Helen. "'But the bread will be gone in forty minutes, "'and then you'll be where you can get meat.' "'You funny thing,' said the boy, puzzled because she never smiled. "'Where can you get meat?' she asked. "'In a boat, fishing for rabbits.' But she took no notice of the rabbits. She said eagerly, "'A boat? Are you going in a boat?' "'Yes. Are you a sailor?' "'You've hit it.' "'You've seen the sea. You've been on the sea. Sailors do that.' "'Oh, dear, no!' said the boy. We sail three times round the duck pond and come home for tea. Helen hung her head. The boy put his hand up to his mouth and watched her over it. Well, he said presently, I must get along to Pagham. He stuck the little sheaf of wheat through the hole in his cap, and it bobbed like a ruddy gold plume over his ear. Then he felt in his pocket and after some fumbling got hold of what he wanted and pulled it out. "'Here you are, child,' he said, "'and thank you again.' 
he put his present into her hand and swung off whistling. He turned once to wave to her, and the corn in his cap nodded with its weight and his light gait. She stood gazing till he was out of sight, and then she looked at what he had given her. It was a shell. She had heard of shells, of course, but she had never seen one. Yet she knew this was no English shell. It was as large as the top of a teacup, but more oval than round. Over its surface, like pearl, rippled waves of sea-green and sea-blue, under a luster that was like golden moonlight on the ocean. She could not define or trace the waves of color. They flowed in and out of each other with interchangeable movement. One half of the outer rim, which was transparently thin, and curled like the fantastic edge of a surf wave, was flecked with a faint play of rose and cream and silver that melted imperceptibly into the moonlit sea. When she turned the shell over, she found that she could not see its heart. The blue-green side of the shell curled under like a smooth billow, and then broke into a world of caves and caves within caves, whose final secret she could not discover. But within and within the color grew deeper and deeper, bottomless blues and unfathomable greens, shot with such gleams of light as made her heart throb, for they were like the gleams that shoot through our dreams, the light that just eludes us when we wake. She went into the mill, trembling from head to foot. She was not conscious of moving, but she found herself presently standing by the grinding stones, with sound rushing through her and white dust whirling round her. She gazed and gazed into the labyrinth of the shell, as though she must see to its very core. But she could not. So she unfastened her blue gown, and laid the shell against her young heart. It was for the first time of so many times that I know not whether, when twenty years later she did it for the last time, they outnumbered the silver hairs among her black ones, and the silver by then were uncountable. Yet, on the day when Helen began her twenty years of lonely listening. But having said this, Martin Pippin grasped the rope just above Jennifer's hand, and pulled it with such force that the swing, instead of swinging back and forth as a swing should, reeled sideways so that the swinger had much ado to keep her seat. Jennifer, Heaven help me! Martin, Heaven help me! I need its help more sorely than you do. Jennifer. Oh, you should be punished, not helped. Martin. I have been punished, and the punished require help more than censure or scorn or anger or any other form of righteousness. Jennifer. Who has punished you, and for what? Martin. You, Mistress Jennifer, for my bad story. Jennifer. I do not remember doing so. The story is only begun. I am sure it will be a very good story. Martin. Now you are compassionate, because I need comfort. But the truth is that, good or bad, you care no more for my story, for I saw a tear of vexation come into your eye. Jennifer. It was not vexation, not exactly vexation and doubtless Helen will have experiences which we shall all be glad to hear, but all the same I wish. Martin, you wish? Jennifer, that she was not going to grow old in her loneliness, because all lovers are young. Martin, you have spoken the most beautiful of all truths. Does the grass grow high enough by the swing for you to pluck me two blades? Jennifer, I think so. Yes. What do you want with them? Martin. I want but one of them now. You shall only give me the other, if, at the end of my tale, you agree that its lovers are as green as this blade and that. On the day, resumed Martin, when Helen began her lonely listening of heart and ears betwixt the seashell and the millstones of her dreams, there was not, dear Mistress Jennifer, a silver thread in her black locks to vex you with. For a girl of seventeen is but a child. Yet 
old enough to begin spinning the stuff of the spirit. My boy! Oh, how strange it was, your coming like that so suddenly! Before I opened the door, I stood there guessing, and how could I have guessed this? Did you guess too, on the other side? No, not much. I thought it might be a cross old woman. What did you guess? Oh, such stupid things, kings and knights, and even women. And it was you. And it was you. Suppose I'd been a cross old woman. Suppose I'd been a king. And you were just my boy. And you, my sulky girl. Oh, I wasn't sulky. Oh, didn't you understand? How could I speak to you? I couldn't hear you. I couldn't see you even. Can you see me now? She was lying with her cheek against his heart, and she turned her face suddenly inwards, because she saw him bend his head, and the sweetness of his first kiss was going to be more than she could bear. Why don't you look up, you silly child? Why don't you look at me, dear? How can I yet? Can I ever? It's so hard looking in a person's eyes. But I am looking at you, I am, though you can't see me. Then tell me what color my eyes are. They're gray-green, and your hair is dark red, a sort of chestnut but a little redder, and rough over your forehead, and your nose is all over freckles and very, very snub. Martin. Heaven help you, Mistress Jennifer. Jennifer. Why, Master Pippin? Martin. Were you not about to fall again? Jennifer. No, I... Martin. I see you are as firm as a rock. How could I have been so deceived? He shook her a little in his arms, saying, How rude you are to my nose. I wish you'd look up. No, not yet. Presently. But you, did you look at me? Didn't you see me look? When? As soon as you opened the door. What did you see? The loveliest thing I'd ever seen. I'm not really, am I? I used to dream about you at night on my watches. I made you up out of bits of the night. White moonlight, black clouds, and stars. Sometimes I would take the last cloud of sunset for your lips, and the wind when it was gentle for your voice, and the movements of the sea for your movements, and the rise and fall of it for your breathing, and the lap of it against the boat for your kisses. Oh, child, look up. She looked up. What's your name? Helen. I can't hear you. Helen, say it. I'm trying to. I can't hear you now, and I want to hear your voice say my name. Oh, my boy, do say it so that I can remember it when you're away. I can't say it, child. Why didn't you tell me your name? What is yours? I'm trying to tell you. Please, please. I'm trying with all my might. Listen with all yours. I am listening. I can't hear anything. Yet I'm listening so hard that it hurts. I want to say your name over and over and over to myself when you're away. Can't you say it louder? No, it's no good. Oh, why didn't you tell me, boy? Oh, child, why didn't you tell me? Is my bread sweet to you? The sweetest I ever ate. I ate it slowly and took each bit from your hand. I kept one crust. And my corn? Oh, your corn. That is everlasting. You have sown your seed. I have eaten a grain and it bore its harvest. One by one I shall eat them and every grain will bear its full harvest. You have replenished the unknown earth with fields of golden corn, and set me walking there forever. And you have thrown golden light upon strange waters, and set me floating there forever. Oh, you on my earth, and I on your ocean, how shall we meet? Your corn is my waters. My waters are your corn. They move on one wave. Oh, child, we are born on it together, forever. But how you teased me! I couldn't help it! You and your boats and your duck-ponds! It was such fun! 
You were so serious. It was so easy to tease you. Why did you put your hand over your mouth? To keep myself from laughing at me? Kissing you. You looked so sorry because sailors only sail round duck ponds when you thought they always sailed out by the west and home by the east. You believed the duck ponds. I didn't really. For a moment. I felt so stupid. You blushed. Oh, did I? A very little, like the inside of a shell. I'd always tease you to make you blush like that. Don't you ever smile or laugh, child? You might teach me to. I haven't had the sort of life that makes one smile and laugh. Oh, but I could. I could smile and laugh for you if you wished. I could do anything you wanted. I could be anything you wanted. Shall I make something of you? What shall it be? I don't care, so long as it is yours. Oh, make something of me. I've been lonely always. I don't want to be any more. I want to be able to come to you when I please, not only because I need so much to come, but because you need me to come. Can you make me sure that you need me? When no one has ever needed you, how can you believe? Oh, no, no, don't look sorry. I do believe it. And will you always stand with me, here in the loneliness that has been so dark? Then it won't be dark any more. Why do two people make light? One alone only wanders and holds out her hand and finds no one, nothing, sometimes not even herself. Will you be with me always? Always. Why? Because I love you. No, said Helen, but because I love you. Tell me, were you frightened? Of you, when I saw you at the door? Yes, were you? Oh, my boy. But didn't you think I might be a scamp? I didn't think about it at all. It wouldn't have made any difference. Then why were you as mum as a fish? Oh, my boy. Why, why, why? If you weren't frightened, of course you were frightened. No, no, I wasn't. I told you I wasn't. Why don't you believe me? Oh, you're laughing at me again. You're blushing again. It's so easy to make me ashamed when I've been silly. Of course you know now why I couldn't speak. You know what took my words away. Didn't you know then? How could I know? How could I dream it would be as quick for you as for me? One can dream anything. Oh! What is it, child? For she had caught at her heart. Dreams, and not truth. Oh, are you here? Am I? Where are you? Where are you? Hold me, hold me fast. Don't let it be just empty dreams. Hush, hush, my dear. Dreams aren't empty. Dreams are as near the truth as we can come. What greater truth can you ever have than this? For as men and women dream, they drop one by one the veils between them and the mystery. But when they meet, they are shrouded in the veils again, and though they long to strip them off, they cannot, and each sees of each but dimly the truth which in their dreams was as clear as light. Oh, child, it's not our dreams that are our illusions. No, she whispered, but still it is not enough, not quite enough, for the beloved that they shall dream apart and find their truths apart. In life, too, they must touch, and find the mystery together, though it be only for one eternal instant. Touch me, not only in my dreams, but in life. Turn life itself into the dream at last. Oh, hold me fast, my boy, my boy. Hush, hush, child, I'm holding you. You wept. Oh, did you see? I turned my head away. Why did you weep? Because you thought I had misjudged you. Then I misjudged you. But I did not weep for that. Would you, if I misjudged you? It would not be so hard to bear. And you went away with tears, and brought me the corn of your mill. And you took it with smiles, and gave me the shell of your seas. Your corn rustled through my head. Your shell whispers at my heart. You shall always hear it whispering there. 
it will tell you what I can never tell you, or only tell you in other ways. Of your life on the sea, of the countries over the water, of storms and islands and flashing birds and strange bright flowers, of all the lands and life I've never seen and dream of all wrong, will it tell me those things, of your life that I don't know? Yes, perhaps, but I could tell you of that life. Of what other life will it tell me? Of my life that you do know. Is there one? Look in your own heart. I am looking. And listen. Yes. What do you hear? Oh, boy, the whispering of your shell. Oh, child, the rustling of your corn. Oh, maids, the grinding of the millstones. This is only a little part of what she heard. But if I told you the whole, we should rise from the story grey-headed. For every day she carried her boy's shell to the grinding stones, and stood there while it spoke against her heart. And at other times of the day it lay in her pocket, while she swept and cooked and spun, and she saw shadows of her mill-dreams in the cobwebs and the rising steam, and heard echoes of them in her singing kettle and her singing wheel and at night it lay on her pillow against her ear, and the voice of the waters went through her sleep. So the years slipped one by one, and she grew from a girl into a young woman, and presently passed out of her youth. But her eyes and her heart were still those of a girl, for life had touched them with nothing but a girl's dream. And it is not time that leaves its traces on the spirit, whatever it may do to the body. Her father, meanwhile, grew harder and more tyrannical with years. There was little for him to fear now that any man would come to take her from him. But the habit of the oppressor was on him, and of the oppressed on her. And when this has been many years established, it is hard for either to realize that to escape, the oppressed has only to open the door and go. Yet Helen, if she had ever thought of escape into another world and life, would not have desired it. For in leaving her millstones she would have lost a world whose boundaries she had never touched, and a life whose sweetness she had never exhausted. And she would have lost her clue to knowledge of him who was to her always the boy in the old jersey who had knocked at her door so many years ago. Once he was shipwrecked. The waters had sucked her under twice already when her helpless hands hid against some floating substance on the waves. She could not have grasped it by herself, for her strength was gone. But a hand gripped her in the darkness, and dragged her almost insensible to safety. For a long while she lay inert across the knees of her rescuer. Consciousness was at its very boundary. She knew that in some dim distance strong hands were chafing a wet and frozen body. But whose hands? whose body. Presently it was lifted to the shelter of strong arms, and now she was conscious of her own heartbeats, but it was like a heart beating in air, not in a body. Then warmth and breath began to fall like garments about this bodiless heart, and they were indeed not her own warmth and breath, but those things given to her by another. The warmth was that of his own body, where he had laid her cold hands and breast to take what heat there was in him, and the breath was of his own lungs, putting life into hers through their two mouths. She opened her eyes. It was dark. The darkness she had come out of was bright beside this pitchy night, and her struggle back to life less painful than the fierce labor of the wind and waves. Their frail, precarious craft was in ceaseless peril. His left arm held her like a vice, but for greater safety, he had bound a rope round their two bodies and the small mast of their craft. With his right arm he clasped the mast low down, and his right hand came round to grip her shaking knees. In this close hold she lay a long while without speaking. Then she said faintly, Is it my boy? Yes, child. Didn't you know? I wanted to hear you say it. How long have you been in danger? I don't know. Some hours. I thought you would never come to yourself. 
I tried to come to you. I can't swim. The sea brought you to me. You were nearly drowned. You slipped me once. If you had again... What would you have done? Jumped in. I couldn't have stayed on here without you. Ah, but you mustn't ever do that. Promise, promise, for then you'd lose me forever. Promise. I promise, but there's no forever of that sort. There's no losing each other, whatever happens. You know that, don't you? Yes, I do know. When people love, they find each other forever. But I don't want you to die, and I don't want to die, yet. But if it is tonight, it will be together. Will it be tonight, do you think? I don't know, dear. The storm's breaking up over there, but that's not the only danger. But nothing matters. Nothing matters at all while I'm with you. She lay heavily against him, her eyes closed, and she shook violently. Child, you're shuddering. You're as cold as ice. He put his hand upon her chilly bosom and hugged her more fiercely to his own. With a sudden movement of despair and anger at the little he could do, he slipped his arms from his jacket, and stripping open his shirt, pulled her to him, refastening his jacket around them both, tying it tightly about their bodies by the empty sleeves. She felt his lips on her hair, and heard him whisper, You are not frightened of me, are you, child? You never will be, will you? She shook her head, and whispered, I never have been. Sleep if you can, dear. I'll try. So closely was she held by his coat and his arms, so near she lay to his beloved heart, that she knew no longer what part of that union was herself. They were one body and one spirit. Her shivering grew less, and with her lips pressed to his neck, she fell asleep. End of Part 1 of The Mill of Dreams Section 12 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. The Mill of Dreams continued. It was noon. The hemisphere of the sky was an unbroken blue washed with a silver glare. She could not look up. The sea was no longer wild but it was not smooth. It was a dancing sea, and every small wave rippled with crested rainbows. A flight of gulls wheeled and screamed over their heads. Their movements were so swift that the mid-air seemed to be filled with visible lines described by their flight, silver lines that gleamed and melted on transparent space like curved lightnings. "'Oh, look! Oh, look!' cried Helen. He smiled, but he was not watching the gulls. Yes, you've never seen that, have you, child? His eyes searched the distance. But you aren't looking. What are you looking at? Nothing. I can't see what I'm looking for. But the gulls might mean land, or icebergs, or a ship. I don't want land or a ship, or even icebergs, said Helen suddenly. He looked at her with the fleeting look that had been her first impression of him. Why not? Why don't you? I'm so happy where I am. That's all very well, said her boy, with his eyes on the distance. For a while she lay enjoying the warmth of the sun, watching the gulls sliding down the unseen slopes of the air. Presently, high up, she saw one hover and pause, settling on nothingness by the swift, almost imperceptible beat of its wings. And suddenly it dropped like a stone upon a wave, and darted up again so quickly that she could not follow what had happened. "'What is it doing?' she asked. "'Fishing,' said the boy. "'It wanted its dinner.' "'So do I,' said Helen. He put his hand in his pocket, and pulled out a packet wrapped in oilskin, there was biscuit in it. He gave some to her, bit by bit. Though it was soft and dull, she was glad of it. But soon she drew away from the hand that fed her. 
"'What's the matter?' he asked. "'You must have some, too.' "'That's all right. I'm not greedy like you birds.' "'I'm not a bird, and I'm not greedy. Being hungry's not being greedy. I'd be greedy if I ate while you're hungry.' "'I'm not hungry.' "'Then neither am I.' To satisfy her, he ate a biscuit. Soon after, she began to feel thirst, but she dared not ask for water. She knew he had none. He looked at her, lying pale in his arms, and said with a smile that was not like a real smile, "'It's a pity about the icebergs.' She smiled and nodded, and lay still in the heat, watching the gulls, and thinking of ice. Some of the birds settled on the raft. One sat on the mast. Another hovered at her knee, picking at crumbs. They played in the sun, rising and falling, and turned in her vision into a whirl of snowflakes, enormous snowflakes. She began to dream of snow, and her lips parted in the hope that some might fall upon her tongue. Presently she ceased to dream of snow. The boy looked down at her closed lids, and at her cheeks as white as the breasts of the gulls. He could not bear to look long, and returned to his distances. It was night again. The circle of the sea was as smooth as silk. Pale light played over it like dreams and ghosts. The sky was a crowded arc of stars, millions of stars, she had never seen or imagined so many. They glittered, glittered restlessly, in an ecstasy that caught her spirit. She, too, was filled with millions of stars. Through her senses they flashed and glittered, a delirium of stars in heaven and her heart. My boy! Yes, child. Do you see the stars? Yes, child. Do you feel them? Yes. Oh, can't we die now? She felt him move stiffly. There's a ship! I'm certain of it now, I'm certain. How oh, if it were day? The stars went on dazzling. She did not understand about the ship. Time moved forward, or stood still. For her the night was timeless. It was eternity. But things were happening outside in time and space. By what means they had been seen or had attracted attention, she did not know. But the floating dreamlight and the shivering starlight on the sea were broken by a dark movement on the waveless waters. A boat was coming. For some time there had been shouting and calling in strange voices, one of them her boys. But once again she hovered on the dim verge of consciousness. She had flown from the body he was painfully unbinding from his own. What he had suffered in holding it there so long she never knew. From leagues away she heard him whispering, Child, can you help yourself a little? And now, for an instant, her soul reapproached her body, and looked at him through the soft midnight of her eyes, and he saw in them such starlight as never was in sky or on sea. Kiss me, said Helen. He kissed her. With a great effort she lifted herself and stood upright on the raft, swaying a little and holding by the mast. The boat was still a little distant. Goodbye, my boy. Child, don't jump. You promised not to. You promised. But I can't come with you now. You must let me go. He looked at her and saw she was in a fever. He made a desperate clutch at her blue gown. But he was not quick enough. Keep your promise, she cried and disappeared in the dreamlit waters. She disappeared like a dream, without a sound. As she sank, she heard him calling her by the only name he knew. When she was thirty-five, her father died. Now she was free to go where she pleased, but she did not go anywhere. Ever since, as a child, she had first tasted salt water, she had longed to travel and see other lands. What held her now? Was it that her longing had been satisfied? That she had a host of memories, of great mountains and golden shores, of jungles and strange cities of the coast, 
of islands lost in seas of sapphire and emerald, of caravans and towers of ivory, of haunted caverns and deserted temples, where, a child always, with her darling boy, she had had such adventures as would have filled a hundred earthly lives. They had built huts in uninhabited places, or made a twisted bower of strong green creepers, and lived their primitive paradisal life wanting nothing but each other. Sometimes, through accidents and illness, they had nursed each other with such unwearied tenderness that death himself had to withdraw, defeated by love. Once on a ship there had been mutiny, and she alone stood by him against a throng. Once savages had captured her, and he, outwitting them, had rescued her, riding through leagues of prairie land and forest, holding her before him on the saddle. In nearly all these adventures it was as though they had met for the first time, and were struck anew with the dumb wonder of first love, and the strange shy sweetness of wooing and confession. Yet they were but playing above truth. For the knowledge was always between them that they were bound immortally by love, which having no end seemed also to have had no beginning. They quarrelled sometimes. This was playing too. She put, now herself, now him, in the wrong, and either reconciliation was sweet. But it was she who was oftenest at fault, his forgiveness was so dear to her. And still this was but playing at it. When all these adventures and pretenses were done, they stood heart to heart, and out of their only meeting in life built up eternal truth and told each other. They told it inexhaustibly. And so, when her father left her free to go, Helen lived on still in the mill of dreams, and kept her millstones grinding. Two years went by, and her hard, grey, lonely life laid its hand on her hair and her countenance. Her father had worn her out before her time. It was only invisible grain in the mill now. The peasants came no longer with their corn. She had enough to live on, and her long seclusion unfitted her for strange men in the mill and people she must talk to. And so long was the habit of the recluse on her, that though her soul flew leagues, her body never wandered more than a few hundred yards from her home. Some who had heard of her, and had glimpses of her, spoke to her when they met. But they could make no headway with the sweet, shy, silent woman. Yet children and boys and girls felt drawn to her. It was the dream in her eyes that stirred the love in their hearts, though they knew it no more than the soup in the pipkin knows why it bubbles and boils, for it cannot see the fire but to them she did not seem old. Her strength and eagerness were still upon her, and that silver needlework with which time broiders all men had in her its special beauty, setting her aloof in the unabandoned dream which the young so often desert as their youth deserts them. Those of her age, seeing that unyouthful gleam of her hair, combined with the still youthful dream of her eyes, felt as though they could not touch her, for no man can break another's web, he can only break his own. And these had torn their films to tatters long ago, and shouldered their way through the smudgy rents, and no more walked where she walked. But very young people knew the places she walked in, and saw her clearly, for they walked there too, though they were growing up, and she was growing old. At the end of the second year, there was a storm. It lasted three days without stopping. Such fury of rain and thunder she had never heard. The gaunt rooms of the mill were steeped in gloom, except when lightning stared through the flat windows, or split into fierce cracks on the dingy glass. Those three days she spent by candlelight. Outside the world seemed to lie under a dark doom. On the third morning she woke early. She had had restless nights, but now and then slept heavily, and out of one dull slumber she awakened to the certainty that something strange had happened. The storm had lulled at last. Through her window, set high in the wall, 
she could see the dead light of a blank grey dawn. She had seen other eyeless mornings on her window pane, but this was different, the air in her room was different. Something unknown had been taken from or added to it. As she lay there wondering, but not yet willing to discover, the flat light at the window was blocked out. A seagull beat against it with its wings and settled on the sill. The flutter and the settling of the bird overcame her. It was as though reality were more than she could bear. The birds of memory and pain flew through her heart. She got up and went to the window. The gold did not move. It was broken and exhausted by the storm. And beyond it, she looked down upon the sea. Yes, it was true. The sea itself washed at the walls of the mill. She did not understand these grey-green waters. She knew them in vision, not in reality. She cried out sharply and threw the window open. The draggled bird fluttered in and sank on the floor. A sea wind blew in with it. The bird's wings shivered on her feet and the wind on her bosom. She stared over the land, swallowed up in the sea. Wreckage of all sorts tossed and floated on it. Fences and broken gates and branches of trees, and fragments of boats and nets and bits of cork, and grass and flowers and seaweed, she thought. What did she think? She thought she must be dreaming. She felt like one drowning. Where could she find a shore? She hurried to the bed and got her shell. Its touch on her heart was her first safety. In her nightgown as she was, she ran with her naked feet through the dim passages until she stood beside the grinding stones. Child! 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 Where are you, my boy? Where are you? Aren't you coming? Must I lose you after all this? Oh, come! But tell me where you are! In a few hours I should have been with you, a few hours after many years. Oh, boy, for pity, tell me where to find you. You are there waiting for me, aren't you, child? I know you are. I've always known you were. What would you have said to me when you opened the door in your blue gown? Oh, but say only where you are, my boy. Do you know what I should have said? I shouldn't have said anything. I should have kissed you. Oh, let me come to you, and you shall kiss me. But she listened in vain. She went back to her room. The goal was still on the floor. Its wing was broken. Her actions from this moment were mechanical. She did what she did without will. First she bound the broken wing, and fetched bread and water for the wounded bird. Then she dressed herself, and went out of the mill. She had a rope in her hands. The water was not all around the mill. Strips and stretches of land were still unflooded, or only thinly covered. But the face of the earth had been altered by one of those great inland swoops of the sea that have for centuries changed and rechanged the point of Sussex, advancing, receding, shifting the coastline, making new shores, restoring old fields, wetting the soil with the sand. Helen walked where she could. She had no choice of ways. She kept by the edge of the water and went into no man's land. A bank of rotting grasses and dry reeds, which the waves had left uncovered, rose from the marshes. She mounted it and beheld the unnatural sea on either hand. Here and there in the desolate water, mounds of grey-green grass lifted themselves like drifting islands. Trees stricken or still in leaf reared from the unfamiliar element. Many of those which were leafless had put on a strange greenness, for their boughs dripped with seaweed. Over the floods, which were littered with such flotsam as she had seen from her window, flew seabirds and land birds, crying and sheeping. There was no other presence in that desolation except her own. And then, at last, her commanded feet stood still, and her will came back to her, for she saw what she had come to find. He was hanging, as though it had caught him in a snare, 
in a tree standing solitary in the middle of a wide waste of water. He was hanging there like a dead man. She could distinguish his dark red hair and his blue jersey. She paused to think what to do. She couldn't swim. She would not have hesitated to try, but she wanted to save him. She looked about, and saw among the bits of stuff washing against the foot of the bank a large dismembered tree trunk. It bobbed back and forth among the hollow reeds. She thought it would serve her if she had an oar. She went in search of one, and found a broken plank cast up among the tangled growth of the bank. When she had secured it, she fastened one end of a rope around the stump of an old pollard squatting on the bank like a sturdy gnome, and the other end she knotted around herself. Then, gathering all the middle of the rope into a coil, and using her plank as a prop, she let herself down the bank, and slid shuddering into the water. But she had her tree trunk now. With some difficulty she scrambled onto it, and paddled her way into the open water. It was not really a great distance to his tree, but to her it seemed immeasurable. She was unskillful, and her awkwardness often put her into danger. But her will made her do what she otherwise might not have done. Presently she was under the branches of his tree. She pulled herself up to a limb beside him and looked at him. And it was not he. It was not her boy. It was a man, middle-aged, rough and weather-beaten, but pallid under his red and tan. His hair was grizzled, and his face was rough with the growth of grizzled hair. His whole body lurched heavily and helplessly in a fork of the tree, and one arm hung limp. His eyes were half shut. But they were not quite shut. He was not unconscious, and under the drooping lids he was watching her. For a few minutes they sat gazing at each other in silence. She had her breath to get. She thought it would never come back. The man spoke first. "'Well, you made a job of it,' he said. She didn't answer. "'But you don't know much about the water, do you?' "'I've never seen the sea till today,' said Helen slowly. He laughed a little. "'I expect you've seen enough of it today. But where do you live, then, that you've never seen the sea? In the middle of the earth?' "'No,' said Helen. "'I live in a mill.' His eyelids flickered. Do you? Yes, of course you do. I might have guessed it. How should you guess it? By your blue dress, said the man. Then he fainted. She sat there miserably, waiting, ready to prop him if he fell. She did not know what else to do. Before very long he opened his eyes. Did I go off again? he asked. She nodded. Yes. Well, it's time to be making a move. I dare say I can now you're here. What's your name? Helen. Well, Helen, we'd better put that rope to some use. Will that tree at the other end hold? Yes. Then just you untie yourself, and we'll get aboard and haul ourselves home. She unfastened the rope from her body, and helped him down to her makeshift boat. You take the paddle, he said. My arm's damaged, but I can pull on the rope with the other. Are you sure? Are you all right? What's your name? Yes, I can manage. My name's Peter. This would have been a lark thirty years ago, wouldn't it? It's rather a lark now. She nodded vaguely, wondering what she would do if he fell off the log in midwater. Suppose you faint again. Don't look for trouble said the man. Push off now. Pulling and paddling, they got to the bank. He took her helping hand up it, and she saw by his movements that he was very feeble. He leaned on her as they went back to the mill. They walked without speaking. When they reached the door, Peter said, It's twenty years since I was here, but I expect you don't remember. Oh, yes, said Helen. I remember. Do you now? said Peter. It's funny you should remember. And with that, 
he did faint again. And this time, when he recovered, he was in a fever. His staying power was gone. She put him to bed and nursed him. She sat day and night in his room, doing by instinct what was right and needful. At first he lay either unconscious or delirious. She listened to his incoherent speech in a sort of agony, as though it might contain some clue to a riddle. And she sat with her passionate eyes brooding on his countenance, as though in that too might lie the answer. But if there was one, neither his words nor his face revealed it. "'When he wakes,' she whispered to herself, "'he'll tell me. How can there be barriers between us any more?' After three days he came to himself. She was sitting by the window preparing sheep's wool for her spindle. She bent over her task, using the last of the light which fell upon her head. She did not know that he was conscious, or had been watching her, until he spoke. "'Your hair used to be quite brown, didn't it?' he said. "'Nut brown!' She started and turned to him, and a faint flush stained her cheeks. "'Ah, oh, you're not pleased,' said Peter with a slight grin. "'None of us like getting old, do we?' Helen put by the question. "'You're yourself again.' "'Doing my best,' said he. "'How long is it?' Three days. "'As much as that. I could have sworn it was only yesterday. "'Well, time passes.' He said no more, and fell into a doze. Helen was as grateful for this as she could have been for anything just then. She couldn't have gone on talking. She was stunned with misgivings. How could he ever have thought her hair was brown? Couldn't he see, even now, that it had once been as black as jet? She put her hand up to her head, and unpinned a coil of her heavy hair, and spread it over her breast, and looked at it. Yes, the silver was there too much and too soon, but there was less silver than black. It was still time's stitchery, not his fabric. The man who was not her boy need never have seen her before to know that once her hair had been black. This was worse than forgetfulness in him. It was misremembrance. She pulled at the silver hairs passionately, as though she would pluck them out and make him see her as she had been but soon she stopped her futile effort to uncount the years. "'I am foolish,' she whispered to herself, and coiled her lock again, and bound it in its place. "'There are other ways of making him remember. Presently, when he wakes again, I will talk to him. I will remind him of everything. Yes, and I'll tell him everything. I won't be afraid.' She waited with longing his next consciousness. But to her woe, she found herself defeated. While he slept, she was able, as when he had been delirious or absent, to create the occasion and the talk between them. She dropped all fears, and in frank tenderness brought him her twenty years of dreams. And in her thought he accepted and answered them. But when he woke and spoke to her from the bed, she knew at once that the man who lay there was not the man with whom she had been speaking his personality fenced with hers. It had barriers she could not pass. She dared not try, for dread of his indifference or his smiles. "'What made you stick on in this place?' he asked her. "'I don't know,' said Helen. "'Places hold one, don't they?' "'None ever held me. I couldn't have been content to stay the best half of my life in one spot. But I suppose women are different.' You speak as though all women were the same. Aren't they? I thought they might be. I don't know much about them, said Peter, rubbing his chin. Rough as a porcupine, aren't I? You must have thought me a savage when you found me stuck upside down in that tree like a sloth. What did you think? She looked at him, longing to tell him what she had thought. She longed to tell him of the boy she had expected to find in the tree. She longed to tell him how the finding had shocked her by bringing home to her her loss, not of the boy, but of something in that moment still more precious to her. Because, she longed to tell him, she had so swiftly rediscovered the lost boy, not in his face, but in his glance, 
not in his words but in the tones of his voice. But when she looked at him and saw him leaning on his elbow waiting for her answer, with his half-shut lids and the half-smile on his lips, she answered only, I was thinking how to get you back to the bank. Was that it? Well, you managed it. I've never thanked you, have I? Don't, said Helen with a quick breath, and looked out of the window. He waited for a few moments, and then said, I'm a bad hand at thanking. I can't help being a savage, you know. I'm not fit for women's company. I don't look so rough when I'm trimmed. I don't want to be thanked, said Helen, controlling her voice, and added with a faint smile, No one looks his best when he's ill. Wait till I'm well, grinned Peter, and see if I'm not fit to walk you out of Sundays. He lay back on his pillow and whistled a snatch of tune. Her heart almost stopped beating, because it was the tune he had whistled at the door twenty years ago. For a moment she thought she could speak to him as she wished. But desire choked her power to choose her words. So many rushed through her brain that she had to pause, seeking which of them to utter. And that long pause, in which she really seemed to have uttered them all aloud, checked the impulse. But surely he had heard her. No, for she had not spoken yet. And before she could make the effort, he had stopped whistling. And when she looked at him to speak, he was fumbling restlessly about his pillow. What is it? she asked. Something I had. Where's my clothes? She brought them to him, and he searched them till he had found among them a small metal box which he thrust under the pillow. And then he lay back, as though too tired to notice her. So her impulse died in her, unacted on. End of Part 2 of The Mill of Dreams Section 13 of Marden Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. The Mill of Dreams continued. Entering the next four days, it was always so. A dozen times in their talks she tried to come near him, and could not. Was it because he would not let her? or because the thing she wished to find in him was not really there. Sometimes by his manner only, and sometimes by his words, he baffled her when she attempted to approach him. And the attempt had been so painful to conceive, and its stillbirth was such agony to her. He would talk frequently of the time he would be making tracks again. "'Where to?' asked Helen. "'I leave it to chance. I always have.' I've never made plans, or very seldom, and I'm not often twice in the same place. You look tired. I'm sorry to be a bother to you. But it'll be for the last time, most likely. Go and lie down. I don't want to, said Helen under her breath. And in her thoughts she was crying. The last time? Then it must be soon, soon. I'll make you listen to me now. I want to sleep said Peter. She left the room. Tears of helplessness and misery filled her eyes. She was almost angry with him, but more angry with herself. But her self-anger was mixed with shame. She was ashamed that he made her feel so much, while he felt nothing. Did he feel nothing? It's my stupidity that keeps us apart, she whispered. I will break through it. As quickly as she had left him she returned, and stood by the bed. He was lying with his hand pressed over his eyes. When he was conscious of her being there, his hand fell, and his keen eyes shot into hers. His brows contracted. "'You nuisance!' he muttered, and hid his eyes again. She turned and left him. When she got outside the door, she leaned against it and shook from head to foot. She hovered on the brink of her delusions and felt as though she would soon crash into a precipice. 
she longed for him to go before she fell. Yes, she began to long for the time when he should go and end this pain, and leave her to the old strange life that had been so sweet. His living presence killed it. After that third day she had had no more fears for his safety, and he was strong and rallied quickly. The goal, too, was saved. He saved it. It had drooped and sickened with her. She did not know what to do with it. On the fourth day, as he was so much better, she brought it to him. He reset its wing and kept it by him, making it his patient and his playfellow. It thrived at once, and grew tame to his hand. He fondled and talked to it like a lover. She would watch him silently with her smoldering eyes as he fed and caressed the bird, and jabbered to it in scraps of a dozen foreign tongues. His tenderness smote her heart. "'You're not very fond of birds,' he said to her once, when she had been sitting in one of her silences while he played with his pet. The words, question or statement, filled her with anger. She would not trust herself to protest or deny. I don't know much about them, she said. That's a pity, said Peter coolly. The more you know em, the more you have to love em. Yet you could love them for all sorts of things without knowing them, I'd have thought. She said nothing. For their beauty now, that's worth loving. Look at this one. You are a beauty, all right, aren't you, my pretty? Not many girls to match you. He paused and ran his finger down the bird's throat and breast. "'Perhaps you don't think she's beautiful,' he said to Helen. "'Yes, she's beautiful,' said Helen, with a difficulty that sounded like reluctance. "'Ah, uh, you don't think so. You ought to see her flying. You shall some day. When her hurt's mended, she'll fly. I'll let her go.' "'Perhaps she won't go,' said Helen. Oh, yes, she will. How can she stop in a place like this? This is no air for her. She must fly in her own. You'll be sorry to see her go, said Helen. To set her free? No, not a bit. I want her to fly. Why should I keep her? I'd not let her keep me. I'd hate her for it. Why should I make her hate me? Perhaps she wouldn't, said Helen in a low voice. Oh, I expect she would. Ungrateful little beggar. I've saved her life, and she ought to know she belongs to me. So she might stay out of gratitude, but she'd come to hate me for it all the same. Not at first, after a bit. Because we change. Bound to, aren't we? Perhaps. I know I do. We can none of us stay what we were. You haven't either. You haven't much to go by, said Helen. Seven minutes at the door, wasn't it? This time it's been seven days. Yes. It's a long time for me, said Peter. It's not much out of a lifetime. No, but suppose it were more than seven days. Helen looked at him and said slowly, It will be, won't it? You won't be able to go tomorrow. No, said Peter. Not tomorrow, or next day perhaps. Perhaps I won't be able to go for the rest of my life. This time Helen looked at him and said nothing. Peter stroked his bird and whistled his tune, and stopped abruptly and said, Will you marry me, Helen? I'd rather die, said Helen. And she got up and went out of the room. Oh, the green grass, chuckled Martin like a bird. Nobody asked you to begin a song, Master Pippin, quavered Jennifer. It was not the beginning of a song, Mistress Jennifer. It was the epilogue of a story. But the epilogue comes at the end of a story, said Jennifer. And hasn't my story come to its end, said Martin. Jocelyn. Ridiculous! Oh, dear, there's no bearing with you. How can this be the end? How can it be, with him on one side of the door and her on the other? Joyce. And her heart's breaking. You must make an end of that. 
Jennifer. And you must tell us the end of the shell. Jessica. And of the millstones. Jane. What did he have in his box? Please, said little Joan, tell us whether she ever found her boy again. Oh, please tell us the end of her dreams. Do these things matter? said Martin. Hasn't he asked her to marry him? But she said no, said Jennifer, with tears in her eyes. Did she? said Martin. Who said so? Master Pippin, said Jocelyn, and her voice shook with the agitation of her anger. Tell us immediately the things we want to know. When I wonder, said Martin, will women cease to want to know little things more than big ones? However, I suppose they must be indulged in little things, lest... Lest, said little Joan. There is such a thing, said Martin, as playing for safety. Well then, my dear maids, when Helen ran out of his room, she went to her own, and she threw herself on the bed and sobbed without weeping, because everything in her life seemed to have been taken away from her, she lay there for a long time, and when she moved at last, her head was so heavy that she took the pins from her hair to relieve herself of its weight. But still the pain weighed on her forehead, which burned on her cold fingers when she pressed them over her eyes, trying to think and find some gleam of hope among her despairing thoughts. And then she remembered that one thing at least was left her, her shell. During his illness she had never carried it to the millstones. It was as though his being there had been the only answer to her daily dreams, an answer that had failed them all the time. But now, in spite of him, she would try to find the old answers again. So she went once more to the millstones with her shell, and when she got there she held it so tightly to her heart that it marked her skin. And the millstones had nothing to say. For the first time, they refused to grind her corn. Then Helen knew that she really had nothing left, and that the homecoming of the man had robbed her of her boy and of the child she had been. Nothing was left but the man and woman who had lost their youth, and the man had nothing to give the woman, nothing but gratitude and disillusion. And now a still bitterer thought came to her, the thought that the boy had had nothing to give the girl. For twenty years it had been the girl's illusion. The storms in her heart broke out. She put her face in her hands and wept like wild rain on the sea. She wept so violently that between her passion and the speechless grinding of the stones she did not hear him coming. She only knew he was there when he put his arm round her. "'What is it, you silly thing?' said Peter. She looked up at him through her hair, that fell like a girl's in soft masses on either side of her face. There was a change in him, but she didn't know then what it was. He had got into his clothes and made himself kempt. His beard was no longer rough, though his hair was still unruly across his forehead, and under it his grey-green eyes looked, half-anxious, half-smiling, into hers. His face was rather pale, and he was a little unsteady in his weakness. But the look in his eyes was the only thing she saw. It unlocked her speech at last. "'Oh, why did you come back?' she cried. "'Why did you come back? If you had never come, I should have kept my dream to the end of my life. But now even when you go, I shall never get it again. You have destroyed what was not there.' He was silent for a moment, still keeping his arm round her. Then he said, Look what's here. And he opened his hand, and showed her his metal box without its lid. In it were the mummies of seven ears of corn. Some were only husks, but some had grain in them still. She stared at them through her tears, and drew from her breast her hand with the shell in it. Suddenly her mouth quivered, and she cried passionately, "'What's the use?' And she snatched the old corn from him and flung it to the millstones with her shell. 
and the millstones ground them to eternal atoms. My boy, my boy, it was you over there in the tree. Oh, child, you came at last in your blue gown. Why didn't you call to me? I'd no breath, I was spent, and I knew you'd seen me and would do your best. I'll never forget that sight of you in the tree, with your old jersey and your hair as red as ever. I shall always see your free young figure standing on the high bank against the sky. Oh, I was desperate. I wondered what you'd do. I knew you'd do something. I thought I'd never get across the water. Do you know what I thought as I saw you coming so bravely and so badly? I thought, I'll teach her to swim one day. Shall I, child? I can't swim without you, my boy, she whispered. But you pretended not to know me. I couldn't help it. It was such fun. How could you make fun of me, then? I always shall, you know. Oh, yes, she said. Do. Always. What did you think when you saw me in the tree? What did you see when you got there? Not what you expected. No, I saw twenty years come flying upon me, twenty years I'd forgotten all about, because, for me, it has always been twenty years ago. And you expected to see a boy, and you saw a grizzled man. No, said Helen, her eyes shining with tears. I expected to see a boy, and I saw a gray-haired woman. I've seen her ever since. I've only seen her once, said Peter. I saw her rise up from the water and sit in my tree. And when she spoke and looked at me, it was a child. He put his hand over her wet eyes. You must stop seeing her, child, he said. When I told you my name, were you disappointed? No, it's the loveliest name in the world. You said it at once. I had to. I'd wanted to say it for twenty years. But I shan't say it often, Helen. Won't you? No, child. Now and then, for a treat? She looked up at him, half shy, half merry. Oh, you can smile, can you? You were to teach me that, too. Yes, I've a lot to teach you, haven't I? I've yet to teach you to say my name. Have you? You've never said it once. I've said it a thousand times. You've never let me hear you. Haven't I? Let me hear you. Peter. Say it again. Peter, Peter, Peter. Again. My boy. When we got back to the mill door, the last of the twenty years that had been melting faster and faster melted away forever, and you and I were standing there as we'd stood then, and I wanted to kiss your mouth as I'd wanted to then. Oh, why didn't you, both times? Shall I now, for both times? Oh, oh, that's for a hundred times. Think of all the times I've wanted to and been without you. You've never been without me. I know that. How often I came to the mill. Did you come to the mill? As often as I ate your grain. Didn't you know? I know how often your sea brought me to you. Did it? And oh, my boy, at last the sea brought you to me. And the mill, he said. Where has that brought us? I thought perhaps you'd die. I couldn't have died so close on finding you. I was fighting the demons all the time, fighting my way through to you. And at last I opened my eyes and saw you again, your black hair edged with light against the window. My black hair? You mean my brown hair, don't you? Oh, weren't you cross? I loved you for being cross. I wasn't cross. Why will you keep on saying I'm things I'm not? You were so cross that you pretended our twenty years were sixty. I never said anything about twenty years or sixty. 
You did, though. Sixty. Why, in sixty years, we'd have been very nearly old. So to punish you, I pretended to go to sleep, and I saw you take your hair down. It was so beautiful. You've seen the threads spiders spin on blackened furs that gypsies have set fire to? Your hair was like that. You were angry with those lovely lines of silver, and you wanted to get rid of them. I nearly called to you to stop hurting what I loved so much, but you stopped of yourself as though you had heard me before I called. I was ashamed of myself, whispered Helen. I was ashamed of trying to be again what I was the only other time you saw me. You've never stopped being that child, said Peter. You knew, didn't you, why it was I had stayed on at the mill? You knew what it was that held me, and why I could never leave it. Yes, I knew. It held you because it held me, too. I wondered if you'd tell me that. I longed to, but I couldn't. I've never been able to tell you things, and I never shall. Oh, child, don't look so troubled. You've always told me things, and always will. Do you think it's with our tongues we tell each other things? What can words ever tell? They only circle round the truth like birds flying in the sun. The light bathes their flight, yet they are millions of miles away from the light they fly in. We listen to each other's words, but we watch each other's eyes. Some people have shut their eyes, Peter. Some people, Helen, can't shut their eyes at all. Your eyes will never stop telling me things. And the strangest thing about them is that looking into them is like being able to see in the dark. They are darkness, not light. And in darkness dreams are born. When I look into your eyes, I go into your dream. I shall never shut my eyes again, she whispered. I will keep you in my dream forever. Women aren't all the same, Peter. Aren't they? And yet, they are. Well, I give it up. Didn't you know? No, I told you the truth that time. I've not had very much to do with women. Then I've something to teach you, Peter. I don't know what you can prove, said Peter. One woman by herself can't prove a difference. Can't she? said Helen and laughed and cried at once. But why did you call me a nuisance? You were one. You are one. You leave a man no peace. You're like the sea. You're full of storms, aren't you? Not only storms. I know. But the sea wouldn't be the sea without her storms. They're one of her ways of holding us, too and there are more storms in her than ever break. I see them in you, big ones and little ones, brooding. Then you're a... nuisance. You always will be, won't you? Not to wreck you. You won't do that. Or if you do, I can survive shipwreck. I know. How do you know? I nearly gave up once, but the thought of you stopped me. I wanted to come back. I'd always meant to so I held on. I know. How do you know? I never told you, did I? Oh, Peter, the things we have to tell each other. The times you thought you were alone. The times I thought I was. You've had a life you never dreamed of. And I another life that was not in my dreams. You've saved me from death more than once, said Peter. You've done more than that, said Helen. You've given me the only life I've had. But a thing doesn't belong to you because you've saved its life or given it life. It only belongs to you because you love it. I know you belong to me, but you only know if I belong to you. That's not true now. You do know, and I know. Yes, and we know that as that belonging has nothing to do with death, it can't have anything either to do with the saving or even the giving of life. So you must never thank me, or I you. There are no thanks in love. And that was why I couldn't bear your asking me to marry you today. 
I thought you were thanking me. When you played with the seagull? Yes. How you loved it. Yes. I looked to see how you felt when you loved a thing. I wanted so much to be the seagull in your hands. When I touched it, I was touching you. She put his hand to her breast and whispered, I love birds. He smiled. I knew you loved them, and best free. All birds must fly in their own air. Yes, she said, but their freedom only means their power to choose what air they'll fly in, and every choice is a cage, too. I shall leave the door open, child. I shall never fly out, said Helen. You talked of going away. Yes, but not from you. Am I to go with you always, following chance and making no plans? Will you? You are the only plan I ever made. Will you leave everything else but me to chance? Perhaps it will lead us all over the earth, and perhaps after all we shall not go very far. But I never could see ahead, except one thing. What was it? The mill door, and you in your old blue gown. And for seven days I've stopped seeing that. I haven't it to steer by. Will you chance it? Must you be playing with meanings, even in dreams? Don't you know? Don't you know that for a woman who loves, and is not sure that she is loved, her days and nights are all chances, every minute she lives is a chance. It might be, it might not be. Oh, those ghosts of joy and pain, they are almost too much to bear. For the joy isn't pure joy, or the pain pure pain, and she cannot come to rest in either of them. Sometimes the joy is nearly as great as though she knew, yet at the instant she tries to take it, it looks at her with the eyes of doubt, and she trembles and dare not take it yet. And sometimes the pain is all but the death she foresees, yet even as she submits to it, it lays upon her heart the finger of hope, and then she trembles again, because she need not take it yet. Those are her chances, Peter. But when she knows that her beloved is her lover, life may do what it will with her, but she is beyond its chances forever. Your corn! You kept my corn! Till it should bear. And your shell there. You've kept my shell. Till it should speak. And now... Oh, see, these things that have held our dreams for twenty years. The life is threshed from them forever. They are only husks. They can hold our dreams no more. Oh, I can't go on dreaming by myself. I can't. It's no use. I thought my heart had learned to bear its dream alone. But the time comes when love in its beauty is too near to pain. There is more love than the single heart can bear. Goodbye, my boy. Goodbye. Helen, don't suffer so. Oh, child, what are you doing? Letting my dreams go. It's no use, Peter. The millstones took them and crushed them. She uttered a sharp cry. She uttered a sharp cry. His arm tightened round her. What is it, child? she heard him say. She looked at him bewildered, and saw that he too was dazed. She looked into the grey-green eyes of a boy of twenty. She said in a voice of wonder, Oh, my boy, as he felt her soft hair. Such a fuss about an empty shell and a bit of dead wheat. She hid her face on his jersey. You are a silly, aren't you? said Peter. I wish you'd look up. Helen looked up, and they kissed each other for the first time. I defy you now, Mistress Jennifer, to prove that your grass blade is greener than mine. End of the Mill of Dreams
Section 14 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farjan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Third Interlude The girls now turned their attention to their neglected apples, varying this more serious business with comments on the story that had just been related. Jessica I should be glad to know, Jane, what you make of this matter. Jane Indeed, Jessica, it is difficult to make anything at all of matters so bewildering. For who could have divined reality to be the illusion, and dreams the truth? So that by the light of their dreams, the lovers in this tale mistook each other for that which they were not. Martin Who indeed, Mistress Jane, safe students of human nature like yourselves, who have doubtless long ago observed how men and women begin by filling a dim dream with a golden thing, such as youth, and end by putting a shining dream into a grey thing, such as age. And in the end it is all one, and lovers will see to the last in each other that which they loved at the first, since things are only what we dream them to be, as you have, of course, also observed. Jocelyn we have observed nothing of the sort, and if we dreamed at all, we would dream of things exactly as they are, and would never dream of mistaking age for youth. But we do not dream. Women are not given to dreams. Martin. They are the fortunate sex. Men are such incurable dreamers that they even dream women to be worse praise of the delusive habit than themselves. But... I trust you found my story sufficiently wide awake to keep you so. Jocelyn. It did not make me yawn. Is this mill still to be found on the Seidelsham marshes? Martin. It is where it was. But what sort of gold it grinds now, whether corn or dreams or nothing, I cannot say. Yet such is the power of what has been, that I think were the stones set in motion, any right listener might hear what Helen and Peter once heard, and even more, for they would hear the tale of those lovers' journeys over the changing waters, and their return time and again to the unchanging plot of earth that kept their secrets, until in the end they were together delivered up to the millstones which thresh the immortal grain from its mortal husk. But this was after long years of gladness, and a life kept young by the child, which each was always rediscovering in the other's heart. Jennifer Oh, I am glad they were glad. Do you know I had begun to think they would not be? Jessica It was exactly so with me, for suppose Peter had never returned, or when he did she had found him dead in the tree. Jane and even after he returned and recovered, how nearly they were removed from ever understanding each other. Joan. Oh, no, Jane. Once they came together, there could be no doubt of the understanding. As soon as Peter came back, I felt sure it would be all right. Joyce. And I, too, all along, was convinced the tale must end happily. Morden. Strange. So was I. For love, in his daily labors, is as swift in averting the nature of perils as he is deft in diverting the causes of misunderstanding. I know, in fact, of but one thing that would have foiled him. Four of the Milkmaids What then? Martin Had Helen not been given to dreams? Not a word was said in the apple orchard. Jocelyn, it would have done her no harm had she not been singer, nor would your story have suffered, being, like all stories, a thing as important as thistledown. In either event, though Peter had perished or misunderstood her forever, it would not have concerned me a whit, or even in both events. Jessica, nor me. Jane, nor me. Martin, then farewell my story. A thing as important as thistledown is as unimportantly dismissed, and yonder in heaven the moon sulks at us through a cloud with a quarter of her eye, 
reproaching us for our peace-destroying chatter. It destroys our own no less than hers. To dream is forbidden, but at least let us sleep. One by one the milkmaids settled in the grass, and covered their faces with their hands, and went to sleep. But Jennifer remained where she was. She sat with downcast eyes, softly drawing the grass-blade through and through her fingers, and the swing swayed a little, like a branch moving in an imperceptible wind, and her breast heaved a little, as though stirred with inaudible sighs. She sat so long like this that Martin knew she had forgotten he was beside her, and he quietly put out his hand to draw the grass-blade from hers. But before he had even touched it, he felt something fall upon his palm that was not rain or dew. "'Dear Mistress Jennifer,' said Martin gently, "'why do you weep?' She shook her head, since there are times when the voice plays a girl false and will not serve her. "'Is it,' said Martin, "'because the grass is not green enough?' She nodded. "'Pray, let me judge,' entreated Martin, and took the grass-blade from her fingers. Whereupon she put her face into her two hands, whispering, "'Master Pippin, Master Pippin, oh, Master Pippin!' "'Let me judge,' said Martin again, but in a whisper, too. Then Jennifer took her hands from her wet face, and looked at him with her wet eyes, and said, with great braveness and much faltering, "'I will be nineteen in November.' At this Martin looked very grave, and he got down from the tree, and walked to the end of the orchard full of thought. But when he turned there, he found that she had stolen after him, and was standing near him, hanging her head, yet watching him with deep anxiety. Jennifer. It is t too old, isn't it? Martin. Too old for what? Jennifer. I don't know. Martin. It is, of course, extremely old. There are things you will never be able to do again, because you are so old. Jennifer sobbed. Martin. You are too old to be rocked in a cradle. You are too old to write pothooks and hangers, and too old, alas, to steal pickles and jam when the house is abed. Yet there are still a few things you might do, if— Jennifer. Oh, if— Martin. If you could find a friend as old as yourself, or even a little older, to help you. Jennifer. But think how old he, the friend, would have to be. Martin. What would that matter? For all grass is green enough, if it is not near grass that looks greener. Jennifer. Oh, is this true? Martin. It is indeed. And I believe, too, that were your friend's hair red enough, and your friend's freckled nose snub enough, since youth resides long in these qualities, you might even, with such a companion, begin once more to steal pickles and jam by night, to learn your pothooks and hangers, and even in time to be rocked asleep by a cradle. Jennifer. Dear Master Pippin. Martin. They look quite green, don't they? And he laid the two blades side by side on her palm, and Jennifer, whose voice once more would not serve her, nodded and put the two blades in her pocket. Then Martin took out his handkerchief, and very carefully dried her eyes and cheeks, saying as he did so, Now that I have explained this to your satisfaction, won't you please explain something to mine? Jennifer I will if I can. Martin. Then explain what it is you have against men. Jennifer. I don't know how to tell you. It is so terrible. Martin. I will try to bear it. Jennifer. They say women cannot, cannot. Martin. Cannot? Jennifer. Keep secrets. Martin. Men say so? Jennifer. Yes. Martin. Men say so? 
Jennifer. They do, they do. Marden. Men, oh, Jupiter, if this were true. But it is not. These men would be blabbing the greatest of secrets in saying so. If I had a secret, but I have not, do you think I would trust it to a man? Not I. What does a man do with a secret? Forgets it, throws it behind him into some empty chamber of his brain, and lets the cobweb smother it. Buries it in some deserted corner of his heart, and lets the weeds grow over it. Is this keeping a secret? Would you keep a garden or a baby so? I will a thousand times sooner give my secret to a woman. She will tend it and cherish it, laugh and cry with it, dress it in a new dress every day, and dandle it in the world's eye for joy and pride in it. Nay, she will bid the whole world come into her nursery to admire the pretty secret she keeps so well. And under her charge, a little secret will grow into a big one, with a hundred charms and additions it had not when I confided it to her, so that I shall hardly know it again when I ask for it. So beautiful, so important, so mysterious will it have become in the woman's care. Oh, believe me, Mistress Jennifer, it is women who keep secrets, and men who neglect them. Jennifer, if I had only thought of these things to say, but I am not clever at argument like men. Marden, I suspect these clever arguers. They can always find the right thing to say, even if they are in the wrong. Women are not to be blamed for washing their hands of them forever. Jennifer, I know, yet I cannot help wondering who bakes them gingerbread for Sunday. Marden, let them go without. They do not deserve gingerbread. Jennifer, I know, I know, but they like it so much, and it is nice making it, too. Marden, then I suppose it will have to be made till the last of Sundays. What a bother it all is. Jennifer, I know. Good night, dear Master Pippin. Marden, dear milkmaid, good night. There lie your fellows, careless of the color of the grass they lie on, and of the years that lie on them. They have forsworn the baking of cakes, the eating of which begets dreams, to which women are not given. Go lie with them, and be, if you can, as careless and dreamless as they are. And then, seeing the tears refilling her eyes, he hastily pulled out his handkerchief again, and wiped them as they fell, saying, But if you cannot, if you cannot, don't cry so fast, if you cannot, then give me your key, dear Jennifer, please dry up, to Jillian's well-house, because you are glad that my tale ended gladly, and also because all lovers, no matter of what age, are green enough, and chiefly because my handkerchief sopping. Then Jennifer caught his hands in hers, and whispered, Oh, Martin, are they, all lovers, are they green enough? God help them, yes, said Martin Pippin. She dropped his hands, leaving her key in them, and looked up at him with wet lashes, but happiness behind them. So he stooped and kissed the last tears from her eyes, since his handkerchief had become quite useless for the purpose. And she stole back to her place, and he lay down in his, and Jennifer dreamed that she was baking gingerbread, and Martin that he was eating it. Maids, maids, maids! It was old Gilman on the heels of dawn. A pest on him and all farmers, groaned Marden, who would harvest men's slumbers as soon as they're sown. Get into hiding, commanded Jocelyn. I will not budge, said Marden. I am going to sleep again, for at that moment I had a lion in one hand and a unicorn in the other. "'Will you conceal yourself?' whispered Jocelyn, with as much fury as a whisper can compass. And the lion had comfits in his crown, and the unicorn a gilded horn, and both were so sticky and spicy and sweet. Jocelyn flung herself upon her knees before him, spreading her yellow skirts which barely concealed him, as old Gilman thrust his head through the hawthorn gap. "'Good morrow, maids!' he grunted. 
that i knew not dear mistress jocelyn murmured martin which to bite first good morrow master cried the milkmaids loudly and they fluttered their petticoats like sunshine between the man at the hedge and the man in the grass is my daughter any merrier this morning no master said jennifer yet i think i see smiles on their way if they lag much longer muttered the farmer they'll be on the wrong side of her mouth when they do come for what sort of a home will she return to a pothouse and what sort of a father a drunkard and the fault's hers that deprives him of the drink he loved in his sober days jillian he exclaimed when will ye give up this child's whim to learn by experience and take an old man's word for it but Jillian was as deaf to him as to the cock crowing in the barnyard. "'Come fetch your portion,' said old Gilman to the milkmaids, "'since there's no help for it. And good day to ye, and a better morrow.' "'Wait a bit, master,' entreated Jennifer, "'and tell me if Daisy, my Lincoln Red, lacks for anything.' "'For nothing that Tom can help her to, maid. But she lacks you, and lacking you her milk.' so that being a cow she may be said to lack everything and so do i and the men and the farm ruins our portion nothing but rack and ruin saying which he departed to breakfast said martin cheerfully suppose you'd been seen scolded jocelyn then our tales would have been at an end said martin would this have distressed you the sooner they're ended the better said jocelyn if you can do nothing but babble of sticky unicorns it was fresh from the oven explained martin meekly i wish we could have gingerbread for breakfast instead of bread do not be sure said jocelyn severely that you will get even bread i am in your hands said martin but please be kinder to the ducks jocelyn all of a fluster then put new bread in the place of Jillian's old. But her annoyance was turned to pleasure when she discovered that the little round top of yesterday's loaf had entirely disappeared. "'Upon my word,' cried she, "'the cure is taking effect.' "'I believe you are right,' said Martin. "'How sorry the ducks will be!' They quickly fed the ducks, and then themselves, and Martin received his usual share jocelyn having so far relented that she even advised him as to the best tree for apples in the whole orchard after breakfast martin found six pairs of eyes fixed so earnestly upon him that he began to laugh why do you laugh asked little joan because of my thoughts said he so she took a new penny from her pocket and gave it to him i was thinking said martin how strange it is that girls are also exactly alike oh cried six different voices in a single key of indignation what a fib said joyce i am like nobody but me nor am i cried all the others in a breath yet a moment ago said martin you mistress joyce were wondering with all your might what diversion i had hit upon for this morning and so were Jane, and Jessica, and Jennifer, and Joan, and Jocelyn. "'I was not!' cried six voices at once. "'What? None of you?' said Martin. "'Did I not say so?' And they were very provoked, not knowing what to answer, for fear it might be on the tip of her neighbor's tongue. So they said nothing at all, and with one accord tossed their heads and turned their backs on him. And Martin laughed, leaving them to guess why. On which, greatly put out, every girl stamped her foot, and Martin laughed more than ever. So without even consulting one another, they decided to have nothing further to do with him, and each girl went and sat under a different apple tree and began to do her hair. Hey ho said Martin, then this morning I must divert myself. And he began to spin his golden penny in the sun sometimes spinning it very dexterously from his elbow and never letting it fall but the girls wouldn't look or if they did it was through stray bits of their hair when they could not be suspected of looking 
I shall certainly lose this penny, communed Martin with himself quite audibly, if somebody does not lend me a purse to keep it in. But nobody offered him one, so he plucked a blade of shepherd's purse from the grass, soliloquizing, Now had I been a shepherd, or had the shepherd's name been Martin, here was my purse to my hand, and then, having saved my riches, I might have got married. Yet I never was a shepherd, nor ever knew a shepherd of my name, and a penny is in any case a great deal too much money for a man to marry on, be he a shepherd or no, for it is always best to marry on next to nothing, from which a penny is three times removed. Then he went on spinning his penny in the air again, humming to himself a song of no value, which, so far as the girls could tell for the hair over their ears, went as follows. If I should be so lucky as a farthing for to find, I wouldn't spend the farthing according to my mind, but I'd beat it and I'd bend it and I'd break it into two, and give one half to a shepherd and the other half to you. And as for both your fortunes, I'd wish you nothing worse than that your half and his half should lie in the shepherd's purse. At the end of the song he spun the penny so high that it fell into the well-house, and endeavouring to catch it he flung the spire of wildflower after it, and so lost both. And nobody took the least notice of his song or his loss. Then Martin said, Who cares? and took a new clay pipe and a little packet from his pocket, and he wandered about the orchard till he had found an old tin pannikin, and he scooped up some water from the duck-pond, and made a lather in it with the soap in the packet, and sat on the gate and blew bubbles. The first bubble in the pipe was always crystal, and sometimes had a jewel hanging from it which made it fall to the earth, and the second was tinged with colour, and the third gleamed like sunset, or like peacock's wings, or rainbows, or opals. All the colours of earth and heaven chased each other on their surfaces, in all the swift and changing shapes that tobacco smoke plays at on the air. But of all their colours they would take the deepest glow of one or two. And now Marden would blow a world of flame and orange through the trees, or one of blue and gold, or another of green and rose. And as he might have watched his dreams, he watched the bubbles float away, and break. But one of the loveliest at last sailed over the well-house and between the ropes of the swing, and among the fruit-laden boughs, miraculously escaping all perils, and over the hedge where a small wind bore it up and up out of sight. And Martin, who had been looking after it with a rapt gaze, sighed, Oh! And six other, Oh's! echoed his. Then he looked up, and saw the six milkmaids standing quite close to him, full of hesitation and longing. So he took six more pipes from his pockets, and soon the air was glistening with bubbles, big and little. Sometimes they blew the bubbles very quickly, shaking the tiny globes as fast as they could from the bowl, till the air was filled with a treasure of opals and diamonds and moonstones and pearls, as though the king of the east had emptied his casket there and sometimes they blew steadily and with care, endeavouring to create the best and biggest bubble of all. But generally they blew an instant too long, and the bubble burst before it left the pipe. Whenever a great sphere was launched, the blower cried in ecstasy, "'Oh, look at mine!' And her comrades, merely glancing, cried in equal ecstasy, "'Yes, but see mine!' And each had a moment's delight in the other's bubbles, but everlasting joy in her own, and was secretly certain that of all the bubbles hers was the biggest and brightest. The biggest and brightest of all was really blown by little Joan, as Marden in a whisper assured her. He whispered the same thing, however, to each of her friends, and for one truth told five lies. Sometimes they played together, taking their bubbles delicately from one pipe to another, and sometimes blew their bubbles side by side till they united, and made their venture into the world like man and wife. And often they put all their pipes at once into the pannikin, and blew in the water, rearing a great palace of crystal hemispheres, that rose until it hit their chins and cheeks and the tips of their noses, and broke on them, 
leaving on their fair skin a trace of glistening foam. And as the six laughing faces bent over the pannikin on his knees, Martin observed that Jocelyn's hair was coiled like two great lovely roses over her ears, and that Joyce's was in clusters of ringlets, and that Jane's was folded close and smooth and shining round her small head, and that Jessica's was tucked under like a boy's, while Jennifer's lay in a soft knot on her neck. But little Jones was hanging still in its plates over her shoulders, and one thick plate was half undone, and the loose hair got in her own and everybody's way, and was such a nuisance that Marden was obliged at last to gather it in his hand, and hold it aside for the sake of the bubble-blowers. And when they lifted their heads he was looking at them so gravely that Joyce laughed, and Jessica's eyes were a question, and Jane looked demure, and Jennifer astonished, and Jocelyn extremely composed and indifferent, and little Joan blushed. To cover her blushing, she offered him another penny. "'I was thinking,' said Marden, "'how strange it is that girls are so absolutely different.' Then six demure shadows appeared at the very corners of their mouths, and they rose from their knees and said with one accord, "'It must be dinner-time.' And it was. "'Bread is a good thing,' said Marden twirling a buttercup as he swallowed his last crumb. But I also like butter. Do not you, Mistress Jocelyn? It depends on who makes it, said she. There is butter and butter. I believe, said Marden, that you do not like butter at all. I do not like other people's butter, said Jocelyn. Let us be sure, said Marden. And he twirled his buttercup under her chin. "'Fie, Mistress Jocelyn!' he cried. "'What a golden chin! "'I never saw anyone so fond of butter in all my days.' "'Is it fairy gold?' asked Jocelyn, and ran to the duck-pond to look, but couldn't see, because she was on the wrong side of the gate. "'Do I like butter?' cried Jessica. "'Do I? Do I? Do I? Oh, do I?' cried Jennifer, Joyce, Jane, and Joan. "'We'll soon find out,' said Marden, and put buttercups under all their chins, turn by turn. And they all liked butter exceedingly. "'Do you like butter, Master Pippin?' asked little Joan. "'Try me,' said he. And six buttercups were simultaneously presented to his chin, and it was discovered that he liked butter the best of them all. Then every girl had to prove it on every other girl, and again on Marden one at a time, and he on them again. And in this delicious pastime, the afternoon wore by, and evening fell, and they came golden-chinned to supper. Supper was scarcely ended, indeed her mouth was still full, when Jessica, looking straight at Marden, said, I'm dying to swing. I never saved a lady's life easier said Marden, and in one moment she found herself where she wished to be, and in the next saw him close beside her on the apple-bough. The five other girls went to their own branches as naturally as hens to the roost. Jocelyn inspected them like a captain marshalling his men, and when each was armed with an apple, she said, "'We are ready now, Master Pippin.' "'I wish I were, too,' said he but my tail has taken a fit of the shivers on the threshold, like an unexpected guest who doubts his welcome. "'Are we not all bidding it in?' said Jocelyn impatiently. "'Yes, like sweet daughters of the house,' said Marden. "'But what of the mistress?' And he looked across at Gillian by the well, but she looked only into the grass and her thoughts. "'Let the daughters do to begin with.' said Jocelyn, and make it your business to stay till the mistress shall appear. That might be to outstay my welcome, said Marden, and then her appearance would be my discomfiture. For a hostess has, according to her guests, as many kinds of face as a wild flower, according to its counties, names. Some kinds have only one name, said Jessica, 
plucking a stalk crowned with flowers as fine as spray. What would you call this but cow parsley? If I were in Anglia, said Marden, I would call it Queen's Lace. That's a pretty name, said Jessica. Pretty enough to sing about, said Marden, and looking carelessly at the well-house, he thrummed his lute and sang. The queen netted lace on the first April day. The queen wore her lace in the first week of May. The queen soiled her lace ere May was out again, so the queen washed her lace in the first June rain. The queen bleached her lace on the first of July. She spread it in the orchard and left it there to dry. But on the first of August it wasn't in its place, because my sweetheart picked it up and hung it o'er her face. She laughed at me, she blushed at me, with such a pretty grace, that I kissed her in September through the queen's own lace. At the end of the song, Jillian sat up in the grass, and looked with all her heart over the duck pond. Jocelyn I find your song singularly lacking in point, singer. Martin You surprise me, Mistress Jocelyn. The kiss was the point. Jocelyn It is like you to think so. It is just like you to think ah, ah, ah. Martin Kiss? Jocelyn Sufficient conclusion to any circumstances. Martin Isn't it? Jocelyn My goodness, you might as soon ask, is a pear drop sufficient for a body's dinner? Martin It would suffice me. I love pear drops, but then I am a man. Women doubtless need more substance, being in themselves more insubstantial. Now as to your quarrel with my song. Jocelyn It is of no consequence. You raise expectations which you do not fulfill, but it is not of the least consequence. Martin Dear Mistress Jocelyn, my only desire is to please you. We will not conclude on a kiss. You shall fulfill your own expectations. Jocelyn Mine? I have no expectations whatever. Martin But I have disappointed you. What shall I do with my sweetheart? Shall she be whipped for her theft? Shall she be shut in a dungeon? Shall she be thrown before elephants? Choose your conclusion. Joan But, Master Pippin, why must the poor sweetheart be punished? I am sure Jocelyn never wished her to be punished. There are other conclusions. Martin Dunderhead that I am, I can't think of any. What, Mistress Jocelyn? was the conclusion you expected. Jocelyn. I tell you, I expected none. Joan. Why, Master Pippin, I should have fancied that, seeing the dear sweetheart had hung the veil over her face, she might. Martin. Yes. Joan. Be expected. Martin. Yes. Joan. To be about to be. Jocelyn, I am sick to death of this silly sweetheart, and since our mistress appears to be listening with both her ears, it would be more to the point to begin whatever story you propose to relate tonight and be done with it. Martin, you are always right. Therefore, add your ears to hers while I tell you the tale of Open Winkins. End of Third Interlude Section 15 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Open Winkins. There were once, dear maidens, five lords in the east of Sussex, who owned between them a single bird, for they were brothers. Their names were Lionel and Hugh and Harriet and Ambrose and Hob. Lionel was ten years of age, and Hob was twenty-one, there being exactly three years, all but a month, between the birthdays of the brothers. 
and Lionel had a merry spirit, and Hugh great courage and daring. And Harriet had beauty past any man's share, and Ambrose had a wise mind. But Hob had nothing at all for the world's praise, for he only had a loving heart, which he spent upon his brothers and his garden. And since love begets love, they all loved him dearly, and leaned heavily on his affection, though neither they nor any man looked up to him because he was a lord. Although he was the eldest, and in his quiet way administered the affairs of the burg, and of the people of Alfriston under the burg, it was Ambrose who was always thinking of new schemes for improvement, and Harriet who undertook the festivities. As for the younger boys, they kept the old place alive with their youth and spirits, and it was evident that later on Hugh would win honour to the burg in battle and adventure, and Lionel would draw the world thither with his charm. But Hob, to whom they all brought their shapeless dreams white-hot, since sympathy helps us to create bodies for the things which begin their existence as souls. Hob differed from the four others, not only in his name, but in his plain appearance and simple tastes. And all these things, as well as his tender heart, he got from his mother, who was the only daughter of a gardener in Alfriston. The gardener, to whom she was the very apple of his eye, had kept her privately in a place on a hill, fearing lest in her youth and inexperience she should fall to the lot of some man not worthy of her. For he knew, or believed, that a young girl of her sweetness and tenderness and devotedness of disposition would by her sweetness attract a lover too early, and by her tenderness respond to him too readily, and by her devotedness follow him too blindly, before she had time to know herself for men. And he also knew, or believed, that first love is as often a will-o'-the-wisp as the star for which all young things take it. Five days in the week he tended the gardens of Alfriston. The sixth he gave to the lord of the burg that lay among the hills, and the seventh he kept for his daughter, on the hill a few miles distant, which was afterwards known as Hobbs Hoth. She, on her part, spent her week in endeavouring to grow a perfect rose of a certain golden species, and her heart was given wholly to her father and her flower. And he watched her efforts with interest and advice, and for the first she thanked him, but of the second took no heed. For, said she, this is my garden father and my rose, and I will grow it in my own way, or not at all. Have you not had a lifetime of gardens and roses which you have brought to perfection? And would you let any man take your own upon his shoulders, even your own mistakes, and shoulder at last the praise after the blame? Then Hob, her father, laughed at her indulgently, and said, Nay, not any man. Yet once I led a woman, and without her aid, I would never have brought my rarest and dearest flower to perfection. So if I should let a woman help me, why not you a man? Was the woman your mother? said she. And her father was silent. Then a day came, when he trudged up and down the hills from Alfriston, and standing at the gate of her garden, saw his child in the arms of a stranger. And her face, as it lay against his heart, seemed to her father also to be the face of a stranger, and not of his child. He recognized in the stranger the lord of the burg, and he saw that what he had feared had come to pass, and that his daughter's heart would be no more divided between her father and her flower, for it was given whole to the lover who had first assailed it. Hob came into the garden, and they looked up as the gate clicked, and their faces grew as red as though one had caught the reflection from the other but both looked straight into his eyes. And his daughter, pointing to her bush, said, Father, my rose is grown at last. And he saw that the bush was crowned with a glorious golden bloom, perfect in every detail. Then it was the turn of the lord of the burg, and he said, Sir, I ask leave to rob your garden of its rose. Do robbers ask leave? said Hob and he shook his head, adding, Nay, when the thief and the theft are in collusion, what say is left to the owner of the treasure? Yet I do not like this. 
Sir, have you considered that she is a gardener's child? Daughter, have you considered that he is a lord? And neither of them had considered these questions, and they did not propose to do so. Then Hob shook his head again, and said, I will not waste words. I know when a plant can drink no more water. And though you pretend to ask my leave, I know that you are prepared to dispense with it. But by way of consent I will say this. Whatever you may call your other sons, you shall call your first Hob, to remind you to-morrow of what you will not consider to-day. For my daughter, when she is a lord's wife, will none the less still be a gardener's daughter, and your children will be grafted of two stocks. And if this seems to you a hard condition, then kiss and bid farewell. And they both laughed with joy at the lightness of the condition, but the gardener did not laugh. And so the lord of the burg married the gardener's daughter, and they called their first son Hob. He was born on the first of August, and thirty-five months later Ambrose was born on the first of July, and in due course Harriet in June, and Hugh in May, and Lionel in April. And the Lord, loving his sons equally, made them equal possessors of the burg when in time it should pass out of his hands, which, since men are mortal, presently came to pass, and there were five lords instead of one. It happened on a roaring night of March, when the wind was blustering over the barren ocean of the East Downs, and Lionel was still a boy of ten, but soon to be eleven, that the five brothers sat clustered about the great hearth in the hall, roasting apples and talking of this and that. But their talk was fitful, and had long pauses in which they listened to the gusty night, which had so much more to say than they. And after one of the silences, Lionel shuddered slightly, and drawing his little stool close to Hob, he said, It sounds like witches. Hob put his big hand round the child's head and face, and Lionel pressed his cheek against his brother's knee. Or lions, said Hugh, jumping up and running to the window, where he flattened his nose to stare into the night. I wish it were lions coming over the downs. What would you do with them? said Hob, smiling broadly. Fight them, said Hugh, and chain them up. I should like to have lions instead of dogs, a red lion and a white one. I never heard tell of lions of those colors, said Hob, but perhaps Ambrose has with all his reading. Not I, said Ambrose, but I haven't read half the books yet. The wind still knows more than I and it may be that he knows where red and white lions are to be found, for he knows everything. And has seen everything, murmured Harriet, watching a lovely flame of blue and green that flickered among the red and gold on the hearth. And has been everywhere, muttered Hugh. If I could find and catch him, I'd ask him for a red and a white lion. I'd rather have peacocks, said Harriet, his eyes on the fire. What would you choose, Ambrose? asked Hob. Nothing, said he, but it's the hardest of all things to have, and I doubt if I'd get it. But what business have we to be choosing presents? That is Lionel's right before ours, for isn't his birthday next month? What will you ask of the wind for your birthday, Law? Then Lionel, who was getting very drowsy, smiled a sleepy smile, and said, I'd like a farm of my own in the Downs, a very little farm, with pink pigs and black cocks, and white donkeys and chestnut horses no bigger than grasshoppers and mice, and a very little well, as big as my mug, to draw up my water from, and a little green paddock the size of my pocket handkerchief, and another of yellow corn, and another of crimson trefoil. And I would have a blue farm wagon no larger than Hob's shoe, and a haystack half as big as a seed cake and a duck-pond that I could cover with my platter. And I'd live there and play with it all day long, if only I knew where the wind lives, and could ask him how to get it. Don't start till tomorrow, jested Ambrose. Tonight you're too sleepy to find the way. Then he turned to his book, and Hugh was still at the window, and Harriet gazing into the fire. And as he felt the child's head droop in his hand, Hob picked him up in his arms and carried him to bed.
and he alone of all those brothers had made no choice, nor had they thought to ask him, so accustomed were they to see him jog along without the desires that lead men to their goals, such as Ambrose's thirst for knowledge, and Harriet's passion for beauty, and Hugh's lust for adventure, and Lionel's pursuit of delight. And yet, unknown to them all, he had a heartfelt wish, which among other things he had inherited from his mother. For on a height west of the burg he had made a garden, where, like her, he labored to produce a perfect golden rose. But so far luck was against him, though his height, which was therefore spoken of as the gardener's hill, bloomed with the loveliest flowers of all sorts imaginable. But year by year his rose was attacked by a special pest, the nature of which he had not succeeded in discovering. Yet his patience was inexhaustible, and his brothers, who sometimes came to his garden when they needed a listener for their achieved or unachieved ambitions, never suspected that he, too, had an ambition he had not realized, for they saw only a lovely garden of his creating, where wisdom, beauty, adventure, and delight were made equally welcome by the gardener. Now, on the March day following the night of the brothers' windy talk. But suddenly Marden, with a nimble movement, stood upright on his bow, and grasping that to which the swing was attached, shook it with such frenzy that a tempest seemed to pass through the tree, and the girl shrieked and clung to the trunk, and leaves and apples flew in all directions. And Jessica, between clutching at her ropes and letting go to ward off the cannonade of fruit, gasped in a tumult of laughter and indignation. Jessica. Have you gone mad, Master Pippin? Have you gone mad? Marden. Mad, Mistress Jessica, stark staring mad. March hares are pet rabbits to me. Jessica. Sit down this instant, do you hear? This instant. That's better. What fun it was. Ha! You thought you could shake me off, but you didn't. Are you still mad? Marden. Melancholy mad, since you will not let me rave. Jessica. You are the less dangerous, but I hate you to be melancholy. Marden. It is no one's fault but yours. How can I be jolly when my story upsets you? Jessica. How do you know it upsets me? Marden. You put out your tongue at me. Jessica. Did I? Marden. Yes, without reason. So what could I do but whistle mine to the winds? Jessica. You were too hasty, for I had my reason. Marden. If it was a good one, I'll whistle mine back again. Jessica. It was this, that no man in a love tale should be wiser or braver or more beautiful or more happy than the hero, or how can he be the hero? Yet I am sure Hob is the hero and none of the others, because he is the only one old enough to be married. Marden. Ambrose is nineteen and will very soon be twenty. Jessica. What's nineteen or even twenty in a man? Fie! A man's not a man till he comes of age, and the hero's not Ambrose for all his wisdom, though wisdom becomes a hero. Nor Harriet for all his beauty, though a hero should be beautiful. Nor Hugh, who will one day be brave enough for any hero, though now he's but a boy. Nor the happy Lionel, who is only a child. Yet I love a gay hero. It's none of these, full though they be of the qualities of heroes. And here is your hob, with nothing to show but a fondness for roses. Martin. You deserve to be stood in a corner for that nothing, Mistress Jessica. Your reason was such a bad one that I see I must return to sense, if only to teach you a little of it. Did I not say Hob had a loving heart? Jessica. But he was plain and simple and patient and contented. Are these things for a hero? Martin. Mistress Jessica, I will ask you a riddle. What is it? Oh, but first, I take it you love apple-trees? Jessica. Who doesn't? 
Martin. What is it, then, you love in an apple tree? Is it the dancing of the leaves in the wind? Is it the boldness of the boughs, or perhaps the loveliness of the flower in spring, or again the fruit that ripens of the flower amongst the leaves on the boughs? What is it you love in an apple tree? Jessica. All riddles are traps. I must consider before I answer. Martin. You shall consider until the conclusion of my story, and not till you are satisfied that many things can be contained in one will I require your solution. And as for traps, it is always the solver of riddles who lays his own trap, by looking all round the question and never straight at it. Put on your thinking cap, I beg, while I go on babbling. On the March day following the brothers' talk, continued Martin, Lionel was missing. It was some time before his absence was noticed, for Hob was in his distant garden, and Ambrose among his books, and Harriet had ridden north to the market town to buy stuff for a jerkin, and Hugh had run south to the sea to watch the ships. So Lionel was left to his own devices, and what they were none tried to guess till evening, when the brothers met again, and he was not there. Then there was hue and cry among the hills, but to no purpose. The child had vanished like a cloud, and the month wore by, and their hearts grew heavier day by day. It was in the last week of March that Hugh one morning came red-eyed to his brothers, and said, I am going away, and I will not come back until I have found Lionel, for I can't rest. None of us can do that, said Ambrose, and we have searched and sent messengers everywhere. You are too young to go alone. I am nearly fourteen, said Hugh, and stronger than Harriet, and even than you, Ambrose, and I can take care of myself, and Lionel too. There are more ways than one to seek, and I'll go my way while you go yours, but I will find him or die. And he looked with defiance at Ambrose, and then turned to Hob, and said doggedly, I'm going, Hob. Hob, who himself sought the hills unwearyingly day after day, and then sat up three parts of the night attending to the duties of the burg, said, Go, and God bless you. And Hugh's mouth grew less set, and he kissed his brothers, and put his knife in his belt, and took food in his wallet, and walked out of the burg. He followed the grass track to the north, and had walked less than half an hour when the wind took his cap and blew it into the middle of a pond, where it lay soddening out of reach. So he took off his shoes and walked into the pond to fetch it out, stirring up the yellow mud in thick soft clouds. But as he stooped to grab his cap, something else stirred the mud in the middle, and a body heaved itself sluggishly into view. At first Hugh thought it must be the body of a sheep that had tumbled into the water, but to his amazement the sulky head of an old man appeared. He was barely distinguishable from the mud out of which he had risen. "'Drat the boys!' said the muddy man. "'Will they never be done with disturbing the newts and me? Drat em, I say!' "'Who are you?' demanded Hugh, staring with all his might. "'Jerry, I am, and this is my pond. Why can't you leave me in peace?' "'The wind took my cap.' said Hugh. Findings keepings, said the muddy man, taking the cap himself, and wind falls on this water is mine, so I'll keep your cap and as the second wind's brought me this march, and if you're in want of another you'd best go to where wind lives and ask him for it like the other one. But he said he'd ask for a toy farm instead. A toy farm? shouted Hugh. Go away and don't deafen a body, said Jerry and prepared to sink again. But Hugh caught him by the hair, and said fiercely, Keep my cap if you like, but I won't let you go until you tell me where my brother went. Your brother, was it? growled the muddy man. He went to high and over, dancing like a sunbeam. What's high and over? Where wind lives. Where's that? Find out, mumbled the muddy man and he wriggled himself out of Hugh's clutch, and buried himself like a monstrous newt in the mud. And though Hugh groped and fumbled shoulder-deep, he could not feel a trace of him. 
But, said he, there's at least a name to go on. And he got out of the pond, and went in search of high and over. And his brothers waited in vain for his return. And the heaviness of four hearts was now divided between three, and doubled because of another brother lost. But on the first of April, which was Lionel's birthday, Lionel came back. Or rather, Hob found him in a valley north of his garden hill, when he was wandering on one of his forlorn searches. And when he found him, Hob could not believe his eyes, for the child was sitting in the middle of the prettiest plaything in the world. It was a tiny farm, covering perhaps a quarter of an acre, with minute barns and yards and stables and pygmy livestock in the little pastures, and hand-high crops in the little meadows, and smoke came from the tiny chimney of the farmhouse. And Lionel was drawing water from a well in a bucket the size of a thimble. And all the colors were so bright and painted that the little farmstead seemed to have been conceived of the gayest mind on earth. But through his amazement, Hob had no thought except for the child, and he ran calling him by his name. But Lionel never looked up. And then Hob lifted him in his arms and embraced him closely. But the child did not respond. Then Hob looked at him anxiously, and was so shocked that he forgot the strange, blithe little farm entirely. For Lionel was as wan and wasted as though he had been through a fever, and his rosy face was white, and his merry eyes were melancholy. And suddenly, as Hob clasped him, he flung his arms round his big brother's neck, and buried his face in his bosom, and wept bitterly. Then Hob tried to soothe and comfort him, asking him little questions in a coaxing voice. Where has the child been? Why did he run away and leave us? Where did he get this pretty, wonderful toy? Is he hurt or hungry? Does he remember it is his birthday? There will be presents for him at the Burg, and a cake for tea. Did Hugh bring him home? Has he seen Hugh? Lol, lol, where is Hugh? But Lionel answered none of these questions. He only sobbed and sobbed, and suddenly slipped out of Hob's arms, and began to play once more with his farm, while the tears ran down his thin cheeks. Presently he let Hob take him home, and there Harriet and Ambrose rejoiced and sorrowed over him, for he would scarcely speak or eat, and only shook his head at their questions. At Hugh's name his tears flowed twice as fast, but he would tell them nothing of him. Very soon Hob carried him to bed, and in undressing him noticed that he had no shirt. This, too, Lionel would not explain, and Hob ceased troubling him with talk, and knelt and prayed by him, and laid him down to sleep, hoping that in the morning he would be better. But morning brought no change. Lionel from that day was given up to grief. Each morning he went dejectedly to play with his marvellous toy in the valley, but how he came by it he would not say. Towards the end of April Harriet came to Hob and Ambrose, and said, I cannot bear this. Lionel is home, and we are none the better for it. And Hugh is gone, and we are all the worse. Hugh is capable of looking after himself, yet perhaps danger has befallen him. And even if not, he will roam the country fruitlessly for months, and it may be years, since Lionel is restored, and he does not know it. The bird can spare me better than it can you, and I will ride abroad and see if I can find him and return in seven days, whether or no. So they embraced him, and he departed. But at the end of seven days he did not appear, and Ambrose and Hob were dismayed at his vanishing like the others, and so heavy a gloom descended on the burg that each could scarcely have endured it without the other. And every day they went forth in search of Hugh and Harriet, or traces of them, but found none. Then it happened that on the first of May, which was Hugh's birthday, Hob, wandering further north than usual, to the brow of the great ridge east of the Ouse, heard a wild roaring and bellowing on the downs. Or rather, it was two separate roarings, 
as you may sometimes hear two separate storms thundering at once over two ranges of hills. And in astonishment he went first to Beddingham, and there, bound by an iron chain to a stake beside a pond, he found a mighty lion as white as a young lamb. But he had not a lamb's meekness, for he ramped and raved in a great circle around the stake, and his open throat set in his shaggy mane looked like the red sun seen upon white mist. Hob rubbed his eyes and turned towards Ilford, where the second roaring sought to outdo the first. And there, beside another pond, he found another stake and chain, and a lion exactly similar, except that he was as red as a rose. But he had not a rose's sweetness, for he snarled and leaped with fury at the end of his chain, and his flashing teeth under his red muzzle looked like the blossom of the scarlet runner. And then, turning about for an explanation of these wonders, Hob saw what drove them from his mind. The figure of Hugh crouched in a little hollow and shaking like a leaf. Hob ran towards him with a shout, and at the shout Hugh leaped to his feet with the eyes of a hunted hare and looked on all sides as though seeking where to hide. But Hob was soon beside him, with his arm round the boy's shoulder and gazing earnestly into his face. "'Why, lad,' said he, "'do you not know me again?' Hugh stole a glance at him, and suddenly smiled and nodded, and tried to answer, but could not for the chattering of his teeth, and he clung hard to his brother's side, and shuddered from head to foot. "'Are you ill, Hugh?' Hob asked him, bewildered at the boy's unlikeness to himself. "'No, Hob,' said Hugh, "'but need we stay here now?' "'Why, no,' said Hob gently. "'We will go when you like. "'Where do these beasts come from?' Hugh set his lips and began to move away. Hob went beside him and said, "'Lionel is home, but Harriet is lost. "'Have you seen Harriet?' Hugh hesitated and then stammered, "'No, I have not seen him.' And Hob knew that he had lied. Hugh, who had always been as fearless of the truth as of anything else. So after that he asked no more, fearing to get another lie for an answer. And he led Hugh home, supporting him with his arm, for he was full of fits and starts and shiverings. If a lump of chalk rolled under his shoe, he blanched and cried, What's that? And once when a field mouse ran across the path, he swooned. Then Hob, opening his tunic at the neck, saw that nothing was between it and his body, for he, like Lionel, was without his shirt. They got back to the burg, and Hob found Ambrose and told him how it was. And Ambrose came to Hugh and talked with him, and turned away with knitted brows, for here was a puzzle not dealt with in his books. And May went by in miserable fashion with Lionel spending the days in playing mournfully beside his farm, and Hugh in cowering abjectly between his lions. And sometimes Ambrose and Hob, after searching for Harriet or news of him, or spending their spirits in endeavouring to harden their two brothers, or to elicit from them something that should give them the key to the mystery, would meet in Hob's hill garden, where seemed to be the only peace and loveliness left upon earth and Hob would weed and tend his neglected flowers, and they bloomed for him as though they knew he loved them, as indeed they did. Only his golden rose-tree would not flourish, but this small sorrow was unguessed by Ambrose. One evening, as they sat in the garden in the last week of May, Ambrose said to his brother, I have been thinking, Hob, that at all costs Harriet must be found, and not for his own sake only. He is younger than we, and nearer in spirit to the boys, and he may be able to help them as we cannot. For if this goes on, he will die of his fears, and Lionel of his melancholy. You must stay and administer our affairs as usual, and look after the boys, and I will go further afield in search of Harriet. Hob was silent for a moment, and then he sighed and said, no good has come of these seekings. Our lads returned of themselves, as Harriet may, 
and their return was worse than anything we feared of their absence, as if he come back, I pray Harriet's will not be, and for you, Ambrose. But then he paused, not saying what was in his mind. And Ambrose said, Do not be afraid for me. These boys are young, and I am older than my years. And though I cannot face danger with a stouter heart than our brothers, I can perhaps see into it a little further than they. And foresight is sometimes a still better tool than courage. Then he took Cobb's hand in his, and they gripped with the grip of men who love each other, and Ambrose went out of the garden, and Hobb was left alone, for Hugh and Lionel were companions to none but themselves. But on the first of June, Hobb, coming to the gate of his garden, saw with surprise a peacock strutting on the hill-brow, his fan spread in the sun, a luster of green and blue and gold, and behind him was another, and further south three more. So Hob went out to look at them, and found not five but fifty peacocks sweeping the downs with their heavy trains, or opening and shutting them like gigantic magical flowers. Following the throng of birds, he came shortly to a barn already known to him, but he had never seen it as he saw it now. For the roof was crowded with peacocks, and peacocks strayed in flocks within and without, and sitting in the doorway was Harriet, the sight of whom so overjoyed his brother that Hob forgot the thousand peacocks in the one man. And he made speed to greet him, but within a few yards halted full of doubt. For was this Harriet? He had Harriet's air and attitude, yet the grace was gone from his body. And Harriet's features, surely, but the beauty had melted away like morning dew and his dress, which had always been orderly and beautiful, was neglected, so that under the half-laced jerkin Hob saw that he was shirtless. Yet after the first moment's shock he knew this gaunt and ugly youth was Harriet, and Harriet, seeing his coming, hung his head, and made a shamed movement of retreat into the shadow of the barn. But Hob hurried to him, and took him by the shoulders, and beheld him with the eyes of love, which always find his object beautiful. Then the flush faded from Harriet's haggard cheeks, and he looked as full at Hob as Hob at him. And as at the steadfast meeting of eyes, men see no longer the physical appearance, but for an eternal instance the appearance of the soul, these brothers knew that they were to each other what they had always been. And Harriet saw that Hob was full of questions, and he laid his hand over Hob's mouth and said, Hob, do not ask me anything, for I can tell you nothing. Neither of yourself nor of Ambrose, said Hob. Nothing, repeated Harriet. So Hob left his questions unspoken, and as they went home together, told Harriet of Hugh's return, and what had happened to him. And Harriet heard it without comment. And in the evening, when Lionel and Hugh returned, they had nothing to say to Harriet, nor he to them. And it seemed to Hob that this was because, between these three, everything was understood. End of Part 1 of Open Winkins Section 16 of Martin Pippin in the Apple Orchard by Eleanor Farshan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Open Winkins continued. It was a lonely June for Hob, with his eldest brother away, and the three others spending all their days beside their strange possessions, which brought them no tittle of joy and had it not been for his garden, he would have felt utterly bereft. Yet here, too, failure sat heavily on his heart. For on many a night he saw upon his bush a bud that promised perfection to come, and in the morning it hung dead and rotten on its stem. So the month wore on, and Hob began to feel that the burg, where now his brothers only came to sleep, was a dead shell, too desolate to inhabit if Ambrose did not soon return and he was impelled to go in search of him, 
yet decided to remain until Ambrose's birthday had dawned, for had not their birthdays brought his three youngest brothers home? And it might be so with Ambrose. And so it was. For on the first of July, before going to his garden, he stayed at Harriet's barn to try to induce him to leave his peacocks for once, and spend the day with him in search of Ambrose. But Harriet, who was feeding his fowl, never looked up, and said sadly, "'What need to seek Ambrose to-day? Ambrose has returned.' "'Have you seen him?' cried Hob joyfully. "'Early this morning,' said Harriet. "'Where?' "'Down yonder, in Poverty Bottom,' said Harriet, pointing south of his barn to a hollow that went by that name. For there was a dismal habitation that had fallen into decay, a skeleton of a hut with only two rotting walls, and a riddled thatch for a roof. And it was worse than no habitation at all, for what might have been a green and lovely vale was made desolate and rank with disused things, rusting among the lumber of bricks and nettles. It was enough to have been there once, never to go again. And Hob had been there once. But now, at Harriet's tidings, he ran down the hill a second time, as though it led to paradise, calling Ambrose as he went. And getting no answer, he began to fear that either Harriet was mistaken, or Ambrose had gone away. His fears were unfounded, for coming to the bottom he found Ambrose. Yet he had to look twice to make sure it was he. For he was dressed only in rags, and less in rags than nakedness, and his skin was dirty and his hair unkempt. He was stooping about the ground gathering flints which he dropped into a battered pail he had found among the litter. But as the pail had no bottom, the flints dropped through, and a small trail of them marked his passage over the rank grass. Hobbs strode towards him with dread in his bosom, and laid his hand on Ambrose's wild head, saying his name again. And at this his brother looked up, and eyed him childishly, and said, Who is Ambrose? And then the dread in Hob took a definite shape, and he saw with horror that Ambrose had lost his wits. At that knowledge, and the sight of his neglected body and pitiful, foolish smile, Hob turned away and sobbed. But Ambrose, with a little random laugh, continued to drop flints in his bottomless bucket, and no word of Hobbs could win him from that place. Then Hobb went back to the burg alone, and buried his face in his hands, and thought. He thought of the evil which had fallen upon his house, the nature of which was past his brother's telling, and far beyond his guessing. And he said to himself, I have done the best I could in governing the affairs of the burg and of our people since the others were younger than I, but I see I have been selfish, keeping safety for my portion while they went into danger. And now there is none to set this evil right but I, and if I can I must follow the way they went, and do better than they at the end of it. And if I fail, as how should I succeed where they have not? And if, like them, I too must suffer the dreadful loss of a part of myself, let it be so, and I shall at least fare as they have fared, and we will share an equal fate. Though what I have to lose I know not to match their bright and noble qualities. Then he called his steward, and gave all the affairs of the burg into his hands, and bade him have an eye to his brothers as far as possible, and to consult Harriet in any need, since he was the only one who could in the least be relied on. And then he walked out of the burg as he was, and went where his feet took him. He had not been walking half an hour, when a sudden blast of wind tore the cap from his head, and blew it into the very middle of a pond. Now the pond was exceedingly muddy, and as it seemed to hob rather deep, and he was wondering whether his old cap were worth waiting for, and had almost decided to abandon it, when he saw a skinny yellow arm, like a frog's leg, stretch up through the water, and a hand that dripped with slime grope for his cap. With three strides he was in the pond, and he caught the cap and the hand together in his fist. The hand writhed in his, but Hob was too strong for it, 
and with a mighty tug he dragged first the shoulder and then the head belonging to the hand into view. They were the shoulder and head of the muddy man whom you, dear maidens, have seen once before in this tale, but whom Hob had never seen till then. And Jerry said, Drat these losers of caps! Will they never be done with disturbing the newts and me? Tis the fifth in a summer, and first there's one with a step like a wagtail, and next there's one as bold as a hawk, and after him one as comely as a wild swan, and last one was as wise as an owl. And now there's this one, with nothing particular to him, but he grips as hard as all the rest rolled into one. Drat these cap losers! Then Hob, who for all his surprise to begin with, and his increase of excitement as the muddy creature spoke, had never slackened his grasp, said, Old man, you are welcome to my cap, if you will tell me what happened to the wearers of the four other caps after they left you. How do I know what happened to him? growled the muddy man, for they all went to high and over, and after that twas nobody's business but wins who lives there. Where's high and over? said Hob. Find out, said the muddy man, and gave a wriggle that did him no good. I will, said Hob, for you shall tell me. And he looked so sternly at the muddy man that Jerry cringed, moaning, I thought by his voice twas a turtle, but I see by his eye tis an eagle. If you must know, you must. And south of Cradle Hill, that south of Pincham, that south of Hobbs Hoth, that south of the Burg, that south of this pond, is where High and Over is. And I'll thank you to let me go. Nevertheless, when Hob released him, Jerry forgot the thanks, and disappeared into the mud, taking the cap with him. But Hob did not care for his thanks. He hurried south as fast as his feet would carry him, going by the places he knew, and then by those he did not, till he came at nightfall to High and Over. And on High and Over a great wind was blowing from all the four quarters of heaven at once, and Hob was caught up in the crossways of the wind, and turned about and about till he was dizzy, and all his thoughts were churning in his brain, so that he could not tell one from the other. And at the very crisis of the churning, a voice in the wind from the north roared in his ear, What do you want that you lack? And a voice from the south murmured, What is the wish of your heart? And a voice from the west sighed, what is it that life has not given you? And a voice from the east shrieked, What will you have and lose yourself to have? And Hob forgot his brothers and why he was there. He forgot everything but the dream of his soul, which had been churned uppermost in that turmoil. And he cried aloud, A golden rose! Then the four voices together roared and murmured and sighed and shrieked, Open Winkins! Open Winkins! Open Winkins! Open Winkins! And the tumult ceased with a shock, and the shock of silence overwhelmed Hob with sickness and darkness, and his senses deserted him. As he became unconscious, he seemed to be not falling to earth, but rising in the air. When he opened his eyes, he was lying on his back in a strange world, a world of trees whose noble trunks rose up as though they were columns of the sky, but their heaven was a green one, shutting out daylight, yet enclosing a luminous haunted air of its own. Such forests were unknown in Hobbes' open, barren land, and this alone would have made his coming to his senses appear rather to be a coming away from them. But he scarcely noticed his surroundings, he was only vaguely aware of them, as the strange and beautiful setting of the strangest and most beautiful thing he had ever seen. For he was looking into the eyes of the loveliest woman in the world. She was bending above him, tall and slim and supple, her perfect body clad in a deep black gown, the hem and bosom of which were embroidered with celandines, and it had a golden belt and was lined with gold, as he could see when the loose sleeves fell open on her round and slender arms. And the bodice of her gown hung a little away from her stooping body, and was embroidered inside as well as outside with celandines, which made reflections on her white neck, 
as they will on a pure pool, where they lean to watch their April loveliness. Her skin was as creamy as the petals of a burnet rose, and her eyes were the color of peat smoke, and her hair was as soft as spun silk, and fell in two great shining waves of the purest gold over her bosom as she bent above him, and lay on the earth like golden grass on green water. A tress of the hair had flowed across his hand, and about her small fine head it was bound with a black fillet, a narrow coil so sleek and glossy that it was touched with silver lights, and this intense blackness made the gold of her head more dazzling. And Hob lay there bewildered under the spell of her loveliness, asking nothing but to lie and gaze at it forever. But presently, as he did not move, she did, sinking upon her knees, and stooping closer so that her breast nearly rested on his own, and she put her white hand softly on his forehead, and the smoke of her eyes was washed with tears that did not fall, and she said in a tremulous voice that fell on his ears like music heard in a dream, O oh, stranger, if you are not dying, speak and move. Then Hob raised himself slowly on his elbow, and as she did not stir, their faces were brought very close together, and not for an instant had they taken their eyes from each other. And he said in a low voice, not knowing either his voice or his own words, I am not dying, but I think I must be dead. And suddenly the woman broke into a rain of tears, and she sank into his arms with her own about his neck, and she wept upon his heart as though her own were breaking. After a few moments she lifted her head, and Hob bent his to meet her quivering mouth. But before his lips touched hers, she tore herself from his hold, and fled away through the trees. Hob leapt to his feet, and scarcely knowing what he said, cried, Love, don't be afraid! And he made no attempt to follow her, but stood where he was. He saw her halt in the distance, and turn and hesitate, and struggle with herself as to her coming or going. At last she decided for the former, and came slowly between the pillars of the trees, until she stood but a few paces from him with lowered lids. And she said sweetly, Forgive me, stranger, but I found you here like one dead, and when you opened your eyes the fear was still on me, and when you moved and spoke the relief was too great, and I forgot myself and did what I did. Then Hob said gently, but with his heart beating on his ribs as fast as a swallow's wings beat the air. I thought you did what you did, because at that moment you knew, and I knew also, that it was your right for ever to weep and to laugh on my heart, and mine to bear for ever your laughing and weeping. But if it was not with you as with me, say so, and I will go away and not trouble you or your strange woods again. Then the woman came quickly to him, and seized his hands, saying, half agitated, half commanding, It was with me as with you, and you shall stay with me for ever in these woods, and I will give you the desire of your life. And what shall I give you? said Hob. Whatever is nearest to yourself, she whispered, the dearest treasure of your soul. And she looked at him with eyes full of passions which she could not fathom, but among them he saw terror. And with great tenderness he drew her once more to his heart, putting his strong and steady arms around her like a shield, and he said, Love, whose name I do not know, what is nearer to myself than you? What dearer treasure has my soul than you? If I am to give you this, it is yourself I must give you, and I will restore to you whatever it is that you have lost through the agony in your soul. Be at peace, my love, whose name I do not know. And holding her closely to him, he bent his head and kissed her lips, and a great shudder passed through her, and then she lay still in his arms, with her strange eyes half closed, and slow tears welling between the lids, and hanging on her cheeks like the rain on the rose. And she let him quiet her with his big hands that were so used to care for flowers, 
Presently she lifted his right hand to her mouth and kissed it before he could prevent her. Next she drew herself a little away from him, hanging back in his arms and gazing into his face as though her soul were all a question and his was the answer that she could not wholly read. And last she broke away from him with a strange laugh that ended on a sob. Hob said, Will you not tell me what makes you unhappy? I have no unhappiness, she answered, and quenched her sob with a smile as strange as her laugh. My foolish lover, are you amazed that when her hour comes a woman knows not whether she is happy or unhappy? Oh, when joy is so great that it has come full circle with pain, what wonder that laughter and weeping are one? And Hob believed her, for ever since he had opened his eyes upon her, he had felt in his own heart more joy than he could bear, and he knew that for this there is no remedy except to find a second heart to help in the bearing. And he knew it was the same with her. But now he saw that she was free for a while from the excess of joy. And indeed these respites must happen, even to lovers for their own sakes, lest they sink beneath the heavenly burden of their hearts, and her smile was like the diver's rise from his enchanted deeps to take again the common breath of man. And Hob also smiled, and said, Come now, and tell me your name, for though love needs none for its object, I think the name itself is eager to be made known, and loved beyond all other names for love's sake, as I will love yours whatever it be. My name, she said, is Margaret. It is an easy name to love, said Hob, for its own sake. And what is yours? asked she. And Hob's smile broadened as he answered, Try to love it for my sake, for it is Hob. Yet it is as fitting to me, who am as plain as my name, as your lovely name is fitting to you. She cast a quick sly look at him, and said, if love knows not how to distinguish between joy and pain, since all that comes from the heart of love is joy, neither can it tell the plain from the beautiful, since all that comes under the eye of love is beauty. And I will find all things beautiful in my lover, from his name to the mole on his cheek. For I know not, dear maidens, whether in describing him I had mentioned this peculiarity of Hobbes. Jessica you hadn't, you hadn't described him at all. Marden, well, now the omission is remedied. Jessica, oh, fie, as though it were enough to say the man had a mole on his left cheek. Marden, dear Mistress Jessica, did I say it was his left cheek? Jessica, why, why, where else would it be? Marden, nowhere else, on my honor. It was his left cheek. Then Hob said to Margaret, What place is this? It is called Open Winkins, said she, and at the name he started to his feet, remembering much that he had forgotten. She looked at him anxiously and cajolingly, and said, You are not going away. But he hardly heard her question. Margaret, he said, I have come from a place that may be far or near, for I do not know how I came, but I think it must be far, since I never saw this forest or even heard of it till a moment before my coming. But I am seeking a clue to a trouble that has come upon me this year, and I think the clue may be here. And now tell me, have you in these last four months seen in these woods anything of four people that are my brothers? a child that once was merry, and a boy that once was brave, and a youth that once was beautiful, and a young man that once was wise. Have these ever been to open Winkins? Margaret looked at him thoughtfully, and said, If they have, I have not seen them here, and I think they could not have been here without my knowledge, for no one lives here but I, and I live nowhere else. Hob sighed and said, I had hoped otherwise, for, dear, 
I cannot rest until I have helped them. Then he told her as much as he knew of his four brothers, and her face clouded as he spoke, and her eyes looked hurt and angry by turns, and her beautiful mouth turned sulky. So then Hob put his arm round her and said, Do not be too troubled, for I know I shall presently find the cause and cure of these boys' ills. But Margaret pushed his arm away, and rose restlessly to her feet, and paced up and down, muttering, What do I care for these boys? It is not for them I am troubled, but for myself and you. For us, said Hob, how can trouble touch us who love each other? At this Margaret threw herself on the grass beside him, and laid her head against his knee, and drew his hands to her, pressing them against her eyes and lips and throat and bosom, as though she would never let them go. And through her kisses she whispered passionately, Do you love me? Do you truly love me? Oh, if you love me, do not go away immediately, for I have only just found you, but your brothers have had you all their lives. And presently you shall go where you please for their sakes, but now stay a little in this wood for mine. Stay a month with me, only a month. Oh, my heart, is a month much to ask when you and I found each other but an hour ago? For this time of love will never come again, and whatever other times there are to follow, if you go now you will be shutting your eyes upon the lovely dawn, just as the sun is rising through the colors. And when you return, you will return, perhaps to love's high noon, but you will have missed the dawn forever. And then she lifted her prone body a little higher, until it rested once more in the curve of his arm against his heart, and she lay with her white face upturned to his, and her dark, soft eyes full of passion and pleading, and she put up her fingers to caress his cheek and whispered, Give me my little month, oh, my heart, and at the end of it I will give you your soul's desire. And not Hob, or any man, could have resisted her. So he promised to remain with her in open Winkins, and not to go farther on his quest till the next moon, and, indeed, with all time before and behind him, he did not see much to promise, nor did he think it could hurt his brother's case. But the kernel of it was that he longed to make the promise, and could not do otherwise than make the promise, and so, in short, he made the promise. Then Margaret led him to two small lodges on the skirts of the forest. They were made of round logs, with moss and lichen still upon them, and they were overgrown with the loveliest growths of summer, with blackberry blossoms, a wonderful ghostly white, spread over the bushes like fairy's linen out to dry, and wild roses more than were in any other lover's forest on earth, and the maddest, sweetest confusion of honeysuckle you ever saw. Within, the rooms were strewn with green rushes, and hung with green cloths, on which Margaret had embroidered all the flowers and berries in their seasons, from the first small violets, blue and white, to the last spindleberries, with their orange hearts splitting their rosy rinds. And there was nothing else under each roof but a round beech stump for a stool, and a coffer of carved oak with metal locks, and a low mattress stuffed with lamb's fleece picked from the thorns, and pillows filled with thistle-down, and each couch had a green covering worked with water-lily leaves and white and golden lilies, these are the pilly green lodges, said she, and one is mine and one is yours, and when we want cover we will find it here, but when we do not we will eat and sleep in the open. And so the whole of that July Hob dwelt in the pilly green lodges in open Winkins with his love Margaret, and by the month's end they had not done their talking, for did not a young lifetime lie behind them, and did they not foresee a longer life ahead? And between lovers must not all be told and dreamed upon? And beyond these lives and time, which were theirs in any case, had not love opened to them a timeless life, of which inexhaustible dreams were to be exchanged, not always by words, though indeed by their mouths, and by the speech of their hands and arms and eyes? 
Hob told her all there was to tell of the Burg and his life with his brothers, both before and after their tragedies. But he did not often speak of them, for it was a tale she hated to hear, and sometimes she wept so bitterly that he had ado to comfort her, and sometimes was so angry that he could hardly conciliate her. But such was his own gentleness that her caprices could withstand it no more than the shifting clouds the sun. And Margaret told him of herself, but her tale was short and simple. That her parents had died in the forest when she was young, and that she had lived there all her life, working with her needle, twice yearly taking her work to the cathedral town to sell, and with the proceeds buying what she needed, and other cloths and silk and gold with which to work. She opened the coffer in Hobbs' lodge, and showed him what she did. Veils that she had embroidered with cobwebs hung with dew, so that you feared to touch them, lest you should destroy the cobweb and disperse the dew. And girdles thick set with flowers, so that you thought Spring herself on a warm day had loosed the girdle from her middle and lost it. And gowns worked like the feathers of a bird, some like the plumage on the wood dove's breast, and others like a jay's wing. And there was a pair of blue slippers, so embroidered, that as they appeared and disappeared beneath a flowing skirt with reeds and sallows rising from a hem of water, you thought you had seen kingfishers. And there were tunics overlaid with dragonflies' wings, and their delicate jointed bodies of green and black and yellow, and chalk hill blue. And caps all gay with autumn berries, scarlet rose hips and wine red haws, and the bright bryony, and spindle with its twofold gaiety and one cap was all of wild clematis, with the vine of the traveller's joy twined round the brim, and the cloud of the old man's beard upon the crown. And Hob said, It is magic. Who taught you to do this? And Margaret said, Open Winkins. Early in their talks he told her of his garden, and of the golden rose he tried to grow there, and of his failures and Margaret knew by his voice and his eyes, more than by his words, that this was the wish of his heart. And she smiled and said, Now I know with what I must redeem my promise, yet I think I shall be jealous of your golden rose. And Hob, lifting a wave of her glittering hair, and making a rose of it between his fingers, asked, How can you be jealous of yourself? Yet I think I am, said she again, for it was something of myself you promised to give me presently, and I would rather have something of you. They are the same thing, said Hob, and he twisted up the great rose of her hair till it lay beside her temple under the ebony fillet. And as his hand touched the fillet he looked puzzled, and he ran his finger round its shining blackness and exclaimed, But this too is hair. Margaret laughed her strange laugh and said, Yes, my own hair, you discoverer of open secrets. And putting up her hands, she unbound the fillet, and it fell, a slender coil of black amongst the golden flood of her head, like a serpent gliding down the sun-glade on a river. Why is it like that? said Hob simply. With one of her quick changes, Margaret frowned and answered, Why is the black you set with little lamps? Why does a black cloud have an edge of light? Why does a blackbird have white feathers in his body? Must things be all dark or all light? And she stamped her foot, and turned hastily away, and began to do up her hair with trembling hands. And Hob came behind her, and kissed the top of her head. She turned on him, half angrily, half smiling, saying, No, for you do not like my black lock. And Hob said very gravely, I will find all things beautiful in my beloved, from her black lock to her blacker temper. Margaret shot a swift look at him, and saw that he was laughing at her with an echo of her own words, and she flung her arms about him laughing too. Oh, Hob, said she, you pluck out my black temper by the roots. End of Part 2 of Open Winkins